Great, thank you. Mrs. Cullen, we're ready when you are. All right, welcome to the curriculum committee meeting. I will call it to order. Just want to get back to where I'm supposed to be. We don't have anyone signed up for curriculum committee agenda items for comment, so um, we will move right into the agenda items. And our first one, I'm on the wrong one. Our first item is the seventh grade English proposal with Mrs. Rayford. Hello, everybody. So I have with me Mrs. Frable, who teaches seventh grade in yeah, Chad North, mm -hmm. and Ms. Del Monica, who's one of our instructional coaches who has taught this previously was part of the curriculum team um, with us. So they'll they'll talk to you a little bit um, in a minute, but. There's two courses, it's English 7 and then English 7 Accelerated. So we're talking about them together. Obviously there's slight differences. Um, this course was rewritten in 2015 and this rewrite is really needed because at that time this became a writing and grammar course only. So we really removed the reading standards from the course that stands right now and those lived in the analysis of fiction and nonfiction courses. So the goal of this was to bring those standards, skills, and strategies back together because we know we have to marry the reading and writing processes. We've talked about that a lot here. So that was really the goal of this team and looking at the units. They um, also needed to connect them with those big ideas and essential questions that we've been talking about so much because they were very kind of disjointed. They really used a, a writing continuum to structure the course and then filtered in the grammar and we needed to, to unify those topics. So. Big ideas and essential questions were a big focus. The mentor texts for writing also were very important to define, so you'll see those throughout the units, what students are looking at as model texts when they're authoring their own work. Um, they added in a book club unit for student choice, so students are able to engage with a text of their choice in a book club with their peers, talk about it, model their writing. Um, Again, common assessments and learning experiences were a major focus, as with all the courses that we've been bringing to you. You'll hear me say that five more times tonight. Um, and then the team really wanted to make sure they gave students more opportunities to demonstrate their learning in different ways. So Mrs. Frable will talk about that in a little bit, highlighting one of the major additions to this, this course. But again, we really wanted to make sure students had opportunities to express themselves in writing and that they were exploring the reading more than what the course had to offer before. Um, so, Mrs. Spring, if you want to talk about your... Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I forgot to... Did you mention that? I did Meg not. Megan Vance Clemens is on the speakerphone. She's with us by conference. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, I'm Heather Fable. I teach 7th grade English, and right now we're in the middle of the Art of Persuasion, which is our persuasive writing unit. It used to be just kind of a very dry, like, five-paragraph argument with essay, and now we're doing something called the Night Talk. So um, it's speakers are given five minutes and 20 slides that auto will advance every 15 seconds. Okay, So it's a fast, fun presentation. The tagline is enlighten us, but make it quick. And it's got so much like um, opportunities to differentiate. Um, the kids pick their own topics. They present in different modes where they've got the visual, they've got the speaking part, they have to write a script um, that times exactly with the slides, um, and then there's different levels of presentation. Some of our kids just want to record themselves and watch it, some want to perform in front of a small group, some want to perform in front of a large group. So um, it just it's a really nice way to differentiate the persuasive writing unit. And uh, we're excited about it. And we're doing our own Ignite Talks, too, all the teachers. So we're going to have a little assembly and share. Are there specific questions about English 7 or English 7 Accelerated that we can answer? Everything looked good to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So I have Mr. Edwards and Mr. Lankert, both from the high school with us. They were part of the curriculum team. There are about five total of them, in and out, but they were the core um, two on the team who are joining us. So we're talking about World Lit Academic, and again, World Lit Honors, two courses. There are some more pronounced differences in these two courses that I'll have them talk about so you can see the, the differences. Um, 
And as a reminder, this is the course that all 11th grade students take if they're not taking an AP course. So similar to what we've done in 9th and 10th grade when we have those conversations. Um, again, this renewal gave this team an opportunity to look really carefully at the units they had crafted and streamline the programming that all 11th grade students will get at Penridge High School. So we had some core texts that unified us, but there was a lot of variety in what students were getting, and it was really important that we streamline what is the experience all 11th grade students will get. And that was really what they highlighted here. Again, revisiting those big ideas and essential questions to ensure that those were driving the units. No longer just saying, oh, we're teaching this text. We're teaching this, these big ideas and essential questions. That was a big shift for this team in this curriculum. Um, in that process, they've identified richer learning experiences, again, finalized those common assessments across all the units in both courses. Um, to your point, Mr. Russell, I'm glad you were here. This course does align to the world cultures class and social studies department, which we talked about last now, time. The reason I asked that before was one of the, the best classes that I ever had in high school. It integrated, it was called American Studies, and it took, it was a combined, we had an audion, so you had maybe 200 people in one classroom, like a college class, and then it separated out during, you had seminars where you had uh, your English taught, you know, you were teaching about, uh, you were reading the crucible, while in social studies you're learning about, you know, the witch trials and things like that. So there was a complete integration. It was really, it was a good concept, but I, don't, I just thought that that would, it made learning a lot easier when, as opposed to jumping around not sure where things fit together. So I thought that that was Absolutely. appropriate. Yeah. So it's not quite that seminar approach, uh -huh. but the overlap is there. So either they are learning about the cultures at the same time, or there's some pre-learning done in social studies, which then sets them up that's to great. understand the yeah. context a lot better in, the, in this course. So that's definitely a major benefit to, to the students taking this. Um, in addition, this team really looked to expand what world literature was outside of just Western Europe. And also, they wanted to include male and female perspectives and voices because that was not always present in the previous um, curriculum. They worked very hard to comb through a lot of text to make sure that that's what they were doing. I think they read upwards of like 75 full oh, length yeah. texts in order to craft this curriculum. So they put in a lot of effort to make sure that kids could access the text and they could also make connections to them. Some of that was lacking as well. We were teaching things that the kids had no context for and no, no ability to connect to what that meant for them today. So they worked very hard on that. I want them to, to highlight the differences between academic and honors and then what you wanted to speak to about okay. the students. Uh, so for the differences between academic and honors, as you can see up there on the screen for academic, um, what we tried to do was, you would see it very differently for the honors, is we look at the complexity of the texts themselves for an honors and the pacing and things and the critical thinking that's applied into that. For the academic, um, we try to pace it a little bit differently um, where we break up the larger texts, our two primary core texts within the academic uh, world literature is Life of Pi and then it would be uh, uh, The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons, which would be a, be a teacher choice. And those are two much larger novels, so we wanted to break that up a little bit more um, because in a high school setting, um, a little bit like you do six to eight week units back to back, it becomes a little bit overwhelming for the kids. So you try and break it up a little bit more into that. Uh, we can approach a little bit more in a complex manner in the honors uh, system where we can have them reading uh, multiple texts at once. We can have them, you know, comparing and contrasting. We can draw in more of what they're doing in a world cultures class as well. I would love to see a more of a humanities approach, but we do as much as humanly possible. Like, say, we're lining up Life of Pi when they're studying Asian culture. Um, they're talking about Buddhism, they're talking about Hinduism, things along those lines. And I know especially as we approach the Kite Runner, and we'll also integrate that with the Thousand Splendid Sons, we fall back on a lot of their Islamic teaching as they go through their world cultures class and their world religions. So we're using it a lot of that contextual evidence in order to pull in their understanding for that. So what we really wanted to aim to do, and this was something that we started, this is unbelievable to think about, but a year and a half ago, I would say, um, we honestly had to take a look at how we're engaging the students in the classroom. And we weren't doing a great job with it. Um, the students aren't reading, they just aren't. So we had to reevaluate our own stance on what skills we wanted the students to have and how we wanted them to get there. 
Um, and we wanted to make sure, we wanted to ensure that the students, as they're reading the text that they're reading, were not only engaged in the text, we're actually like gaining something from it. Um, not just simply to read it in order to accomplish something within class, but reading it, attaining something from it, and then maybe inspiring them in order to learn something more about it outside of the classroom as well. Um, we felt collectively as a team that what we had currently as a curriculum was not meeting those necessary standards. So we wanted to basically break it down. I think the only surviving texts that we have moving into next year from academic are Knight and Oedipus the King. And for an honors level class, it was the Kite Runner and Oedipus the King. Everything else is brand new. And this goes through a year and a half of reading multiple texts, reading them from current text with the, written within the last five years to text written within the last couple of hundred years. And we wanted approachability for the students, but we also wanted them to make a meaningful connection to what they were actually reading. Um, that was our ultimate goal in order to, you know, have better attainment of knowledge throughout the course of their reading itself. And so we hope with this curriculum together here with a combination of developing writing skills within that, um, you know, as well as developing and, and honing in on their reading skills as well, we hope to have a much better curriculum moving forward. Now, well, it just because you mentioned Kite Runner, did, Dr. Bolton, is it appropriate to talk about that? Or, it, Certainly, yeah. Try to go through it. The yeah, one, yeah, yeah. And, and I was trying to process it. Sometimes we, as board members, we get emails that say, oh, they're showing the Kite Runner in the in classroom, and it has a, in a, a scene that's, that's um, kind of delicate in some ways, for lack of a better term, I guess. But how do you deal with that? Because I was thinking even, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, great book, but mm -hmm. has the premise of it is, is a accusation of rape yeah. in there. So how, how do you manage to go through some of those, even with Oedipus, you know, the whole Oedipus complex? Sure. You, know, you have to deal with some of those issues, but how do you deal with it appropriately? I would say, to be honest, within the classroom setting, I've been teaching World Lit for the last 10 years now. Um, I would say that the way that I taught it 10 years ago is not the same way that I teach it for today. Um, I've adapted my teaching style, I've adapted the different ways that I've brought up teaching. There's delicate issues in a number of different texts. Uh, the way that we approach it is we discuss them, uh, we preface it with this is the context of the text, this is the author's purpose is a primary thing that we you know, focus on throughout our course of reading, like for example for The Kite Runner. Uh, that particular scene, Khaled Husseini himself is incredibly outspoken about why he included that particular scene into the text. Uh, we focus on a relationship that's developed prior to that particular scene and then a relationship immediately after. The description within the novel is not in depth whatsoever, but he does speak outwardly about it. When we look at his interview that he provides for that, the allegorical message to the scene itself, and we look at that for the understanding instead of looking at the act itself. And with that, I find over the course of 10 years of teaching the class, the kids gain a very good understanding of it. They understand the cultural differences that exist within Afghanistan that they wouldn't observe simply just watching the news. Like we talk about the differences that exist within that as well, seeing just an image or a short one minute news story on the world news tonight, if they're even watching the news, in comparison to an in-depth discussion or analysis of a particular part of the text. I think it promotes discussion, and I think it promotes their critical thinking skills, and I think it promotes them actually actively thinking about how do I handle these things that come up in life. And I think that's an important discussion to have. I guess my question was, where's the, where, where does the point come where you kind of have to give the parents kind of a heads up, this is what's going on, or, or how does that come into play? And I'm not sure where that line is, but I just right. wonder who makes that call yeah. to saying, hey, just be prepared. Because even when we, even I think the, the movie Lion was a powerful movie dealing with you know a whole different culture as well. Yeah. But it's dealt. There's a there's a scene in there that my younger child said, "What was that?" And I could just kind of use a euphemism to go over that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as blatant, I don't think, as it's in the Kite Runner. But yeah. but still, it, somebody may need to give a heads up mm -hmm. to the parents so that they can have you know make sure that hey, either we opt into that section or whether we. I don't know, it just seems like somebody needs to be prepared for the, the ensuing conversation that might follow. To answer, to answer your uh, original question, which I think was a great one, I actually thought of, I can't remember the line exactly, it's from the, the movie of Kill a Mockingbird, and uh, I can remember the scene where Atticus is standing on the porch with his son, and he says, there are, there are a lot of bad things out there in the world, that I, I wish I could protect you from all of them, but I can't. It's actually not the book, it's in the movie. 
should be in the book. But, um, you know, I think when you look at the Kite Runner, the scene that you're talking about is an assault. The, main, the character who does that assault is described as a sociopath. And that assault and then the main character's failure to protect his friend in part because his friend is of lower caste than he, that guilt that is set up from his failure to protect his friend is, is literally the, the thing around which the rest of the book is built. It's not the act, it's the guilt over it. And as Mr. Edwards said, I've taught also World Lit on and off for 10 years. I've been teaching 26 years and I've taught to kill a mockingbird too. And it, it, I pretty much say exactly that to the class when we start reading the book. And I say, look, this, this is here. This is a thing that's in the book. Yeah. It, is, it is handled as delicately as something like that can be handled. It's almost impressionistic. Um, you know what's happening, but it is not in any way explicit. And it is an act of evil by a person who is meant to be evil. And like I said, that then sets up all of the main character's actions going forward. And I think there are a lot of evil things that happen in the world. And I think that's one of the places where if we present things carefully and contextualize them and talk about them with the kids, where we as teachers can do good to help them understand those things in a safe place and in a safe way. And so, is it true from a film standpoint? I apologize. Okay. From a film standpoint, that you're that you're using excerpts of the film mm -hmm. to highlight points, and that's not actually one of the excerpts that has been used. Correct. To connect, right? So from a film standpoint, that, that's a, that's doesn't a good, mean that it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously in the book, and you know, we talked about mm -hmm. that. It's not. It's not graphic in nature, but it's still pretty intense. Yeah. In nature, in terms of what's going on. But from a film standpoint, mm -hmm. that that portion is not. So that portion has not shown in classrooms because I it was my understanding that, that, that it, it has been in the past, past. at least right. in one class. It has been in the past. Okay. Right, and that's one of the curricular adjustments that we're making in terms of excerpts of film. This year was it? Because so. I've recently been contacted about it. I think we all were. No. Yeah. Well, it was just that email that we received. Yeah. Yeah, the emails. So. Yeah, for, I mean, I know that there's evil in the world. I just start to think about how much. I guess you need to prepare students for things and you need to know certain things happen in the world, but you know, if they're learning about in this class and that class and this class, after a while should we really be piling so much? So just be mindful of the, the you know, I, how much is and I think put on their shoulders. The point in the reading of it is the is the guilt, is the redemption, mm -hmm. is those pieces of the story that they really focus on and, and discuss in the classroom. And I, I've been in both of their classrooms and everyone else who teaches world lit before we even went into this rewrite and that was never a focus of any conversation mm -hmm. class discussion or learning experience that i witnessed and it had to be pointed out to me that that was part of what they did discuss because that's not a focus and i think that's a testament to how the teachers handle that content as well as how the students navigate it because of how they set them up so Part of this rewrite, as Dr. Bolton said, was to be intentional about how we are using the visual aspect of the film to match what they've already read or are going to read. And that was something that we needed to look at. So in years past, it may have been shown, it may have been shown this year because this is, you know, we're doing this now for approval for, for implementing next year so that those things are then streamlined for all students and all teachers. And we did make a conscious choice to say that 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 excerpts were appropriate and that that, would, that particular scene wouldn't be shown. But the idea of redemption, and I think that, again, I was talking to one of the teachers who taught this book for a long time too, um, and she was saying that it's one of the highlights of the year that the kids get really involved in that book, and one of the aspects of the book that I found compelling myself when I read it a long time ago is self-forgiveness. Because it's about a child feeling so guilty, and can you forgive yourself, and can the world forgive you, can the community forgive you? And I think that part is very relatable to, to students, too, and they get very interested in that. So there's a lot of facets to that book that kids find very I think intriguing. it's a great book. My concern would be that we're really make sure that the movie is not that excerpt was mm -hmm. at some yeah. point shown in some mm -hmm. classroom mm -hmm. and disturbing people too. were very yeah yes. very upset about i would be really upset if my 11th grader saw that scene in school without knowledge like, without not yeah. to have that conversation yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah. and then aside from that just the text itself do the parents i understand it's not the point of it but is there any heads up that this is subject matter that will be covered in this class to parents ahead of time so we talked about this at last committee when we talked about Western Lit, where the teachers will put it into their 
presentations for back to school. I don't know what we call that at the high school because it's different at every level, but <laughs> when parents are invited in, they include yeah, it in their syllabus. It's absolutely. in yes. their canvas. Yes. So yes. But they're, just they're, the title of the book, not like the... Like if, if you're having back to school night and you're having it up there, are you just having like the kite runner listed? Or are you going into detail when you're talking to parents? Like, you know, we will be covering this book. Kids get super engaged in it. However, we just want to give you a heads up. Or do you just put the title of the book? Yes, How? That personally to me. So personally for me, when I do back to school night, I do address that we do speak of adult topics within the classroom, especially at the honors level. Like we, we do address that. Um, we will talk about, you know, we'll talk about drug use in the text. We might talk about sex. Uh, it might be, you know, cultural differences, anything along those lines. Um, if there's any questions or concerns, I always respectfully request that the parents reach out to me. Um, you know, what we're doing in class is open on Canvas. They can observe that. They can see where we're at in the curriculum at that point in time. They can observe if we're doing anything particular in the classroom. Um, and then if they do have any concerns, they're always more than welcome to reach out to me and a conversation can always be had. Um, so I know for me personally that that conversation is always on the table. And yeah. And as we continue to put these courses through, like we did with ninth and 10th grade, we can add more information to Atlas, to what we give to students, to what we present to parents because we can create that. So there are charts in there that have you know every topic that's listed this might be sensitive or you'll see in, in ap in a minute when uh, mr lanehart speaks his student choice has a whole column of these are things that might be good for you if you like this or this or this mm -hmm. so we're refining all of those processes as we continue to navigate how many instructional resources we are putting up in each course because it is a lot and the more information the more time we have the more we will put out and we will continue to communicate and be open um, and I know they're very open with their students and we just have to also make sure that that's getting to parents and families out front as well so that we can't my just question, yeah that because a lot of parents can't make it to whatever it's called back to school <laughs> but or if or there's even some the, even look right. that, do a deep dive into some yeah. of the, the, the information yeah. but even if I'm listening to NPR they say hey we just want to give you a heads up if you have children in the car the next segment is going to be yes. dealing with whatever and then you can make the choice as to whether you want to turn it off or whether you think that hey but almost like that so that you have as opposed to saying hey it's po I know that they post their you know, I could probably have listened to their whole li list on NPR ahead of time, but I don't, I'm really going to do that. It's what well, it kind of catches you at the occasion mm -hmm. when you're, when yeah. you're in the, you know, when your kid is going through that process. Almost like so a sensitive the, subject. Mm -hmm. I think Warning. it would be great if folks would do what that, there's the website for the family, for the film, and it, it tells you, they say this word, it, maybe you don't need to be that specific, but certainly they folks should do um especially folks that know that they're going to be used in in school settings they should probably be a little bit better about explaining what's in it um and just again be mindful like i know there are 11th graders 12th graders but depending on you know your birth placement in your house in your family whether you're the oldest or the youngest you know oldest children and youngest children only children everybody has a different experience as far as what they've been exposed to as they're growing up and you know so some 11th and 12th graders if they're the oldest ones in their family they might not have seen as much as you know, some of them number five would have would see. so I think about that too like yeah they're a certain age but then maybe think deeper about where they are and so a heads up to parents would probably be welcome to a lot of people without having to necessarily um I don't want to say that you know embarrass themselves by like asking them or overburden care. you guys too. Yeah. They don't want to overburden you, but yet there, there has there. to be a balance in there yeah. somewhere. I would think. Or are you opposed? Um, so let's just say you know parents do a deep dive and they would really not want their child to do it. How and because it's a required read, and I know it's it could be different things, but how would how would you go about that if if somebody said, hey, we really are uncomfortable with our child reading this book, and we would really prefer them not to? How? And because it's required, it's not optional. Mm -hmm. What are the what what would be the options? So we try to follow the same process regardless of the course. Mm -hmm. um, if a student or a, or a parent has an issue with a text that they cannot access, do not want to access, we work to find an alternative. Mm -hmm. So of course we want them to have that shared experience in the classroom with their peers, so they can engage in discussions, they can have those learning experiences. Mm -hmm. We're also saying this is part of the programming that we want. 
our ninth, 10th, 11th, whatever it is, students to have. So we do the, you know, our best to make sure they can all have that. Mm -hmm. In those circumstances that they can't, we will provide an alternative. In this unit in particular, there's two teacher texts to already choose from, and then we have mm -hmm. supplemental texts or other optional texts that we can use in those cases. Mm -hmm. It's happened a handful of times in the 15 years that they've mm -hmm. used this text, so it's not something we're not used to. Um, but setting it up in a way where everyone knows what the content is, they know how we're gonna navigate the content and, and what the purpose is. It's not to shock right. kids or right. upset them. It's so that they can have those critical thinking skills. It's so that they can learn to navigate conflict or read about things that are outside of what is normal for them or typical for them and look at another culture and things like that. So the, the other beautiful piece of this, and I think Mr. Lehmer, you spoke to this a little bit when, when we had spoken earlier, is the insight they have into that culture in a different way. It's about family, it's about kids, it's seeing what is typical to them somewhere else and not having this other idea of what Afghanistan might look like, right? So it's part of that too, where we wanna balance that, we're exposing them to what that culture really is without just saying it's, it's all horrible, because it's not, and that's not what this book is about. Do you see a lot of engagement with the students? Can I turn in for a second? Well, Dave was asking a question, well, so let, let, let Dave I think it a while ago, but I, I don't know when to kind of hear everybody. I won't hear that much. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Fanny Slamet. Um, I, just, I just wanted to make one comment. I, I'm surprised by in the book, and I'm sure you all have seen it, but I just wanted to point out how Kite Runner, if that's the book um, that is of concern that you're speaking of for 15 years, I believe. And if you put all of the books, if you had a big spreadsheet of all of the books that uh, we offer kids at the high school, and then categorize them into all different kinds of categories, and then one with violence, it wouldn't be as large as I think that you might think it is because we've gone through all of these literature courses and there's so many books and there's classics and you'll see that there are books that have really sensitive topics that we believe are are good literature to hold discussions with students so we're not using books that we don't believe aren't written well and about topics that we believe that we as teachers, right, can guide kids, can guide students in their thinking. Because the fact of the matter is life is hard and there will be ch uh, challenges in their life and um, having a wonderful teacher to have these discussions with is a part of secondary education. But again, I do want to emphasize, I, I don't believe that in terms of percentage it would be all that high in terms of violent books. that kids are exposed to at the high school. I think the only book that we've added that we haven't done before that has come up as a concern was Beloved, which we talked about it for Western literature. Otherwise, these are texts that have been in part of the curriculum, which they, the teams have evaluated to continue to be part of the curriculum in addition to many other things. So I actually think we're probably moving in a, away from what has classically been there that was a lot of conflict and very difficult things to navigate even out of context and years and years ago to a, a better variety of texts and topics and genres and perspectives that makes it better for kids to navigate every year. I think probably because of some of the 
sheer insanity that across America we're seeing in schools, mm -hmm. parents are paying a lot more attention mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it has been there 15 years. I think right now probably some of the attention is because I do believe, and maybe you can check into it, that scene was shown in a classroom without warning, um, which really got some attention. Um, but also, you know, admittedly, I have four kids. I would be lying if I said I knew four of the books they read collectively through high school. Um, but that's not the case now, and people are paying attention. So, you know, maybe just be aware of some of the things that we've been, you know, give parents a heads up. It'll save you guys a headache because then you can say, hey, we put this out there. And you can send an email, and there's so many parents who don't read it, and then scream, but at least that's on them then, and, and not the school. But I'm sure that has part to do with why this is now getting attention, and for 15 years it didn't. Everybody's on also high alert. just society in general, like it seems like kids can't escape these topics. Everybody wants to bombard them with them, and so now, you know, they're being looked at in, in the curriculum. Um, Getting more attention. So. All right. So yeah. All right. <laughs> How engaged are the students when they're having the conversation during these topics? Are they engaged? Is the majority of class engaged? Do they? Is it a deep conversation that they get into? Or are they really inquisitive? It really does questions? matter what the topic is. Like it truly does. Like you look at a more modern text, and we keep talking about the Kepler. I apologize for that, but it is one of our more modern texts, and. They do passionately feel about that text. They hate the protagonist. They absolutely do. They hate him here. Um, they really do. They see him as a coward. They see him as a bigot. They see him as a multitude of factions. And again, we look at the growth of the character. If you were to come into my class tomorrow, that's exactly what we're talking about. As we finish up the novel, when we talk about this is the growth of the character, here's the steps that they've gone through. How do we see that progression? What's the positive? What's the negative? What's the ending look like? Um, that sort of thing. So, again, that's why we wanted to readjust a number of the texts that we did because what our observations were in a class were there were a lot of subtle content or there was a lot of subtleties that the students belong on to that they really do want to discuss, that they honestly want to have a conversation about. And then there's the other text that they just feel so disengaged from or disassociated from texts that were written 100, 200, 300 years ago. They don't feel any attachment to it, no matter how much we have tried to connect it into the modern times and made that connection worthwhile to them. Um, so when they do want to talk, yes, it's very much so an engagement. You talk about life of Pi, you talk about the survival on the boat themselves, you ask them questions, how exactly would you approach this situation? You compare the second part to the third part. There is a great discussion that takes place there, and the kids are absolutely engaged because they're looking at that in a very empathetic and sympathetic environment, and they're thinking about themselves, what would I do in that particular case? Their critical thinking is firing at all levels. Um, you talk about a text like Oedipus the King, and that's a shocker to them. But again, we talk about the Greek tragedies, and we talk about well, why did the Greeks want to portray it in this particular manner? How was this a didactic text? How was this intended to teach? Uh, a particular moral lesson and how do we do the same sort of thing in for today. You do see a number of engagement that takes place there, but that was the whole purpose of our reevaluation of the curriculum was we wanted to honestly look at it and be like, oh, like we all have our highlights, like two or three books every year that we're like, and we know that the kids are gonna be on it. We know that the kids are gonna wanna talk about it. We know this is point A, B, and C that we can hit. The kids are honestly gonna have a full on period of discussion that we can give them guided questions and then come back to it. We can incorporate debates into the classroom and they will be on that, absolutely. We also know that there were weak points in there. So we wanted to reevaluate and make sure that we are looking at being like, why are they engaged here and not engaged here? And we wanted to make sure that we're filling in those gaps as much as possible. So we looked at it and said, what are they doing in their lives right now? And this was a conversation I had with my own students throughout the year and a half that we've been working on our curriculum. And I said, what interests you? What are we doing in the class that I can see, honestly, I can see it, but then the quiet ones who are also in the class, I'm like, what are you engaged in? What do you find interesting? And with that feedback, we incorporate like what we talked about before with the cross-curricular things. I think, you know, they don't want to just see it, oh, I go to period one, period two, and period three. 
I want them to be able to see like we can bring all of that in and have an understanding and create a better understanding overall. I think the more that we can do that, the more engagement that we can have. But just to directly answer your question, it is just the modern topics itself. It's what they're seeing in the news every single day. It's what they're hearing about, whether that's positive or negative. I'm sorry, it's the world that they're existing in. They want to talk about it. They want to have a better understanding of it. And I think this is the place that we can do that. And I think it's the place that we should be doing that. And I think more importantly than that, I think The Kite Runner is a great book. And the kids, to answer your question, are highly engaged with it. And I understand why your concerns and the, and the part, you know, the assault that you're talking about, I think it's made, it's less than a page. And it is not dealt with in an explicit way. And it, in a sense, it's never talked about again. And that's part of the point of the book. Mm -hmm. But then the, the entire rest of the book, the window that it gives the kids into Afghan culture, the window it gives the, the kids into what it means to emigrate from Afghanistan to come here to the United States, and then how the main character you know meets a young woman that he falls in love with mm -hmm. at a flea market with his family, and he grows up, and then he finds out that there's this orphan in, in back in uh, Afghanistan, and he's got to do something to go back and get him, and he feels because of this guilt, because of this thing that happened. And part of the point is they never talk about it, then he has to go back and make up for that. And to answer your question. The kids are incredibly engaged, um, you know, and I think one of the concerns is like the kids not being aware. I mean, the kids are aware because they talk about this book. They, I don't. I think there's some other books that we read that they don't talk about, but they yeah. talk about it, and they talk about it because it's got a lot of like it's got a lot of twists, and there are a lot of things where there's something that happens here, and then it comes back to that later, and they like that, and so they they get. So I I understand your concern, and I think the book is so much more than that one extreme scene, right? And it's not even extreme. To your point, I think we spent a year, I think, arguing about Macbeth. Because yeah. we've taught it forever, and how could you get rid of Macbeth? And every student needs to read Macbeth. But then, you know, we talked across 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, because there was a period of time I went into all three of those grade levels in one day, and I sat through Shakespeare every single time. And I said that no one knows what we're talking right. about. And right. they were pulling the kids through the content and we we were grappling with that and the, the and at the end of the day the kids couldn't engage with it they weren't understanding what they were doing and they didn't want to be in there and go through it and that was a lot of what this team grappled with is how do we get the kids to be engaged in reading and writing because we need them to continue to grow as readers and they're not done yet we're not just reading because it's fun they, they still have things to learn and to demonstrate and that argument, that year-long argument that we had was really the crux of this. What are kids engaged in and how can we help them navigate it? And, and, that's at, this and at the end of Macbeth, Macduff chops off Macduff's head, carries it in, and chucks it onto the ground. <laughs> and one of the audiobooks that I have, it actually has a sounds like a like a head of lettuce they use. Right? <laughs> 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 okay, that's cool. but we talk and about before it. I get 20 emails tomorrow, can I just... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> still teach Shakespeare. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Not right. Macbeth. We talk, talk about engagement. It's it's different <laughs> levels of engagement that I look at. Like we look at a modern text, like the Kevin or what I'm hoping for for next year, a thousand splendid sons as well. Like that's a modern text that they can adapt onto. When we read a text like Night, that's a different type of engagement that they have. It's shorter. It's a hundred and twelve pages or so. But to be honest, it's the most powerful book that I think they read in high school. Um, it's Elie Wiesel's first-hand account of his time in Auschwitz. And I have kids that will legitimately go home and they'll have the book with them and they'll be like, I didn't stop. I just wanted to finish it. I wanted to find out how the story ended for him. And then you bring in the historical context into that. And that opens in a new door for them. And you're, you're engaging kids who love history, but they might not necessarily like fiction. So you're bringing that into it. And that, again, was something that we looked at definitively when we looked at how do we restructure this curriculum? How can we bring in a more broader range of literature into this? How can we engage students in multifaceted levels instead of just the simplistic levels that we're looking at just reading for the case of the fact that it was a classic? They can read Dante's Inferno. They won't understand a single word of it. I can explain every single word of it to them. It'll take us three months in order to understand every allegorical reference that he makes in there. But with Night, they're engaged. It's a three-week lesson. 
they're understanding that, they're developing sympathy, they're developing empathy, and they're developing the historical context, and we ask the important question of how can we prevent something like that from happening again? And we're using evidence from the text in order to support that. I think that's a different type of engagement. But again, that's the type of engagement that we're looking at throughout the board of our redevelopment of the curriculum yeah, itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The world? I'm sorry, I feel like I do have to ask one more question. I'm so sorry. I know you don't have to do the front table. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But and this is kind of a general, it's more of a general, but I just feel like with and maybe it, it could go to you as well before you um, but it just seems a lot of the lit courses, there's always a um, emphasis on cultural identity. Mm -hmm. And I know you said it's been like, you know, you, you, it's changed since when yeah. you were teaching. You've been teaching for a while. Do you feel like, why do you feel like there is such an overemphasis on that? And I'll just, and, and one more thought, because then I can just be done with my questions. But the part, um, like even there's this one, like Freedom and Awakening, mm -hmm. where the kite run was on, but I'm in a different one now. Um, unifying through culture. There's a part that says like, it always seems like the big ideas and the essential questions are always focused on kind of culture and identity. And then it has like, like one of them is like the absence of nurture has and can have a long lasting effect. And then the skills go with, you know, critical reading of an assigned text. Students will evaluate the role of family as depicted by the author, mm -hmm. identifying the positive negative role that family plays in a assigned story. So my concern, like as a parent, would be like, if my child was in this class and depending on how it's uh, uh, taught, mm -hmm. like maybe they'd be like, oh, my mom has not nurturing me, you know, appropriately. Like I, those are the kind of things I think that, that seep into their head that maybe wouldn't be there mm -hmm. if there wasn't such an overemphasis. And is it like, like, I'm just throwing, I know it could be left field, but I'm just throwing it out there as like a concern that there's such an overemphasis on things like that. No, so I hear what you're saying, and, and I think the emphasis is there in part because, one, that's what teenagers are interested in. Like, what's my identity? What am I? What am I going to become? Um, and then the other thing I think is that this is this is one year of world literature, right? And so for the, for the, and so for the rest of their high school and middle school career, they get a lot of European literature. So it's one year of world literature. But to your point about family identity and that kind of thing, no one, none of us, in fact, I showed you, I have on a podium from my room a sign that says, it's a German proverb, it's dangerous to swallow books without chewing. And so the moral of the story is always, this is a book, you, this is an author's perspective, you read it, and then you interpret for yourself what you think of it. So none of us are sitting here reading, I can't even think of a book where this would even apply. Uh, and saying, well, this is a model parent, and you should go home and evaluate your parent based upon. I mean, we're not doing that. We're just saying, what do you think of this character? You know, what do you think of uh, Amir's father and the kite runner, and and how, and then how that character? And he's a very flawed character. So, I, I don't think there's any. If I understand what you're saying correctly, I don't think there's any danger of of the kids coming home being instructed in, mm -hmm. in like this is the ideal way to be a family. It's more just asking questions about what is a family and, right. and that sort of thing. I also think that it's a definitive role of the teacher and I think Sarah helps us out a great deal with that, that you know, we as a department are very crafted in a particular way that you know, I, I know speaking with my colleagues and I that we teach to the text, and one of the key aspects that we teach to is providing context for what is written, as well as establishing what do we understand is the author's purpose for this. And one of the really promising things about a number of the texts that we have proposed for our, for our curriculum here is that the authors are very outspoken about their life, about what shaped them, about what shapes their writing, about what shapes their understanding of the world. And that, all that we're asking is for them to then think about what shapes my world and what shapes my understanding of the world that we're in. And that's as simplistic as we can make it. So we understand where the author was coming from. Um, we're not intoning any idea that, you know, this is the way that you should think or this is the way that, you know, you should take it in. As a matter of fact, I would hope that my students, on, you know, would never comprehend if I'm biased in one way or another for my own understanding of, you know, an author or anything. I want them to come to that conclusion on their own. 
My job is just simply to build the steps in order to get them there. Um, so, you know, that's the promotion of critical thinking. And as Mr. Lane Hart was saying, this is ideally the stage that they're in. They're seeking that identity. They're asking the questions themselves. So that was a really strong point. When we look at the skills, you'll see in every single skill and every single aspect of the content, author's purpose and content is addressed in every single aspect of the curriculum. So we always bring it back to that. What world is the author establishing? Why did the author establish this particular world? How do they craft that world? What questions can we ask ourselves for the existence of that world in comparison to our own? And what do you think of that? Yeah. And and none of the, I mean, if I have a class of 30 kids in front of me, they all come from different family yeah. situations. Um, yes. If I stand up there saying this is the way to be and the only way mm -hmm. to be, I'm going to alienate most yeah. many of them. Yeah. So that's never an mm -hmm. attack. That, and know, also, like, it's okay if you're, if the students are exploring their identity and they don't have to have that figured out, you know, right yeah. then. I hope, like, that's also part because there's such an emphasis on identity, identity. Like, it's okay. Like, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's all about the experience. I told it myself, I'm 40 yes. years old. <laughs> and I'm still figuring myself out. Right. right. Like, I'll honestly ask my wife and she'll tell you that. Um, but I honestly am. And that changes, you know, with my understanding of the world, my perspective of the world, that's changed rather drastically in the last couple of weeks for myself. So, uh, you know, these things certainly make you think and certainly make you put things in perspective. And then that makes you have conversations that are sometimes difficult to have, but that's an understanding of how you have those conversations. Mm -hmm. The essential questions, because we, we come back to this a lot, the essential questions are for students to be exploring and answering, not teachers. So these are posted, these are guiding questions, these are what the students are constantly coming back to say, what do I think about this? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is my perspective? Because mine can be different from the 29 other people sitting here because mm -hmm. I'm exploring it for myself based on what I'm reading, what I'm discussing, and what I'm thinking. So when we read essential questions, we think about students are getting to mm -hmm. understand and develop that on their own. It's not for the teachers to guide them. And there isn't an answer. Right. And that's how you know it's a good essential question. I, I mean, sometimes I think if, if they, do they necessarily have to be there? Because sometimes you wouldn't be thinking and going into some of the stuff that, sometimes you go down that rabbit hole, you know, like when we all overthink and we all, all I, I just think of that too, like sometimes if we're presenting it, and of course we want them to critically think, but if there's a constantly the same ones, it's like, oh, there's such a thing, I have to keep checking back to myself. But how, I don't know, I just, I, I just think sometimes, I, that's just my fear, I guess, of like going down that rabbit hole of constant identity and it's like if you're not good enough or it has to be changed or it has to be defined so that that's just where I guess I'm weary with the over emphasis of it constantly I would say we're I mean I think in the English classes it's hard when you're doing something like this because if it's a biology class it can be like what is photosynthesis right right, but, it, right. But, it's, um, but you know with these types of things I think also a good English teacher's role is we're trying to like widen that rabbit hole, pull them out of the rabbit mm -hmm. hole, bring in new things into the rabbit mm -hmm. hole and say, like, these are these are all of these different things put together. We're just trying to broaden perspective. So we're not we're not trying to focus them on it. We don't reason. want them to have one right now. Right. To his point, right. that has changed in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Right? We want them to know that this should be constantly evolving because right. you're constantly learning. You're constantly taking mm -hmm. in text, you're interacting with people, you're discussing. So if we were doing that, mm -hmm. we would be doing a disservice. And that's right. why we're not doing that. And why you do see it there is because that is, we talk about the development of people. We talk about how they grow. We talk about, you know, the conflict that they face in their life. And again, one of the key aspects that we looked at in the text that we evaluated was how do we show, you know, differences in growth. Like, it's not one set way. Right. So that the students are understanding, oh, this person learns through this way, this person learns through this way. That's an important, like, that's why you see the repetition of it. That's, we do come back to it in every aspect of the curriculum because it's shown in different ways. Adichie would write about it in a very different way in a thing around your neck as opposed to Ali Wiesel or as opposed to Colette Husseini. They show growth and development in different ways because their worlds are very different. So an understanding that we would hope the students to have is to understand I don't have to fit into a uniform mm -hmm. mold. I can be the person that I want to be, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're done. All right. Okay. Thank you. That was easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 41. <laughs> <laughs>
Right. Okay, so we have AP language and composition. This is our other AP course. Um, that we have in the English department at the high school. So this is mostly 11th graders, but it is open for 11th and 12th, just to kind of give you context there. Um, again, to reiterate, the students in this course are taking an AP exam, which we are responsible for preparing them for. So you will hear us talk about the content of the AP exam. We are teaching to that because we want them to be successful. That is what Mr. Lanehart's ultimate goal is in, in this. Um, this course is different from what um, AP Lit that we talked about last time. This is a rhetoric course. So you're not seeing um, a, a course where we're navigating a lot of literature, although they are engaged in literature. The point is for students to understand what rhetoric is and how they can use it to persuade. Right? And rhetoric is the art of persuasion in writing and in speaking. Ultimately, on the AP exam, they are required to have some understanding of current issues and persuade. It isn't a list of texts that you need to review and study for and you can come and if you know those five texts really well, you're gonna do well. It, it really is come to the table and be able to persuade your reader. And that is the goal of this course and I think you need to view it in that way to really understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. There's a nonfiction focus, of course, because they're trying to explore all different topics and gain some understanding in that. Um, and they're breaking down an argument. That's the ultimate goal. How do you craft an argument? How do you break an argument down? And how do you persuade someone else to understand your side. Um, I'm gonna have Mr. Lanehart talk about how he does curate the text list that they use in this course to navigate it because it's not just articulated by the College Board like we've seen before, because he has a very in-depth process for that, and then he can speak a little bit more about his process of guiding kids through the, the discussion and the rhetoric piece. Right, thank you. And, and yes, the, the big thing with this course with AP Lang, and I've been teaching it since about 2005, and I taught AP Lit prior to it, is that it's a rhetoric course, so it's as, as Sarah said, it's about understanding how to persuade, but also understanding when you're being persuaded, and then how to break down those arguments and recognize them. As for the, the text selection, um, I think you know the theme of the course, really, if you look at like the, over the summer, we're reading 1984 on the Fountainhead. And that's something that's been in the summer reading and outliers. It's something that's been in the summer reading for a few years now. But then in the first unit, we're going to get into um, Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And so they're, they're really interesting in that they're sort of like, they're, they're really hard to read. I mean, you probably were made to read them in, in high school. But they're at that core of American identity and of individualism in America. And then if you look at something like 1984, it's about, you know, the, a totalitarian society trying to sort of crush that individualism out of people. And so it's actually a theme throughout, and also in like a room of one's own, it's a theme throughout of this conflict between individual and society. And then as for the arguments and the text and the issues that we discuss, I do spend a lot of time trying to think about, and for the outside reading list that we have, works that have issues in them that are relevant, that are exigent, that are current, that the kids can identify, and that are also not so hot button that they just get into yelling arguments over them. What I'm interested in, I have a sign on the wall, uh, French philosopher Joseph Joubert, and the aim of argument should not be victory, but progress. And so what I'm interested in is kids weighing all sides of arguments, playing with all sides of arguments, understanding how arguments are made, um, finding their own information, thinking critically about their own information, and putting all of that together, as Sarah said, on the AP Lang exam, then they're asked to read nonfiction and understand the rhetorical strategies they use, and then they're asked to write essentially three arguments, three argument essays. So again, the key thing being, it's unusual in a high school, in a high school English curriculum in the sense that it's not like a survey of literature course that almost every other English class is. It's a rhetoric course. Is the AP test just three questions for them? It's yeah. based on their ability to. It's, um, it is one hour of multiple choice, and so they have 45 questions, and then they have nonfiction texts, usually one sort of older one and then two newer ones, but they're like literary nonfiction, so it's a, it's a little harder than like an SAT, and so then they answer 45 questions on that, and then there are three essays, and the first essay is a synthesis essay where they're given a topic. Some years it's um, windmills, uh, whether rural post offices should be closed, uh, whether we should retire the penny, 
what role libraries have, and then they're given sources on that, and then they're asked to make an argument about it. And then there's a second essay where they're given some speech or famous literary essay, and then the author is making an argument, and they're asked to analyze that argument. And then there's a final argument essay where they're given a topic, like recently it was the, the value of striving for, for perfection, excuse me, and then you have to make an argument about whether that's valuable or not. And then the multiple choice questions, it, the AB test has nothing to do with certain books or literature, it's completely their skill set. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it, it actually says in the course handbook, there is no set reading list for the AP language and composition class. Yes. Anything from any nonfiction from the 16th century on, they say you could do that. <laughs> Questions? I think it was just one. Um, it was under. Um, I, was just back. I think it is um, the rhetoric one. Where it's under. Sorry. The required reads and there's. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. Semiotics introduction. Semiotics, yes. And um, I know that like, it, like it's cool. You know, it has like the science stuff like that. And then it kind of just scrolling down. And again, just on the same thing. There's like a part of like ideology like how far like when because there's a lot of required like reads down there and there's just like one one set sheet just like wondering like obviously there's mythology in there as well just i don't know that kind of just caught my eye what 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 you're it just me what, what it's under it says another semiotic terms to know and then denotation is one connotation uh, is under one. which unit um the, the first one the, the rhetoric one. one yeah and then um, you scroll down to required reads, which, by the way, it's so great that you guys have all those highlighted. You guys are great at that. It's awesome. So I have to, like, it's perfect. I'm sure it takes a lot of time. Um, and then the semiotic one, number three. That one, if you click semiotics introduction. Uh, okay. This might, this might be an atlas fail on my part, because I don't mean this to be a required read for the students necessarily. Okay. And I, um, I like yeah, the part like the signs. I just yeah, quite you know yeah. some of those things just stick out to me, and I'm always just like like again kind of just coming back to like ideology and just thinking right. how is that kind of presented to the sure kids? It, and it's and it's and it's yeah very good it's and it's actually not at all about ideology it's about the idea that language is a system of signs and also that vi and I use a lot of this like visual language as a system of signs so actually just before I came in here I was watching YouTube and I there was an Ad where a guy got in his um, electric vehicle and he hooked a rake up behind it and then he drove around on the beach and he collected uh, all the trash. And then he was a very, like, I don't know what you call him nowadays, hipster, like long hair and like the beard. And, and he was sitting there, like, feeling good about himself. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't met. Thankfully, yeah. <laughs> you're not my department. We all have <laughs> Right, anyway, so going back to that, it was great, it was a great ad. Um, and so the point about signs there is that then the car maker, they're trying to associate their car and make it a symbol of caring about the environment. Right? right, And so the point there is it's not really about ideology and the way I use it is with advertising. So the point okay. is about how these advertisers are trying to present these things to us that are maybe not explicitly stated, right. but they're still signaling to us. Gotcha. That's what it's about. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And this one, we have one more. Um, I that we um, would like to talk about really quickly. We had some wonderful feedback from our board members for AP Lit and Western Lit Honors in previous meetings. And we took that feedback and we made some changes. So you'll see those changes in Atlas. And at AP Lit, we changed otherness, that word, to exclusion from society. Western Lit Honors, we switch the lens from feminism to psychoanalytical. So that has been adjusted in Atlas, and with those changes, we're asking if we could move to motion. Yeah, I'm good, so that would be on May 9th, next week. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. What do you want us to do with the three, well, really, it's five English courses, but the, the three bulletins? Because we turn around in a week to the right? Do you want to wait till June for approval? Because anything that's literature based, we tend to slow down because mm -hmm. the, if you're trying to read, it just there's a lot of things to read as opposed to just looking at a textbook or something like that. Um, so we are we are okay with either May 9th or waiting for the June 13th or whatever the June board meeting is mm -hmm. to bring those forward, but it seemed as though the questions were answered this evening. Yeah. Is so, anybody right. planning on doing anything else between you know, now no, and June? Right. I, yeah. I think it's not so much the, as you can tell from the very long conversations we've had, it's mm -hmm. more about how you're presenting things and being mindful and finding the balance and making sure, when, you know, so to me, it's not so much looking at each individual um, source, but we can hold it out if most people want to hold it out. Just, I was pleased with the discussion. Yeah, so okay. I'm not hearing any hold it out. So okay, we'll right. so we will tentatively put them on the May 9th agenda then okay, so of please. the English. Thank you. Right. And then if anybody has, here's questions or something that they want us to, to pull back, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Volker, Algebra 1. Now it gets good. Algebra <laughs> <laughs> 1. All right. All right. <laughs> I found that conversation super interesting. I thought, what am I going to do here? Sweet. Good second. I learned a lot. I'm hearing the question. I don't know either gentlemen, but. I would love to have my kids in their class. Yeah. Just listen to well, well. You, so. Mr. Lee might actually leave. Yeah. Yeah. I did want to ask him. I mean, my you know, yes, he, he does a great job at teaching that AP Lang. He's another one mm -hmm. um, where the kids are usually pretty successful. I think with the results. The results are great. Where they going to get the so, most value out of it? Yeah, the results. That's what you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. I should have said that while I was here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. like it. All right. So this will be fairly dull oh, in this case. Mr. <laughs> Vogel, you are never dull. <laughs> <laughs> so the two courses I'm going to speak about tonight. Well, okay. Just in time for algebra, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I got to leave. So the two courses I want to speak about tonight are courses that are very similar to the ones we talked about, uh, have spoken about before. Um, we did Algebra One for the high school. I'm going to talk a little bit about Algebra One in the seventh, eighth grade level, um, and then Math Seven, which we've already done Math Six prior. So it's the, it's the sandwich course. So there's not going to be a lot of new material. Um, so I don't have a lot of material here. So when we're looking at this, um, basically Algebra One Seven E is um, the same course as the high school one, but it is more a little more advanced, a little more in depth. The complexity um, is there. I have no real good proverbs to throw out or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any quotes on your wall in your class? <laughs> <laughs> I have some cool formulas I can show you. Um, but I think the, the, the idea of the algebra one thing, and we've been really, really successful, especially at this, the, you know, the seventh grade level, in terms of um, the kids performing um, at that the idea is to lay the foundation because to me the algebra one course is the most important course they take it may not be but the most exciting course they're going to take overall but it's the most important <laughs> it is the most important um, and I, I safeguard that when i'm talking to the teachers make sure that they know what's going on before we move them on um, just because they will hit a wall um, I never taught calculus. I taught all the way through uh, honors pre-calculus, so at least they know where they're getting to when they started out. And I want to make sure that they're ready and they can get through the pre-calc. And we're looking at you know the directory, like we talked before, uh, spoke before about getting out of one seventh. Where do they end up in yeah. high school? And I think sometimes we just have to make sure that that foundation is laid. Um, so. To me, this was a really important course. Um, the students review, I mean, integers and the computations, and they explore linear function, uh, linear equations. 
um, by solving, you know, graphing and writing, writing the equations out. They're introduced to uh, li uh, systems of linear equations, and what's cool about systems of linear equations is it kind of pulls everything together that you're learning. If you can do systems, you can do like all the other parts that led up to it. So that's a real big unit when we get into that um, for the kids. Um, we talk about exponents, not as exciting for them as systems of linear equations, because systems of linear equations has some really good real life applications to it. Um, exponents, although there are really good, you know, when they're learning the laws of exponents, it's a little dry, that's when you have to pull in the quizzes and then you have to do the little other side things to do to get them excited. And then we have the quadratic equations. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to emphasize as we have been developing these courses, that's what I love about this um, uh, curriculum renewal process is it just gives us a chance to think a big bigger picture and when I was watching them put up you know talk about the essential questions it's just you know we often get into and in ma as math people uh, into the idea of we're very linear sequential I am very much that um, and um, sometimes we get in the idea of just coverage and so one of the things we're trying to do is exp uh, um, expand the ideas I am not eloquent like a language arts teacher um, but when we we talk about problem solving techniques and how they're emphasized and that's really what we um, focus on um, in terms of all of our units and we're trying to increase the rigor there for that. I know I've used that word before but to me it's so important when we're looking at these courses. And that's the, the Algebra 1, 7, and 8 are largely the same, it just it really depends on, um, we try to go in depth with both the, um, and if we can we'll go in the same depth but they're written largely for the same purpose. So, um, Not every student will take, in, in seventh and eighth grade, they won't necessarily take algebra. They don't know, not right. necessarily. No, you're still advanced if you know, you're considered advanced, right. like they call it. Yeah, but so, so technically yes. they can take algebra in ninth grade. Yes. Right, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, you know, the, the, you know if they take um, math six, math seven, math six, math eight, uh, although I would love to get a better title for those, um, they are the on-level courses. That's where you should be. Right. You know, so there is no problem with that. And actually, Math 8 lays a fantastic foundation. By the time you get through all three, because all three of these courses, um, the series that they adopted, what, five, six years ago, mm -hmm. it's largely written, although it's not written, not written for the state of Pennsylvania, it's written overall, but the, the core standards mm -hmm match the Pennsylvania. We may do a little bit different within our standards of Pennsylvania, but it's largely written for that. So all of the units um, are written with the idea of the standards in mind. So by the time you get six, seven, eight, your foundation is ready for Algebra 1. Mm -hmm. So, What are some of the biggest struggles that they have in like Algebra 7 and 8? Um, Just curious. You mean like unit-wise or overall? Overall, like because overall to me, like we can, and this is one of the things I want them to really focus on. We can teach them how to rope, uh, do uh, things rotely. Oh, jeez, I don't even. By rope. By rope. Thank you. Um, we can teach them. Like I can teach anybody how to solve a two-step equation and not really fully grasp it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're really looking for is readiness and. And can we get them to see a bigger picture of what's going on within the equation? Um, to me, that's all important to move on, as opposed to just being able to do the homework as assigned and then go to the next level. Okay. Thank you. So that's that's the algebra one piece of it. How many years has it been since we changed the the admissions if you will you know for algebra one and seventh grade and then we changed it that so was, not as many that would have to be six years ago yeah it predated my return it to did. it did it came with the new series okay mm -hmm. do we have any idea how that's so if it works if it was six years ago then those students are in well beyond their so yeah. Could be. yeah so it could be finished do we have any idea how that worked out for? I'm hoping um, as we get these, these data coming up here, some mm -hmm. quantifiable data, I have qualitative data, a lot of it, from talking to the uh, high school teachers in terms of how they feel the kids are 
coming up to them and are they prepared? And they feel like they're coming up um, more prepared than they have been in the past. Quantitatively, I don't know yet because um, since I've returned, you know, we had the pandemic that we had last year, which um, although we were super aggressive as a district, which was fantastic because we got them in and we got, but we still have some, um, as we're going through, we still have some learning holes for the kids, um, even though we were in because, you know, we weren't able to go into the same exact depth as we were. So what we've done is, um, in all the courses, rather than do like a, what, I, what I call the pandemic year was in unit zero, rather than unit zero, like a review unit, I don't want them doing any kind of review unit. Um, at the start of the course, because I feel like if we do that, then we're always going to be behind. We're always going to be fighting. So what, instead, what we've asked them to do is when we hit critical spots in the curriculum, um, uh, solving equations would be one. If there was an area where we didn't hit as hard before, that's the time to fill it. So we might be going a little slower than I would really like. So. Um, I, I, I believe some of the changes we're making, and once we get, um, like in all math courses here that are either PSA or Keystone related, we're looking at that May, June units and how we, you know, can we split them, like I mentioned before. We'll be looking at that as well for this. Algebra one's a little trickier because you have the uh, Keystone and the PSA component. So you have to look at exactly how you split that up. I don't know why the state makes you do it, but that's an, an argument for another time. <laughs> Um, so anyway, that's, okay. I think I got that. Any questions on algebra or one? I guess this is, sounds really insane, I realize, but it is the world we live in. Um, who is, I assume you, checking, because there are so many resources and a lot of them have nothing to do with, they're just ones we're using here. But last week there was a lot of national attention about an algebra question that had to do with rape and then another question that had to do with a single mom who was a prostitute. Uh -huh. How are we making sure that's not in our resources? Well, when I checked that series, it was the, the, you know, the Florida thing getting, getting some attention. Um, we don't use that. Um, but if there was any, if anything came up, and I'm not making a video, it's just a, it's just so that was so jarring to see that there was potential. It's insane. Things like that. And so I, I think go it's back in through. multiple places, and I'm sure it'll come out. But it's, I mean, somebody has a full time job. I guess it would be you. Know, but um, <laughs> yeah, questions like that to me are not value added. Um, and to me, if you're going to ask questions, they should be value added. So right. Something like that, I'm I'm not looking to do. Um, so if you know, I'm sure if, if if it does pop up, somebody's going to alert me if I don't see it first. Yeah. Um, but. Um, either way, I'm looking to not go in that direction of what I saw. So, no, I'm sure none of us are that. looking it's for like it, but TikTok unfortunately it's it snuck in all these places now. Oh, you saw it on TikTok? Is that what you said? No, I didn't see that one on TikTok, mm -hmm. but you know, you see you know, some of the extreme examples that get on that. It's the same thing for the, the textbooks when I, they, they post a couple of those prompts and I was like, oh, we better not, and I started going back through and see. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's just unneeded. It's just not necessary. So it's, there's so many other ways and so many other problems and so many other applications that we could look to without doing that. I would think math class would be a subject that would be safe, be safe but not be safe, safe anymore. Number two letters. Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly applications, um, um, data use, even from places like the ACLU, that, that you know that's supposed to be a neutral, you know, maybe not always, but it's supposed to be. Though, you know, when they have the data sets there, I mean, to, to me, I've told my folks yeah, that's okay to use because of, you know, where it's supposed to come. Just check if you're going to use data sets, look who's sponsoring it. If somebody's sponsoring, you know, whether it be like a, a George Soros or a Republican National Convention thing, you don't want to use sources that are funded. You mm -hmm. want to use neutral sources and things that we're going to stand on our own. Um, so that's another thing I've asked them to do and look at. Be careful about how you're using data sets so that you're not um, <clears throat> shaping somebody. You're opening, you're opening up their minds right. to think about things. I think we're ready for math seven. No. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, so this course is much like the ones I talked about before, math six, math eight. Um, and I actually, the data on this was actually promising in terms of the growth data. Um, I'd love to see the raw, the, you know, I can't wait till we can get actually raw data from the state and actually do some comparisons. And, um, 
but the, it comes in. the growth data on the Mass 7 was promising, so that's good. Um, but one of the things we're constantly looking for, at least I am, and I know the team has done a great job with this in terms of um, I constantly ask them looking for learning experiences and also to make sure that they understand fractions and decimals and percents. So that's in the, in the program. That's one of the things I want them to understand um, because that is going to be with them throughout their life. And so that's in our, that's in the curriculum all uh, right through. Our focus areas here too are also ratios and proportional relationships. Um, you know, again, that's something you're going to need to understand and be able to work with. Um, the number system, expressions and equations, geometry, these are things that are getting you ready for going forward in the math sequence. And then statistics and probability, and that is a growing area um, of exploration. So, and to me, it's very important. Um, so we continually look closely as we're developing those sort of big ideas and essential questions. We're going to be taking a step back um, at once these are approved and say, okay, now that we've done this, let's look at the assessments we already have developed and are we meeting our new, you know, the essential questions as they are written and the big ideas. So we're going to be, you know, doubling back and taking a look at that once we're all set. So we're really excited about this whole process. Um, one of the things we're looking at is we build, uh, trying to build conceptual understanding, application, and then procedural fluency. Um, they don't have to be, you know, super fast, but they should have an understanding and be able to work with the numbers fluently. Um, in addition, we, we want them to understand um, with Math 7, Math 8, and Math 6 um, as well, is to understand the fundament geez, ooh, fundamental aspects of algebra. Um, we think that that's critically important as well, and that's woven within, as well as the geometry unit, because uh, that can get them ready as, as well. Even though geometry is not a feeder course like algebra, we still, um, a lot of teachers teach it like I did when I taught geometry. I wove a lot of algebra through it um, to make those connections, um, and it also kept them current for when they would go to algebra two right after that. So um, I think I covered, I covered everything that was part of um, that stuff. Like it, even in, for seventh grade, sometimes they feel so far away from it, but you guys have in there for the percents, like knowing how to use sales tax tips and markups and, and how to be a better consumer. And even for um, like real world, such as auto loans, like that's great, like to start them even younger, even though they're a little bit, I mean, that's perfect. Yeah, the auto loans, they don't always get the full context right. of what it is, but they know they're going to get a car. So, At some point. Um, <laughs> those type of real life applications to me right. are hooks, and that's what really kind of lends relevance to what you're doing, which I think is so important, especially when you're talking about things that are abstract like algebra. Even though the kids do it, and, you know, I go to first grade classrooms, and you know, they're talking about apples and oranges, and all they are is placeholders for the X, you know. <laughs> so they are using algebra back you know, way back then, they're just not, you know, we're just not calling it so they don't, you know, get scared. So, <laughs> I, I know. I still get scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. Oh, I didn't. Great. That's true. Either way. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Should we move these to motion? Are they ready? I think they both sound good. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Next is Dr. Joe with a, a presentation about our Academy for Students and all their is there a reason the screen is a skewed It's. I will decide, maybe. That's what I'm thinking. Because that's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that okay. Drawing towards yeah. 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 I didn't notice until I came up here. I didn't notice until I said that. I saw it as soon as I came in. I'm like, hey, this is good. It's right on my side. I thought there was a reason. Does that see something say something? I just accepted it. Oh, no, I can see it. It's a scary thing. I can't see it. I can't see it. Okay, so we put together a presentation for you tonight, just, just a short presentation to 
um, try to answer some of the questions around the Penridge Academy for Student Wellness. So we've organized it um, into what some of those questions have been. So we'll give a little intro about the, um, the Wellness Academy, talk about the students that we're identifying, what our team is going to look like that supports the students. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. They don't know what, <laughs> um, what our daily operations would look like, um, the financials, and then a summary. So um, just as an introduction, um, we know that we have a group of students that have, is dealing with trauma and mental health issues in their lives. Um, it's impacting their learning, and we don't necessarily have a current program that is meeting their needs. So these are, well, I'll get more into what, what the students actually look like, but so this, this program is designed to meet their needs and support them in a therapeutic environment within the high school. Um, and then hopefully transition them as soon as we can back into that high school environment, transition them successfully. So that's sort of the overall purpose of why we're developing this program. Um, these are some examples of some of our existing students. Um, I went through some of the students that I've been involved with, specific cases. Um, Dr. Scheid's been involved with a number of these students through child study in some of our buildings. But really, the students we're looking at are the, the students that have those internalizing um, conditions. So these are not the students that um, are externalizing. We're not talking about students that have aggression, that are you know maybe cursing at a teacher, or walking out of the classroom. We're not talking about those kind of behaviors. We're talking about the internalizing conditions. So <clears throat> students that are dealing with depression, self-esteem, insecurity, um, attachment to others. We have a student that, that was adopted and is going through some significant um, things. Fear of rejection, not being good enough. Um, anxiety and stress due to family instability, which could be financial or relationships within the family. Um, we have a couple students that have some social anxieties and phobias. Uh, trust issues that are causing anxiety and de depression because of past ab abuse in a particular student's life. Um, and then we, we have students that have chronic medical conditions and fear because they've lost some sort of normalcy in their life. And then grief, um, you know, everybody deals with grief differently. Some students just really struggle when they've had a loss of someone close to them. Could you just explain some aspect of this? Right now, the way that it's set up, if somebody's diagnosed with these issues, they don't automatically get outsourced to some other facility, right? So, so how, but yet somebody that's been, and that may not be the great, greatest term, but mm -hmm. however they're outplaced, as opposed to being alternative a placement. alternative placement. Yes. So who makes that determination as to alternatively place someone? Mm -hmm. And then, because what we're, you're talking about is designing a, a substitute for that alternative placement that will be internally placement, but not, it would kind of be like a parallel track. It won't be completely inside. But I wonder even how we get to this first step so that I can understand, you know, somebody else is making a decision and we're just providing a, a different avenue for them to, to be educated, mm -hmm. right? Would that be accurate? Yes. If, if I go through, maybe if I go through the presentation, it might answer some of those okay. questions. Sure. I'm hoping to paint that picture for you, um, but I can go back to that specifically and answer that if I don't answer it through, okay. through what we have here. This is just one group of students that, that are showing some of these mental health um, issues. And then additional groups of students that we're looking at Students with attendance concerns, students that are um, dealing with substance abuse, students that are receiving homebound services. Our homebound services have increased this year. Um, and these are actually, um, I think I have five students there, specific student bullet points um, that are specific to a student. So one student that's dealing with chronic daily headaches, um, can't deal with the sensory stimulation in the school building. Um, severe difficulty functioning, chronic migraines, pain, anxiety, depression. We have a couple of students with these, um, if you've heard of the COVID-19, they may have gotten COVID and they're having symptoms that just are not going away, um, that they're still dealing with some stamina and fatigue like months later. 
Um, so those are, again, some of the existing um, samples of some of the students. So all of that group of students right now, some of them are getting outside services, so they might be going for, they might have one-to-one uh, -one counseling, they may have family counseling outside of school, um, they may have, we may have done a suicide risk assessment with our crisis counselor here in the building. Um, they may have gone to a hospitalization program and they're struggling coming back into school after that partial hospitalization program. Some of these students can't find room in a, hosp in a partial hospitalization because they're, they're so overwhelmed right now. So we have a lot of students that it can't even get into those placements right now. So to, to try to answer your question, a lot of these students are getting something, but it's not enough. It's not enough intensity for us to impact getting them back into school and getting them back into the academic instruction that they need. Well, who's made the determination yeah. that they need to go outside of school is my question. And it is safe to assume that every one of these students, each building has a child study team, mm -hmm. right? So yes. any student who is struggling for any reason, so it could be behavioral, it could be academic, it could be medical, whatever reason, will go through the child study team. And that is where the, the, the building has conversations with certain counselors, nurse, teacher, administration, the people who would be impacted with that student's life to kind of talk about what can we try, right? What's going on, what's wrong, how can we help? You know, are there outside services involved? What do the parents say, all those types of things. And the child study will then start developing these plans for the students. And it might be as simple as, you're gonna stay after on Tuesdays to catch up on your homework. Right? That, that could be a simple child study plan that comes out to help a student who's, who's behind. So when it gets to the point where the things we're trying at the building level don't work, that's when, and, and Dr. Scheid and Dr. Robarczyk and even Dr. Durr sometimes, if the students are, are special education, will be involved in those conversations at the building level. So there, there will be a district lens for that. And so if students then, all of the things that we're trying at buildings, that's when that conversation starts like, okay, is it not going to work here? And if it's not going to work here, what happens? So is it a decision that we options? make as a school, or is, yes. as opposed to the parents saying, hey, you can't provide the kind of support that we need oh. to educate a child? But we've, yeah, well, that's I mean, my question. Is, are, are the parents involved in this from step one? Yes, oh. yes. all the way through. Okay. And currently these kids are in school. They're not outplaced because they're in school. Some of them may be outplaced right now, and some of them we haven't been able to get them to school. So they're in their bedrooms, and we're trying attendance improvement plans, and we're sending, um, we work with other agencies to go out to the home and work with the family to help to get their child out of bed and get a routine in the morning and actually going into the home, and that's even not enough. It needs so to be So these aren't kids, like the example of staying after Tuesday wouldn't really work because they're not even coming Tuesday, right? Well, it, and, and we have to be really, really clear that there is not one picture, right? There, there is not one thing because all of these bullets are different students. Right. And so there isn't going to be one profile that says, here it is. But every one of these students has some level of those internalizing conditions as well as they're under successful in school. Because there are some of them who are attending school for the most part and are not successful for whatever reason. There are other students who you know, are struggling to attend school and are unsuccessful. There are some students that aren't attending school at all. And then there are some students who would be an alternative placement, either have been there temporarily, because that might be a hospitalization, and then they transition back. Or it could be something that's a longer term than that, depending on what the situation is. And How we many have students that fit all of those categories you know, from here. How many students right now fit into this? model our currently home, yeah our, our plan is that we really feel as though we can service 30 ish students in this program right now when we look at our existing list and, and you go from that part, <coughs> we're in the low 20s right and so you have to prioritize we haven't looked at rising ninth graders right we haven't looked at eighth graders who will be at the high school next year we obviously aren't talking about seniors because um, they won't be there. And so we'll have to make that determination. And also, what will happen during the school year. And we're not going to start full, most likely. Now, we really do hope, and you'll learn this, that there's lots of transition out, so that the, the list that's 21 or whatever it is from day one won't be the same 21 the whole school year. Mm -hmm. And there will be different students that will come and go as part of that. 
And it was my understanding that this was sort of an evolution as to what you've, you've been trying to do at other uh, levels. So that if a child had a particular need, as opposed to sending them to a, the intermediate unit, you were trying to deal with the child here in the in our own local school as well? Is this kind of an extension of, of that thinking? Yeah, when you're yeah. talking about bringing programs back in pupil services, I guess this would be the same mindset because the overarching goal has always been educating our students with Penridge teachers in Penridge buildings. And, and most parents want to have that. Sure. And, and so that's sure. their desire. <laughs> so that. I was always thinking of this as simply an extension of, of that concept. Of For some of those students, we will hope that this will revert an alternative place for Yes. But there are some students who are still either attending or, or trying to attend their home school and, and not being able to. So they're not all alternatively placed. Okay. Anymore. The last um, meeting, um, and maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, there were only five listed under alternative placement. I know, like you said, there's some kids that aren't even coming to school. But am I wrong with saying that? But there were only five I students in the entire before. district that are in al alternative placement currently. Alternative placement in that presentation was um, students that are like in a detention center. Okay. Um, in a more the detention center. What they were like Lakeside school, not that's different. No, right, that's different. That's okay. Different. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because actually, to steal information from a slide that shows up, I believe on the list, I think at Lakeside alone there are seven students that were considered. Yes. And that's at Lakeside alone. Yeah. There are other alternative places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with the attendance concerns, so we had a good conversation with the counselors last week at the presentation. How does a program like this, how will it be more successful in getting the kids out of the home? I mean, what is it because we're going to have more people on staff to address that? Or how do you fix that? Mm -hmm. So the way that I see that happening is now when we're trying to convince a student to come back to school or to come into the high school. The only option we have is the high school and it's a big place and it's overwhelming. Um, so that's not something that they can handle right now. But with this option, we can con try to convince them and we'll have the, um, the social worker involved in working with the family. We'll have the counselor involved in working with the family and the student. We'll go into the home in the morning you know, and, and set up routines for them and have them come and visit and see the environment that we're talking about and show them this is a small environment, therapeutic, you're coming in a different entrance, it's not overwhelming, you're not going to be in this huge high school with all of these students and all of this transition. And this is where we want to, we want to start. And then we'll build the expectations from there. Right now we don't even have that option to entice a student mm -hmm. we try to entice them however we can but we don't have this option um, that that provides that therapeutic and, and, and environment that they need okay and that seems like it would work for kids with anxiety and those kinds of things but kids who are who have medical concerns that prevent them from being able to come to school i mean that's not going to change because it's a smaller environment i mean if they have medical issues that prevent them from being able to get up and, and get over here. Um, you know, that's, we're still not going to hit those kids. And a lot of, I feel like some of those kids um, would be described in the kids you're targeting. Mm -hmm. Some of those students, so for example, the students with, uh, with limited stamina or fatigue. Again, coming back to a big high school, having to walk from class to class, navigate those transitions in the hallway, as opposed to coming into a therapeutic environment where they can rest, they can take those rest breaks when they need to, they can work when they can, even if they're just coming for an hour a day um, in place of that hour of homebound instruction that we provide right now. Even if we can just get them back into the building for an hour a day and start to build up that stamina, um, that's a start for that student. They're, they're not out of the building, in their home, in their bedroom, um, at least we're getting them here. You might answer this later, so I'll, I'll wait a little while and see okay. if it comes up. Okay, all right. Um, so this is the team that we're putting in place. So we have a social worker that really will handle the daily operations and, and work with the team that we have in place. They're that liaison between the school and the community agencies. 
So if we have a student that's in a partial hospitalization and ready to transition back to school, the social worker really is that li liaison to work through that transition back. Um, and they really are that connection with the family and making sure that the family has the, the supports that they need. The licensed counselor is really that one-to-one -one person working specifically with students, providing mental health services. It can be one-to-one -one counseling, group counseling. They'll be writing wellness plans, um, attendance improvement plans, transition plans for when a student is maybe ready to go out for a class. What does that look like? When they're ready to go out for more than one class, what does that look like? And then start that full transition back into the high school. Um, we'll have a special education teacher and the two teaching assistants that will um, be working through that academic side of things, um, making sure that students are getting the direct instruction that they need. There's the support between um, what's happening in the general education classroom. So if a student is working on Canvas, they're that support back and forth with the general education teacher. If we have a student that might be on cyber, they'll be making sure that that student is supported through the cyber program. So that academic support can look lots of different ways depending on the needs of the student. Um, and the teaching assistants would then support that as well. They can go out into general ed. If we have a student that's ready to start to transition back, you know, they can be that person that walks with the student initially and spends a little bit of time in the class making sure that they're doing okay and that connection back and forth between the, um, the academy and the general education classroom. So just looking at numbers, you're talking about there being, you're hiring five employees to work with 30 <coughs> kids, which is about six kids per employee. Some of the kids may come in for an hour, if possible, a day. Um, you know, are we going to have a lot of, I'm just concerned that we're going to have too many staff members <coughs> not enough kids for them to be supporting. <laughs> but this is an intensive program. So these are our most needy students. So that social worker, for example, may be out all morning, not in the academy, visiting homes and working with families and working with students. The counselor may be, go may be in homes as well. So there's initially, when we have a student that's um, that attendance is the, the issue and the anxiety, they're doing a lot of work in that home to get the student back, first of all. Um, and then the counseling that's gonna be happening with 30 students and, and one counselor, you know, that's, that's a lot of counseling. Who's so, doing this work now with yeah. those students? Um, well, they're all getting pieces of it in different ways. So, so is the school paying for that now, those services now? Right, so they might, every student has a school um, counselor assigned, and that would continue, but the school counselors don't have the, the, in, the time for the intensity that these students need to provide that kind of Yeah, counselor. so is, is it no one doing it now? So these services that are being provided by these five, mm -hmm. that we would be paying for and providing for them right now. Right. They, they're not receiving any of those services right now. Only if their parents are seeking outside counseling services for them. Or if we have room in a crisis counselor's schedule, which is very rare that we can get students into the crisis counselor because they're, they're, max, they're maxed right now with the students that they're seeing. So okay. kind of, and there are some receiving homebound, and there are some yes. alternative placements, mm -hmm. and, yes. and we do have a social worker at high school, so there would be some of these students who may have some interaction with the current high school social worker. Uh, there, there's a value associated with these services that some families, like you just said, are getting outside, and so they are paying for them outside. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how this will work if we choose which students go into the Wellness Academy and then yet we have families who are paying for those same services outside of the school district. How are we going to manage that? Mm -hmm. yeah, I've asked Dr. I've asked Mr. Miller that mm -hmm. very question and he has said that he doesn't have the concern from a legal standpoint, although he is putting together something for us okay. to talk about what that would look like. And, and I don't believe the intention would be to supplant. If there is a family that is ha having their student on the outside with a therapist, the social worker might very well connect those, and there might be some pieces inside where the professional counselor would see that student to help um, 
augment that debt, but it wouldn't be to replace that. That is not the purpose of this, to say to a family, your child's going to therapy, oh, send them to school and we'll give them therapy here instead. That, that is not the point. Yeah. So I'm picturing, but I don't know if this is right, um, one of my sons did cyber school for medical reasons. He did it completely from home, but if he was, whatever, having trouble with his laptop, he'd come into Mrs. Gersh's room, and there were several students who did cyber school, but they came here all day and worked in her classroom, and they had couches, and they mm -hmm. could, like, chill out and take their breaks. Because not all of them were there necessary for medical. I don't know the reasons everybody else was. Something between, like, that and almost, like, uh, Penn Foundation, the mental health part where kids are working with counselors and teachers. Is that accurate? Some something in between those two things? Like almost an in-house like Yeah, I would say it's a combination. So we're working on the academic piece and the mental health piece at the same time in the same All location. in one area of the building. And this team is yes, all in one location so that this team is supporting that student with those mental health and academic pieces in the same place, which doesn't happen right now. Right, right. And one of the huge benefits of it being here is that it's not one place or another. Right? The two situations you described are either they're at one of those locations full time. There might be some students who are at the academy full time for that day because they need that or for a week or for whatever that looks like. But the whole purpose is to have them here so when they are ready and it's appropriate, we transition them to the high school so they can go to math. They and that's can go completely to optional. The parents so. decide they want them here or not. The parents would decide not the, the school. Family. Yes, this is a complete family partnership. So, so it feels like if we build it, will they come? That's the issue, right? If we build it, will they come? Mm -hmm. Because I, in my mind, for some reason, I was thinking that we had to pay for these services outside the school and we were bringing it in-house in order to realize some cost savings but also for the benefit of the parents because they got to get the service anyway and it's better for them to have it at their home place than to have it elsewhere but now I'm hearing something different and maybe I just didn't understand it initially that these services aren't even being provided you know so this is we're providing additional services on top of whatever we they're receiving right now but we're hoping that by by putting these services into place that the parents will elect the, to have their students come into the class, in, into the school building itself to receive that as opposed to just continuing with the cyber school or continuing with, a, with whatever they're doing at home. Right. So if I can give you an example that just came today, came across my desk today. A family who is their child was in a partial hospitalization placement and got released today. Today's Monday. So this um, student is looking to transition back to the high school tomorrow and is very anxious. And the parent asked if we would consider sending the student to ABC location. Well, <clears throat> when I researched that location, it reads almost exactly like what we're building right here. And I wish I could rewind and say, we have this ready tomorrow for your daughter to transition back and we can give her that support as she then gets ready to go back into full time into the high school. They're concerned about that, just her coming back full time. So we have a safety plan that we're putting in place and we put some supports in place, but this is really what those students need is this kind of a program that supports that transition. And it's not just, you know, they're not jumping right back into that um, big, overwhelming environment. Of the high school. What was the place the parent, is there a place now that the parent wants the student to go but it's just not as ideal within the building? Like, No, it asking? was an out of district. Oh, okay. And then would we pay, we, the school district would pay for that then, right? Or if what? we agreed to right. it, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, so let me show you, these are some examples of what um, student schedules could look like. Again, just looking at some of the scenarios that we have right now. This would be starting with student A, a, a student, and this goes from more support to less support as I go through the student examples. So this first student would be a student who's transitioning back from out of district, just like the student I just gave you the example of. Maybe coming out of a partial hospitalization program, they come into the Wellness Academy and they attend full time, they receive all their academics and counseling supports in our wellness program. Sample student B, 
may start the day in the Wellness Academy, have that check-in with the counselor, um, make sure that you know they're, they have their intentions set for the day, they are able to go to their second period class because that's maybe there are less students in that class or it's a teacher that they feel more comfortable with. Um, maybe that teacher knows something about what's going on with the student and has been a mentor in the past. Um, student goes to second period class, but then they return to wellness for counseling and the remainder of their day getting that um, the rest of their academic day and support in wellness. So those are um, two students. The next student may check in in the morning, set their intentions for the day with that counselor, social worker, teacher. They go to all their classes in the high school because they're now at, at that point that they're ready to do that. But they lunch is overwhelming. It's the big cafeteria. Um, a lot of stuff goes on socially in, at lunch. So they're, they're more comfortable coming back to wellness for lunch and for a check-in about how the beginning of their day went and make sure that they're ready for the rest of their day out in the general ed classrooms. At the end of the day, they come and check in again, just make sure that everything went okay. Is there anything we need to problem solve through so you're ready for, for tomorrow? Sample student D would attend all of their classrooms in the high school, but they may have had a recent loss in their family, they're really struggling, um, and they, they're coming in for a grief group that's being run every Tuesday. Um, and then the student's able to come to wellness. If, they, if they're in a classroom and they start to feel overwhelmed and don't want to be embarrassed, they can come into wellness and get some support <coughs> until they feel ready to go back out. And then the last student, I put an example here, attends all of their classes. Maybe we had a policy violation, the student's been you know, vaping or involved with marijuana, and they're coming in for some drug and alcohol counseling for a session every Wednesday. So those are just some examples to give you some kind of that continuum of the students that we're looking at. Yes. Yeah, if you're moving on to financials, then I guess my question. So what's the um, what philosophy are we going? Would you be following? You know, as far as the, the therapy. Um, you know, we had. I forget her name. Dr. The, the, that came to us last Thursday, and I liked a lot of what she said about the avoidance cost and about putting um, exposure. the exposure, mm -hmm. you know, having students moving or her patients um, moving to get over whatever the anxiety is and get them back. Right. So for me, what one of the attractive parts about this to me would be that we could exercise a bit of control over the type of therapy and the philosophy that we really want to be moving them, you know, back. And so um, your counselors and everyone else, is there a way to, I don't even know, there's like a package that you could. Well, it's definitely a question as we are talking to the therapist, because Dr. Dalscott really spoke to the cognitive-based mm -hmm. theories. Mm -hmm. It's really what she got at, right? Yeah. Exposure was part of that. And so for us to talk to the, the people that we are considering for the positions, because that would be the person that would be primarily providing that within the school setting. Mm -hmm. um, the other connection that you'd want to make if a student is with an outside therapist to make sure that there is a connection between what the student's hearing outside as well as what's hearing inside. Mm -hmm. And so we would need to facilitate those types of conversations. But, but that's, a really, I mean, that, that's a really fair question. I think it's an easy thing for us to be asking mm -hmm. of the, the licensed counselor. I, yeah, I mean, for me to be supportive, I would that would be important to me that we're we're going to be counseling people in a certain um, from a certain point of you know philosophy, I guess I should say, or way of doing things. The CBT. Um. Yeah, that's something I struggle with, and there's probably no easy answer. Is um, what Dr. Dalsgaard said was seemed so logical and that it could really move students in the right direction and so I struggle with you know are you enabling with some of this that's what I worry about but yeah that's pretty much the standard right now cognitive based therapy is is the standard that most licensed counselors are using with students mm -hmm. um, so that's I mean that, that's sort of the the assumption when you talk to them, but um, as we go through interviews, it's definitely 
you know, a question that will probe. I think it's great that it's being provided. I'm just not sure whether it's our role to provide it. I'm still struggling with that a little bit. Like we could provide a lot of different services for our students. You know, we could go down. So, so where do we determine what's a, a, a necessary or essential service that we need to provide, and what then you know are they are parents or families on their own to provide? I'm not sure. I don't know where that line is, but that's that's where I'm kind of I'm not I'm not landed someplace in there because if 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 they're having, if they're feeling overwhelmed right now, where do they go? Do they go to the school psychologist, or where? If I'm in school, and, and where do I go now, or do I go outside and, and have my family member, you know, try to connect me with a, a service provider outside? Mm -hmm. So, and then if we're trying to bring that in, where? Then I think it goes to the question: Do we subsidize everybody? Whether you receive it in, if I'm in need of that, and I've said, okay, well, we've made a decision philosophically that we need to provide this service to our students. You know, we should open up to the whole student, not just those that are getting it in-house, but if it's a service that's necessary for us to educate them, then let's subsidize, you know, them getting services outside the facility then too. I, I don't know where, how you could draw that line. If, it, if the answer to the first question is, this is a necessary function that we need to fulfill in order to educate our, our students. Mm -hmm. and, and we are constantly having conversations because when you look at that second bullet there, in terms of the significant savings that is happening in people's services over the last three or four years, because that, that this is not unique to, to past budget presentations. A lot of that has been conversations around what can we do here that is being done there. That's where I was and, and right, we, right. And, right. And so there has, I understand right, why right. you have that perception, and there is some of that, because if you look at then, you know, the, the second to the last bullet, there are seven students who are sitting at Lakeside right now that potentially, when we when we talk to the parents, they may come back, right? And there's the actual savings. If we, yeah, it's 150,000 per student or something like that. No, it's right. not quite right. that much for Lakeside, but okay. some can be, but, but not that. Oh, well, what and kind so, of no, that we're paying for. Yeah, correct, we're, that, that right. we're paying for that slot, right? Gotcha. And so when we looked at the types of students that are being under successful, because this isn't every student who's getting therapy. But this is not that's not that's not what this slide is intending to say, right? We that is not our role, would be my opinion, right? And so the question would be, when is that part significant enough that it's causing the under successful, whatever that is, whether that's attendance, whether that's you know, um, and so how can we then provide that at an economical piece where there will be some cost savings? Now it's not one to one, mm -hmm. right? But depending on the number of students. And I really do think when you said if we build it, will they come? I think the hard part will be keeping it at a number. Because our goal long term is this is successful to expand at the high school and to really think six through 12, right? Because there are students like this at the middle school level that we talk about that we don't have this for there. And so for us to eventually think about how can you expand that, it gets a little more cost efficient when you make it a little bigger within the same system. And so there are startup costs, right? In terms of five people for 30 students, right? We might be able to do five people for 50 students. But the whole point is, we need to make sure it works. We need to make sure it truly is helping kids, right? We need to track data and say, is this making this better, or have we just moved the problem, mm -hmm. right? And that, that may not be enough. We may look at it in a year or two and say, it didn't. I don't think that will happen. I think we'll be able to come back a year from now and say, here are the 18 students who transitioned back to the high school full time, and the other 41 that we service to different levels, or you know, whatever that date is going to be. Um, we're excited by it because we know there are kids that are struggling that this will help, and we don't currently have the this to help them. That, 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 that's what this is all about in terms of why the, the idea came. From, is it made really clear that it's temporary to the parents? Like, because I think that, you know, that was another part of the presentation, well, the, the, the presentation that we saw, mm -hmm. um, was that you, you actually have to get the parents also to, to buy in to the idea that this is a transition and helping really means getting them back to the regular placement. So, yeah, I mean, that's the whole goal of this program. So that's the conversation with the family from day one. You know, this is, this is our effort to start and then there's going to be expectations along the way. And we're going to build those expectations that, you know, they do start to get back into the high school or their general education classes. That, that ties in a, a couple questions I have. First, though, the students at Lakeside now that we think could come back, mm -hmm. what kind of issues are they attending Lakeside for? Because the list initially looked to me like you wouldn't be there for headaches, you wouldn't be there for 
COVID related? Like what kind of students would currently move from Lakeside back here? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of reasons a student go to Lakeside. There's not one type of student that goes. So that's what I'm but asking. The type what of students we're talking about are the mental health internalizing behaviors mm -hmm. that have made it to the point where they are not attending Penridge and had to attend someplace else. And for, for those students, it was Lakeside. And you think the services that we would have here would be intense enough to replace Lakeside? So we have more than seven students at Lakeside. So we don't think that we don't think that this replaces Lakeside. Right. We do think that there is a an opportunity for us to have conversations with those seven families to say, we think we can. We we, we think looking at your child's profile, we think we can provide what they need here. Let's talk about that. But that's gonna be family conversations, right? We're, right. we're not going to say you're in, you're out, right? That those are conversations with families about students and about what that could look like. It'll also be important as we hire the five individuals who will be working with these students for them to understand the goal is that this is temporary. Right? As you asked that question, yes, for them to encourage kids in terms of the way they talk, as opposed to, you know, we're here for a family, we're staying together for 180 days. Just, so, you know. from a financial perspective, though, I, the, those numbers always frustrate me because I feel like it's a shell game. When you talk about the savings to the pupil services budget, right? Let's say we have a program where we have. Um, we have a program that we're sending five kids out to. We decide to duplicate that program at Penridge so we can bring those kids back, right? The pupil services budget will show that we saved however much money it was costing us to send five kids to that out of district placement. But the teacher that we just hired to do that same program here doesn't show up in the pupil services budget. It shows up in the personnel budget. And so even though it could be costing us more money you won't see the amount of money it's costing us because that gets moved to a different budget. And so it's a little bit disingenuous to say that we're saving $1.2 million because there's also a cost to all of the personnel that we hire to, to bring those services here. And for and this program, it's that first one. Yeah. We're, we're not trying to hide that number. It's, it's the first I'm not talking about the first line. I'm talking about the second line of we've saved $1.2 million because and it's just not accurate because it doesn't take into account, just like all the autistic support classes that we're opening and then we're hiring autistic support teachers and then we're hiring assistants for those programs, those costs, we're, we're looking at the savings of bringing those kids in, but we're not deducting the costs of having those services here in the same budget. There are two separate budgets. Well, the vast majority of that 1.2 million, if not all of it, I'd have to go back and look at every one of those dollars, does not incorporate into an extra cost someplace else at a different one. Yeah. The, the majority of those are true. Say, if not all of it, I have to look at it. Well, you can even um, look at your people services but, budget that so. was proposed for next year, and those are not the, the you're, we're, 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 we're accounting for the savings of what we're bringing back, but the personnel piece is not accounted for there. That's accounted in the personnel budget. So the personnel number is in that 374. So, right, we are, we, that, that is what the personnel that's will final, cost for the final academy. Difference. Yeah, right, that's, and that's what I, I have done every year um, respectfully when we show the savings then we show like when we brought those classrooms back for this year we showed what those personnel costs were going to be that were shifting from the savings that I was able to garner from people services we showed the savings and then we showed here are the new costs for the new programs that we're starting and these costs will show up in personnel. So we've always showed those side right, by side. Right, you show it in the cost analysis, but then mm -hmm. when it comes to the budget, it's those items aren't budgeted for in the personnel budget. They're budgeted or in the in the pupil services budget. They're budgeted for in the personnel budget. Budget. So it doesn't it doesn't accumulate in totality. So you, you show it when you do the presentation on a specific item like this, right? But then after this comes into fruition, that three hundred seventy four thousand dollars doesn't go into the pupil services budget, right? After this, the personnel piece of that is going to go into the personnel budget. And so right. over time, when you're adding up to get to $1.2 million, you're not including the fact that over time, all of these personnel positions that are costing you money have been moved to a different budget. That's, that's I'm not, I'm just saying, you know. But it, if you add it up over time, what moved into the personnel budget, and you add it up over time, all of the budget savings, you would still see there were these budget savings over the three years and over the three years here were the increased costs you could still put them side by side that's and show yeah. that difference i always thought when we were shown um cost avoidance or savings that it was a net like a 
that you did take mm -hmm. out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can do it. I um just questions for uh, I'm, I'm with Jonathan on on basically my concern is like is it our role um, as as a public school system here when we talk about some of the lakeside students which I know is not all the ones that go there they're heavily trained in that building throughout to deal with those things and a lot of times when when they transition back they go through you know they're being recommended by lakeside they, with the parents you have a communication with the school and um, there's goals that they have to achieve before they can kind of transition back. So I fear like, it, it, even though I know we're identifying kids as best their knowledge, but then when they come here and they're missing some of those coping skills, I also, um, just thinking of some things that come back and if they're in the wellness program, how is like the confidentiality protected? If they have different things, especially with some of the job description, like with, um, you know, if they were, it says they'll participate in crisis intervention. Some of them will be, I guess, um, speaking with like the hospital, the partial hospitalization. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with some of that within the room, how is confidentiality being protected? If you have, I don't know, 15 kids in there at a time, if they're trying to come, I guess I, I'm trying to wrap my head around like them being transitioned from Lakeside. How is Lakeside a part of that saying we recommend that if they didn't reach some of their goals? Just some of those questions. So we do that now when students are ready to transition. Mm -hmm. So it's the, sometimes it's the building principal, sometimes if it's a student with an IEP, it's a special ed supervisor. And the, maybe the guidance, the school counselor has those meetings with Lakeside and the parents before the transition happens. Mm -hmm. And they talk about that transition. So we always have permission to share information both ways with the other agency. So that's handled through that permission to release. Both so they ways. would be on board as well. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then my other question is that's only seven, and then a lot that we can't we can't get to come to school. Have we used our resources efficiently enough? Because like like you know we talk about the response costs. How have we held families accountable with their kids to get here? Because you know in my experience, when truancy is involved, and, and you kind of up the ante, sometimes that brings them in more so or like court hearings, those kind of things. Like how have we, what have we done already? Like I know like Dr. Walton, you said about that we um, would like to get data on that to like have them come in. Like what have we already done already? What's the data on some of the things that have worked to get those students in? So we've pretty much exhausted those resources mm -hmm. um, that we have. Mm -hmm. And these again are the most significant students that are not responding to those resources. And families. So and what they like, what need more they? intensity. Okay. So um, even an outside service, um, you know, I'm not sure of what the frequency, I'm trying to think of a student right now who has services and what that frequency is, but we'll have the ability mm -hmm. to have that one-to-one -one contact every single day right. with the family. So truancy has been involved and they've even mm -hmm. had to go to court and I, I, that's already in it, play. Like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking, they're not yeah, coming yeah. to school. Not like, necessarily, I can't yeah. put my brain around how that working. Right, and maybe not necessarily <laughs> truancy and the courts have been very, handling truancy very differently recently. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's not as much citations for families as there used to be. Um, so we don't see that happening as much in the courts. Um, but we do have an obligation to report attendance and we right. do that. Right. Um, and a student who has a medical condition, whether it be medical or mental health mm -hmm. based, if they are being right. treated, mm -hmm. right, there isn't a truancy court that's going to accept a citation based right. on right. the fact that there's a doctor saying my child can't, right. you know, whatever, whatever that is. And that's where I feel like that confidentiality piece comes in. If you have medical, mental health in the academy, how is that going to play out so that some of those things don't get blurred? I feel like there's some, some lines that could get blurred in those specifics because you would have like, to deal with some of the medical and if it's one-on-one -on -one counseling, group counseling, to give them the room. Oh, it's not all in one room. Okay. So it's a space, and then there are separate offices, mm -hmm. there's a conference room area. So there are privacy areas within the space okay. for students. I was thinking the same thing though earlier as far as if there's counseling in the school, and this is a question probably Mr. Muller has, maybe he's already answered. 
what's the confidentiality between that counselor and the student? Because typically outside of that situation, I would expect as a parent to know every single thing that happens with my student in here. Is that temporarily lifted? Or is, what's our liability with whatever conversations might happen with a licensed counselor that then they couldn't, we could, either couldn't or wouldn't be expected to convey that to a parent? And if that is truly like they're going into a therapist's office, is the parent aware that while they're at the Wellness Academy, things might be discussed that even though they're at school, will not be coming back to them? Or that that would be based on the, that individual therapist's you know, opinion on how to handle that? So and maybe the, we haven't gotten Those would be individual, um, I mean, every family is going to be involved in this from day one. So it's going to be in conjunction with the family and what they're comfortable with. Um, you know, maybe the parent comes in with the student and the therapist, I can see that scenario. Um, so every family is going to be able to make that decision about what they're comfortable with for their child. Um, and just like with um, any counseling, um, you know, that happens with a child, if there's ever, they have a code of ethics, and if there's anything that's ever safety related or, or concern for the child, that immediately has to be communicated with the parent. So we follow that with our school counselors as well. We've talked to a couple of districts that have similar programs to this. So I've added down one of the questions that we haven't asked them is whether they have a standard therapist release. Which is what, like, from a legal standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I, I will at least ask that question because I'm not sure whether there is a standard thing that says, "Here, mom and dad, you know, sign here," right, or not. You know, so we'll have to ask that question in terms of what is required. That way. There's parts of it I really, I really like. There's just I still have some concerns. I think a big one is so we know this. We know this is temporary. At what point? Does the parent and student know this is a four-week program, this is a six-week program, you just can't drag out. At some point, if you can't be successful at Penridge, you are going to Lakeside or Alternative or Homebound. And during that transition period, um, is this going to be, I'm bored in math class, I'm going to go back to wellness for a little bit, I want to go to the bathroom, I'll go talk to my wellness academy. I mean, kids yeah. have like, any kid they is play, you know, famous for that. that. This game I know what I would have yeah. done, and, yeah. and I'm yeah. a pretty yeah, good no. student. But really? if I have a reason to get up and leave mm -hmm. class when I'm not digging it, I would have probably done it. Yeah. <laughs> and and the teachers, I think, like if a kid's like, I'm overwhelmed, I need to go to the academy if I'm in class, and mm -hmm. the teacher's probably like, that's right, like, because some of the other placements, they're all heavily trained in how to, to deal with that. And then it's like, okay, well, yeah, I guess you have to go. I know. Yeah. And this staff tough. is going to be heavily trained, too. Mm -hmm. These In guys. the academy. Yes. Right. I mean, they'll be trained right. and they'll be transition plans. So the students are going to know what the expectations are. Um, you know, if you're ready to go back for your algebra class, um, are you, okay, we'll start, you're going to go back for half of your class. And then you're going to be expected. You have to stay for your whole algebra class. Mm -hmm. And we're going to expect that. Um, and, you know, it's going to be expectations and, um, you know, written plans with the student that they understand those expectations and the families are on board as well. So um, we do that now with our, with our students with IEPs. You know, there are certain expectations and there are um, consequences and reinforcement when they do the right thing. And we'll be building that into this program as well. And we've said this in other presentations, but we haven't said it yet tonight, so if you want to clarify, this is not a special ed nor a regular ed program. Regular ed students will qualify for this program who are, the, who are the ones who need to be in this program. So there could be special ed students, there could be regular students. There's likely there will be. You know, when you have a mix of 30 kids, it's likely that there will be both. So uh, the fact that Sherry is making, Dr. Gurr is making this presentation, some people then equate that to this as a special ed program, right? So I just want to make sure we, we say that again tonight. And this summary just is some of the bullets from some of the questions that we received. So I, I won't read those to you, but um, in fact, I think we talked about most of what is on there already. Um, but if there are other questions, I'm certainly happy to answer any. I think you had said before that your your point in, behind this program was to a safety net for the kids who aren't who don't have an IEP or a 504, right? To try to catch the kids who who don't qualify for services. Right? But no, still have other concerns that wouldn't 
that are impacting their education but don't necessarily qualify in the special ed right. that that now. student that you paint very well could be serviced here if they have Right, the need for this program. This is not intended to be the next le level of you didn't qualify for special ed, so here's another option for you. That would be a regular ed program. And this isn't solely a regular ed program, although there will be you know, regular ed students in it, and maybe the majority of them are regular ed students in terms of what's appropriate. But if you think back to the types of students we were talking about as we envision, if this were open today, who would we invite to be part of this? That's, that's the exercise. We went through and those were the bullets that were a couple slides back. And that didn't have anything to do with qualifying academic testing or any of those types of things that might come into play when you're trying to decide about special ed versus regular ed. Right, but they would qualify in a 504 plan. If there was a medical. Right. right? What, what I'm saying is you're talking about, you're talking about if, if you had those additional things, anxiety, all these other things, and you had an IEP, you would get services for that. If you had a 504 plan and you had these other um, concerns, you would qualify for services for that. If you don't have either of those and you have anxiety and all of these other concerns, that's where you don't fit into um, kind of a category of support, which I thought was what you were saying, you're kind of targeting the audience you're targeting, targeting with this was to help those kids who don't have that avenue. We obviously are targeting students who are not currently as successful as we'd like them to be at Penridge High School. So from that standpoint, they don't have the supports. And, and, and maybe the disconnect I'm having with what you're saying is that obviously students are special ed for, for lots of reasons. And so there, there may be some that are not appropriate for this program because they are receiving some of these services outside, maybe that's what you're saying, right? Where there might be other special needs, students with special needs who would qualify for this program because they still have some of these characteristics that are appropriate for this program. Okay, okay. Never mind. Okay. What, what constitutes failure or non-success? Yeah. What do you do with that student? Does, it go, does that student go back to Lakeside? In other words, you can't make it here, we've got to send you, who determines that? Is that the parents, is that the counselor or everyone involved? It's, I would say it's a combination of the team and the data that we've collected and looking at what we've implemented for the student. Um, you know, and we're always implementing and, and tweaking and implementing and tweaking until we get the right the magic combination that works for a student so we keep trying we keep trying um, until we get to a point that we think you know what we've, we've exhausted all of our resources here and now we have to look for another option so it's kind of a combination of all of that and it's it's hard to give you a black and white answer because no, 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 I, and I, I understand it totally. yeah but I just want to hear it you, you can, right. yeah. it's not working if you try something yeah. else that's right. exactly that's but exactly I mean, you, what you're but you can take that philosophy and just continue it down the yellow brick road no, it's not know. working here let's try this right. oh it's not working here let's, i mean and i've seen some iep parents that do the same thing right. oh let's let's take this drug and move it here or this this so there's got to be an end point where you finally just say it, yep. we're it's got to end. We're not stop. seeing progress. Right. Yeah. And is academics a huge part in that too of holding them accountable? Like it's not like, you know, because that's, I feel like it's our main job to help them be prepared, be successful, after to leave here, be contributing, be, you know, all those things. So how do we make sure like, you know, do, do they get excused from assignments? If like some of the examples, mm -hmm. they're not out there. I know they have Canvas. I know they have that option. They mm -hmm. can work. In there, but let's say they just don't get to it. Are they still? Will, will that expectation still be clear that you still are responsible and you will be held accountable to complete, even even if you modify it? I know like you can modify yes. things and work with the teachers, but just not like okay, excuse, 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 because you're feeling overwhelmed. Right. That's like the tricky, and I know it's not a one size fits all. I right. get that, but that's the point: is to get these students back and get them focused on their academics while keeping that mental health support that they need. Right now, they're not even engaging in the academics or engaging minimally. Okay. 
Thank you. I know. A lot of questions. It's okay. It's okay. Well, I mean, it don't be a big undertaking, and we should ask a lot of questions for sure. About it, so don't feel bad no. about that. No. And Absolutely. there will be more two weeks from now, so send it. Right? I mean, that, okay. that, that's. And once it opens, we need to have a presentation on how's it going, yep. right? Like what? Here's our data. Yeah, yeah because you are talking about, I mean, it, is, it involves construction and changing the actual physical building. And so I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that too. Like, yeah, not significantly, but it's not, yeah, but there are changes for sure. People schedule it for. <laughs> well, I always think, well, if you decide that it is not something you're going to continue with now, you have that facility. Yeah. I did have, I'm sorry, I did have one more question too. I forgot to answer, so I jot down notes and then I'm not, they're not organized. But um, the crisis piece, and I know obviously it could come up, but it's not, it's just re remind me, it's not supposed to be for students who are in crisis or it possibly can be for if they get to a place of being in crisis. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so, like that confidentiality piece yeah. too, is where I get like. So again, I never seem to have a straight answer, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> Because a, a student can go into crisis at any right. moment, right? And our staff are trained to deal with that. The academy staff, the academy staff, and we have trained we have trained staff. Sorry, sure. yes. For even you know our students, right? right. Now. And because we even have Lakeside now. Yes, that there's a deal, crisis. Those are crisis counselors. Yeah. So we do have staff that are trained, and the staff will be trained. How do I? How do we intervene when a student is in crisis? Mm -hmm. They absolutely know how to do that, um, and make that referral. So if a student gets to that point and does need to go into a, a partial hospitalization, mm -hmm. then our staff work with that partial placement with parent permission and sharing release of information, mm -hmm. you know, to share what do we have, what's the data, what was the counseling that we were doing with the student, and so that they can support that, mm -hmm. and then we get the information back when mm -hmm. the student's ready to come back to support that transition. Mm -hmm. It's just hard when I see, like, you know, if, if students are depressed, like, they could be possibly suicidal, all those things. And that's where, again, I go back. I'm all for helping these students that have these mental health issues. It's just, is, is this the right place versus, like, fully all hands-on, heavily trained? That's where I just struggle. And I know that some kids just aren't even coming to school. That's my biggest thing. And then there is that piece of, like, enabling and wanting them to be successful. And so... No, but I appreciate your information and the presentation. You're welcome. Okay. So I didn't see on the list of things, do you, so what would you do with, if there's a suicide ideation situation, something like that, is that something that you intend to have people offering counseling here for, or would that be something that you would? So I, I hate to say this, but it happens a couple times a week right now that students are dealing with that issue. So a couple times a week I will get a report of you know a student that has had an incident. They met with the crisis counselor. The crisis counselor had the parent come in, um, encourage the parent to go here for this support. Um, and then that crisis counselor will continue you know to check in, um, encourage the parent to get supports outside of school. Um, and hopefully we're able to get that student to a place where they need to be. <coughs> that would also happen for these students in this program because it's, it could it happen go out. The, with they, these students. If there's a crisis, if there's suicide ideation, they're going to go through the suicide risk assessment that we have in place mm -hmm. and do that evaluation um, because they're trained to do that. Call the parent. They, the parent gets called right away. Um, and then they recommend supports based on what their assessment has shown. And then follow up to make sure that the parent is um, following up with those supports. If it means that they go into a partial hospitalization, sometimes that would happen. Is what happens. Sometimes they come back to the, the school district and we put a safety plan in place for the student. So basically the bottom line is that you wouldn't be trying to tackle. So you know the limit of what right. can be, okay. So I think there's still a lot of thinking happening. Um, right. People want to still think. Um, what is the, from your point of view, the, the Well, that, I mean, all of, all of this is in the budget, right? And so we're in the process of 
right? You know, we do the job descriptions, and so we are we are moving along from a hiring standpoint because we know this is the time of year you want to hire quality people. We obviously haven't brought anybody for recommendation, right? Because we're trying to to go through those conversations. Our, our, it continues to be our recommendation. This is what our students need, right? Yes, we need to monitor it. Yes, we need to right make sure we're communicating what it looks like. Uh, make sure we're communicating to the families how it's going. Once it opens, right? Does it does it operate the way we think it's going to operate? And all of those are really good questions. But there will be a significant. There would have to be a change to the budget if this program were to come back, right? We just need to think about. You know, I think you put that on the slide before. Yeah. That. The slide. Just in terms of we need to renegotiate Lake Slide, Lake Slide, right? We've already cut some of those slots in the budget. So in terms of what to anticipate for next year. Uh, we have to think about are there other services that drive that right. now it's not a one-to-one -one correlation so I'm not sure I'm saying that the budget goes up from that standpoint but we need to then think about what are we going to do for those students we have been moving forward thinking that right like you said the construction project is something in terms of the, the driveway to be able to bring that around the back those types of things we move forward with those expectations so so the annual costs will be about 375 every year is that personnel only yes okay. and, then and then the savings is variable based on how many students we would outplace or not am i understanding that right yeah because some of that then is then the cost savings for keeping students right. from going out right we, the, the easy ones are the very first year where you bring some back right. or the easy ones to quantify it was four it was seven the other <laughs> then what we need to keep track of is in in the pre-2022, what would we have done with David Bolton? And would he have been a Lakeside referral? He didn't need to be because of this program. Mm -hmm. And we'll need to track that data, because that's a cost savings that never shows up in the budget, right, right. you know, in terms of slots. And, and there are other outside programs that we'd have to then look at. Lakeside is the easiest one-to-one -one comparison, but it's not the only one we mm -hmm. utilize. Okay. Any Thank you, Dr. Durk. Thank you. 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 Okay, so I'm here tonight to present the Flexible Instructional Days Program, and it's the, term, the acronym is FID, and so what we're doing is we're applying to the state. It's very similar to the Section 520.1 that we did a couple months ago. That was for this school year. This Flexible Instructional Days Program is for next year, um, and they're a little bit different, and I'll tell you how they're different as we go through. But basically, it is similar that if there are situations where we were, could not be in school for some reason, that this would allow us to provide that instruction uh, that occurs outside of the brick and mortar buildings at home in regards to um, the student device. So next year, there's no 520 we have to vote on? So 520.1 is an emergency provision that was established by the state. So they haven't made a determination yet whether or not 520.1 will be in existence for next year. Um, so that's why they're saying that you can't extend it past the 21-22 20, 20, 20, school year okay. because it may not be in existence. It but must be attached to an emergency declaration. Emergency declaration. No emergency declaration, you can't use 520. Correct, and that's right. the whole reason behind it. And so that was, a, that was put in place in 2020 when COVID came into existence, pandemic, and schools were closed because of like that's a emergency state -wide situations. Emergency declaration you're talking about. So Correct. that was emergency. Yes. Now this is something new that's ongoing. Correct. Or expected so, to be ongoing. Yes. Yeah. So this okay. is part of school code and um, adopted in 2019. Okay. And we did not apply for it the last couple of years because we had 520.1 to be able to use if necessary. Okay. So this enables school entities the opportunity to develop that flexible day instruction program to meet the 180 day requirement so you still have to do 180 days you still have to do the 900 990 hours it doesn't give you that exemption you still have to meet the state requirements in, of what you need to accomplish to consider a full school year the the flexible instructional uh, day program can be online offline or a combination of the two um, so you can have paper pencil assignments that you send home with students 
you know in advance that a blizzard's coming and we're going to be closed for two or three days, this would be a provision that you could use. Could. Let me use that term. Yeah, we were saying, is, is it the end of snow days? Um, so yeah. we're not extending the end of the year, right. So right. these days would count towards that piece. So, I mean, you do get those odd years where you get five, eight snow days in a year, that this could be implemented if you choose to do so, and if we pass it as a district. I'm sorry, Dr. Working. And to answer your question, because it, it's a fair question to ask and maybe ask from a public standpoint, that is not our intention. There are right. school districts that use this with that intention, that these are the first five things we'll do, because we all have robust systems in place now where we can do online learning if we right. needed to. Right, that, that we're really good at pivoting now that, <laughs> that, that we've learned. But that is not the intention of this. This is that same flexibility. If, if you apply for these because you want to be able to say, we have all of our options, and we decide whether this is the option we utilize or not. But if we don't apply for these, it's not an option for us. Right, right. And so then we either you know, cancel or right. extend and do all those things. Use the snow days, yeah. extend the school year. But we still believe in snow days. Is yes, we do. <laughs> Absolutely. At least this superintendent. It's foggy. So. How to go on? That's why we need a new question for the next superintendent. Uh, uh, this one believes in snow days. So the components of the application are that we, you know, the chief school administrator, assurance. There's an assurance component as part of the application that you're going to follow the rules that they've established. The narratives, which was part of the documents that you received within the administrative component. And then the exemplars. They're not looking for exact lessons that are going to be taught. They're looking for the samples of what could be delivered if you util utilize the days. Um, so they would be sample lessons that they know that you're going to follow through and implement those type of lessons that considers the standards, the, the actual lesson itself, the assessments, what would you do if you had to work offline because there's a power outage, all those different pieces that have to be part of the lessons. And then obviously the board meeting minutes and board affirmation statement. And so what that means, the application deadline for the flexible instructional days is the June 1st. So that's why we're doing this in May. So you can have an opportunity to look at it, look at the application, look at the exemplar lessons. We vote on it at the school board meeting um, next week. <laughs> and then it gets submitted to the state and then they give us an answer by August whether or not they accept the application. Which generally, from my understanding and talking to other representatives from other districts, as long as you submit it with your board minutes, you're in pretty good shape. So you can only use up to five days as part of the program. Um, and there you can see that it can be used in place of one of the following reasons. The disease epidemic, hazards, weather conditions, law enforcement emergencies, and so on. So these are all different areas where 520.1 was, again, tied to the emergency declaration for the pandemic. This has a little bit more broad and wide range that you can use them. I was originally thinking a lot of those those uh, days before and after holidays, long breaks. It seemed like were kind of wasted days, but you couldn't implement a a FID day for those because it doesn't fit within the emergency context of that. So the shoulder, hey, the day before a long winter break, right, it tends to be a, a, a kind of a bust of a day, I think, at least to some degree. Um, but you could not implement this. Uh, for that because there's no emergency reason to do it. No, correct. It has to be for a portion of the school, <coughs> school building is unfit or unsafe for you, so you cannot do that. And the other... It would make sense. I mean... Uh, no, I understand what yeah, you're saying. I'm sure that's why they put that in there because I'm sure there were others that were trying to. Yeah. <laughs> well, last year there were districts who scheduled five yeah, they days. Right. Yep. Okay. They On the end of the calendar. days. Yeah. Yeah. But then yeah. Friday is yeah. enough idea. And, and the other there, piece of like this compared to the 520 is the entire district has to be, it has to be utilized yeah. for the entire district mm -hmm. at that time. 520.1, if you had one building where, and I'll use the, the case where there were multiple exposures or, you know, positives, and it was deeming on the attendance rate, you can close that building and use a 520.1. This is not. This is you have to use for the entire district. Okay. So that's why you're using it for emergency situations. Um, sort of like the hurricane day. That would be one of the examples this past year in the beginning of September. Or the, well, was it the hurricane or whatever it was? Oh, that the, no. that inclement weather. <laughs> Um, if the and, idea was to, if the idea was for the kids to not have school, you could do an Act 80 day and make it professional development, and then it wouldn't count against your 180 days either. So you could, worry but about it being a wasted day where they're not learning anything, but you, then you're not 
making it virtual, they're just not, it's, it's become a professional development thing. It, it could, but I mean, we have our Act 80 days as well that we'll submit with our calendar. And we, we're fortunate we haven't needed to use our Act 80 days because we've had enough years, enough days in the year as it is, and hours in, that go along with it. Um, and obviously, you can't make it part of the school calendar, and that's what Mr. Russell, you were talking about, going <coughs> on to the end of a holiday or prior to a holiday. So, um, this is basically the questions that are answered by the district in regards to the program and the application. We have to describe the procedures for notifying students, parents, professional staff, and so on. Describe the procedure for instituting a flexible instructional day. The contingency plan is an alternative method for instruction should we have issues with technology or power. Describe the responsibility of professional staff, the responsibilities of students, and the procedures for tracking student participation. The nice part about it is we kind of learned a lot about this when we were mandated to shut down, and we have a process in, in, in a process that exists already that can be easily carried over to this. So, and that's why the exemplar lessons were part of that application process as well. Jo? What is the contingency plan? So say Bedminster Township is without power, but Hilltown has power. So in that case, we wouldn't be able to use... No, they're saying basically the contingency plan if you didn't have power across the district. Because mm -hmm. so remember, it has yeah. to be the entire district that uses a flexible instructional day. But it could occur that you would have like some people like not everybody would be able to participate by online learning. So what is our contingency plan? That we would have availability of sending something home with students or being able to get an announcement out via by phone through our, what's our system oh, called? Blackboard, Blackboard, yeah. Blackboard Connect. That they, they have information. They have things at home they can work on. They know if they're home and there's no power, they're, they're doing these three assignments to fulfill the requirement. So the timeline, it's due by June 1st. Um, it must be approved by you, the school board, obviously. And then we will find out by August 1st. And then the acceptance, this is another difference between the 520.1. When we applied for it last year and the year before, it was a year to year. This is good for three consecutive years. So then we would have to reapply at that time. If we apply, and so obviously we have to meet all of their guidelines, can we apply? No, we have it, and add our own guidelines to it as to when we'd use it. As to when we use it? Yeah, so like if it, we have a snowstorm, but we're out two days, I would be prone to say, well, and have two snow days, we have them build in later. If it's Hurricane correct. Sandy and we're out for 10 days and half the district doesn't have electric, that would be, I would think, when it would make right. sense. Right, then we can institute it. the five days of flexible instructional. Because you remember, you can only go up to five with this. Right, right. So. But I'm saying as a district, we can say we have these, but we would Correct. only use them. We wouldn't use them unnecessarily. Right. Our guidelines would be stricter than theirs if we, we wanted to decide. Yeah, we Correct. still decide as a, a, a local LEA of how we want to use the days. Our when expectation is that the majority, almost every year we would use zero. Right. right. There would have to be a situation Absolutely. that we all consult and say, this is unusual. This is a, a once right. in a decade, whatever. And then this was just the difference between the two, again, and I pretty much explained this as we went out through the presentation, but that 520 was pretty much the pandemic, it was a time to the emergency declaration, so that will be expiring. Um, that's why, again, you'll see the third bullet down on the left-hand side, solely for the use during the 21-22 school year. Um, and again, there's no specific days for it, but it was more to, um, a, adjust to any situations where it would deal with the pandemic itself. Um, it must, again, must meet required days and um, hours and days for the program. And then for the flexible inst instructional days, again, I, I had that one earlier, bullet two, where the different scenarios that you can use it for, um, the five days, again, district-wide, and then can be used for that in-person instruction as well, in place of in-person instruction as well as offline. And then again, you must meet those meet the required hours and days. So that's pretty much it. There's not a lot to it. Uh, really, it was about getting all the exemplars together so they can see that you would have lessons in place and know how to prepare. Cool. So is this something everyone would be agreement with that we can move forward and 
Again, last resort yes. use. Not. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if we wouldn't, if, if we wouldn't apply for this, then we just wouldn't have that opportunity in a case of emergency to be able to use those days. That's it. Okay. I know. Let's say, like, like Dr. Bolton, I know you said that you would still believe in snow days, but let's just hypothetically say, for some reason, you would not be hearing somebody else, and they would be like, oh, "I believe in the fit days." Then is that what, what Ricky was saying? <laughs> 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 if, if Ricky was saying like well, for stricter guidelines, like how can you put that on? Like, I, I, I know so it's never gonna happen. But it's like I know, I agree. I'm just saying, like, let's just. I'm, I'm days. Days. I don't know. Like I'm just thinking, yeah, like out loud. Can you put something on that? Like we've decided that we're we're gonna apply this and then after it's. I mean, I think that a board is always the ultimate. Old. Like if a board says we not. And I'm just, you know, I think, you know, <laughs> right. I, I, really like, not just be situational at, at, at 4 a.m. Yeah. Right. At, at 4 a.m. on a snow day, I'm right. not calling the board members to say what you think. Right. I mean, that's right. not a board decision. Right. But if we were but staring at a storm where the predictions are, yeah. we're going to be under ice for seven days. Right. right. You know, you go back to 93 or whatever that huge ice storm right. was. Right. That's when we start having conversations about right. what makes sense. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Do it. Right. I guess I'm just saying, like, we have that understanding now, which is great, but something would ever change in that yeah, since it's three years. Like, right. I don't know. I'm just throwing that there. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Understood. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Barter. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next is the Sanitation Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Over here. Oh, Mr. Danny, you can one. He is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you appreciate it. Oh, wait, I have it. Oh, you got the clicker. You warned us. You're not going to Well, I was very fortunate to be able to lead the uh, Enbridge School District com Comprehensive Plan. Well, actually, the steering committee for the plan this year. They were so great would, meetings. Pardon me? They were great meetings. Well, I was at all of them. Thank you. Just going to say. Appreciate that. We, we really felt like we accomplished a lot, so I appreciate that. <laughs> so for everyone's information, the state of Pennsylvania PDE, uh, Department of Education, they mandate a comprehensive plan in each LEA, in each school district. And so what that is, is to set the direction of a district and how we went about that is we assessed our needs, and I'll go through that with you, to create a plan, to implement a plan, to monitor a plan, to adjust a plan. So this really is a cycle of improvement. It's meant to be. So the community vision, this is what we talked about with um, our steering committee, and I'll, I'll go through that in a second. And we said if we develop a comprehensive plan that engages our community, draws upon our rich history, that acknowledges the realities of our present, then we will design a future that draws upon our community's vision of success to ensure all members of the community achieve, are seen, valued, and fulfilled. We solicited members of the community to be part of the steering community, uh, committee. And the steering committee is really designed to be a feedback system for the goals of the district. We invited 55 people, 40 people were able to attend. We certainly understood that uh, people's schedules were really busy. We had community members, parents, school board members, administrators, teachers, instructional coaches, the Bucks County Intermediate Unit reps, Bucks County Community College representative, Upper Bucks County Technical School representative, and local business owners. And at this point, I really, we all would, we'd like to thank them again for their time and their commitment to the district and to the process. Dr. Sean, can I just ask a, a preliminary question? I feel like sure. I missed something on this, but do we already have a plan? We have been working on the plan. That are we, is are we, we have so we don't, we never had a plan before? We had a plan and it expires this okay. year. So we are- And we're charged with, with implementing a new plan every how many years? Three years. Every three years we have to yeah. come up with a new plan. So we created one that will expire at the end of this year. So by August of this year, we have we have to have a new plan. Okay, and and that's by virtue of the state requirements. Yes. So then we submit Department it to the state, that. and they have to approve it, or or they just want us to have a plan. Oh no, they approve. They have to approve okay. it. Okay. Nope. All right. 
They go through it. I'll show you that. So I'll give you the timeline. So you're currently checking all the boxes. <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's not as simple as just coming up with all your ideas. Then you have to actually put yeah. it into the system, and that's what takes a long time. So. It takes a long time. But I'll go through that with you, but that's a great question. So we met four times. The steering committee uh, met in September, October, November, and then in March. And... Uh, Yes, before I move on, I do want to thank our Bucks County Intermediate Unit Partners. Uh, Rachel Holler, she is the Assistant Executive Director, and Chad Evans, who was really very supportive and they came to our meetings and they helped us with the process. And Chad is still helping just in terms of trying to be able to navigate the system that all this information goes into. Uh, into. So these are the dates. Uh, Penn Ridge Future Ready Comprehensive Plan must be on public display for at least 28 days prior to board approval in June. Right, so we're having this first meeting, first time we make this public. And then uh, we're going to submit it by August 30th, hopefully long before August 30th, but that is the last day that we can submit a plan. So what I'm going to do is go over the goals that we have come up with, and then I will give you some feedback from the steering committee to help you see the process that we had. Even though we were coming with ideas because, and, and I think the question was asked, we have a comprehensive plan. How did we do relative to the, com the comprehensive plan that we had? Does anybody like grade us against that? Yeah. Or? That's exactly, thank you. Oh. That's exactly what I was going to talk about. <laughs> right? so, I know. This Those is, attorneys. This is <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. So we look at our current plan, right? And we have goals. And we, we, we didn't fully achieve all the goals, and some of them will continue. And, for example, goal number one, enhanced teaching, learning, and innovation isn't a goal that we anticipate leads, because that is what we're going to continually do. How we do it will change. So we embarked on the five-year curriculum renewal for secondary schools, of which we are nearly there, so we will achieve that goal. But now we are moving that to the elementary schools, and Dr. Obarczyk will be leading that work. We did begin the publish, well, I don't know the final number, but there'll be more than one, and there'll probably be at least six or seven. So that is just something that we're continuing to do. Ensuring the growth of all students isn't going away. We're just doing things. We add to that, or uh, we change things, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Updating the elementary progress report is new. That is something that we didn't do, but that is something that we're adding, and Dr. Obarczyk can talk a little bit more about that. And expanding targeted full-day kindergarten. That is not part of the current plan. That is something that we added to this plan. And then C is ensuring the growth of all students. We had this as our growth measure in our current plan, measuring the growth of grade three ELA scores using PSSAs, I think everyone's familiar with, and Dibbles, and FMPs, and Words Their Way inventory. They're all word studies they're talking about. And we had some unfortunate circumstances, so we don't have really good data over the past several years for that goal to have been met. So that goal has to continue. And measuring the growth, oh, here's, this is something that is new to this plan, measuring the growth of students who've been identified as English language learners. That is when we analyzed our data, that is a subgroup who is not making progress as other groups are. So we added that in and we took that directly from Penridge data. We're monitoring students with IEPs to ensure that they receive supports least restrictive environment, and that's what we, I think Dr. Durr has been talking about for a while, least restrictive environment is, is the place where students are educated, and it may be different for different students. And we continue to work on that with professional development for our general education teachers to be able to meet the needs of learners in their classroom with additional support sometimes. Goal two, promote the effective and efficient uses of technology. That was That is part of the current plan, but there are things that have been added. 
So improving and maintaining access and reliability of the network and infrastructure, Mrs. Miller has been working on that and that continually is improved upon. Using appropriate technology to support focus of digital age learning, we have a Penner School District has made leaps and bounds in that area in terms of instructional practices over the last five years, if not six. Human Resources Department will implement, actually I think they just started this, implement, we've already met one of our goals, implement electronic system for hiring and onboarding. Everything is paper, pencil, but they just established that. Um, goal number three is support the well-being of students and staff. We have, as we just um, heard from Dr. Durr, developed the Penridge Academy for Student Wellness and the Penridge Community Partnerships with Grandview Health and St. Luke's Penn Foundation Partnerships. So they are the main goals. We had feedback from our steering committee. So they are the main goals. I will go through the communication plan because we spent a lot of time from the entire group on what should the communication plan look like. And that wasn't something that we spent as much time on this uh, last plan. So, uh, today, it's May 2nd, so we're having this meeting here. We'll post this to the district website for 30 days. We'll post to the district and all the school websites so the community can see it. Communication ongoing at district and school level meetings, administration and faculty meetings so that everyone knows, everyone can see it. We make it a part of our professional learning calendar anyway. That is something that the teachers see regularly. A review of parent-teacher organizations. I know Dr. Bolton does it with his advisory group. Review at uh, periodic updates at this meeting. So that's how we intend to communicate the plan so that everyone knows the goals that we're working on and the progress we're making toward them. So when we meet that goal, we should be celebrating that. This is what we've done. If we established the uh, academy, all right, well, we said we were establishing that academy. What were the results of that? And the last thing that I wanted to share with you, which isn't up there, but I did want to give you some feedback from the steering committee on the goals. So in terms of when we asked each group to talk about the goals we established and, and what, it was kind of a hot, cold thing, like what they really liked about it, what were some of the things that they didn't necessarily think um, or that we could approve upon. And then there were some ideas. So what we did was we took all the goals back, we read all of that, and then we met with the steering committee again and said, yes, we read all of that, and here are some of the things that we're going to add. So for example, on the first goal of the five-year curriculum renewal, the feedback was, and this is what we're going to do based on it, is ensure vertical alignment of K-5 curriculum for mathematics, science, social studies, and RELA, reading, English, language, arts. They asked us to unpack standards prior to the development of the curriculum units, and that is what Dr. Rabarczyk and his teams will be working on. That was already done at the secondary level. Provide section, a section on enrichment strategies in public view of the curriculum map in Atlas. So they were asking us, we want to be able to see in Atlas the enrichment activities that you're going to be adding to the curriculum units. So that's some of the feedback that we received that we added to the goals. And I'll just give you a few more examples. Oh, in terms of what uh, the feedback was on the college and career pathways, uh, a lot of feedback really was about clear communication because they don't think everyone knows about the pathways. So they want a clear communication uh, plan for the community and expand opportunities for dual enrollment, which we've been talking about, with Bucks County Community College, Gwinnett Mercy, and a little secret that I'll let out tonight, um, we will be in partnership, with your permission of course, with the University of Pittsburgh next year. Oh, wow. um, I went to a conference and they just <laughs> same fantastic. It is only, at this point, $75 a credit. At Ooh. University of Penn. Wow. I mean, what they do there wow. is amazing. So we are so we got in. I mean, I didn't find out about it until March, and it was too late because we had to send our teachers to get trained. But we've been talking about it, and I thought 
Oh, throw the little seed out yeah. there that we can talk about adding wow. Pitt to it. And uh, University of Pitt is the fourth, number four, on the list of schools that our students mostly apply to. Mm -hmm. So really benefits the extension. So we're excited about that. Um, for measuring the growth of grade three ELA, ensuring multiple sources of data are utilized for measuring growth. People really talk a lot about that. Continued use of data and child study teams, which are rich, and we have data teams. And really, I think this is the year where we have gotten to the point where they have been fully established. Parent guardian training to ensure understanding and establish partnerships as part of the process. So that there was a lot of conversation of do parents really understand what this data means? How do we help parents understand that when we're sitting with them, either at conferences or, uh, or um, parent-teacher conferences or principals? And I don't know if you, we keep on going on, but I was curious what the um, I mean, I was at when we talked about did the hot and cold thing for the Wellness yep. Academy, but overall, could you share what the steering committee had said? Sure. All right, I'll find these words. There's a lot to be said on full day K, too. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. This is what was said about the Wellness Academy. Feedback on. Development of the profile of the student with criteria about how students are referred to the program and how they transition back to the high school. Sure. Clearly define the transition process for returning to the high school and the supports to be provided to the student. Develop criteria for measurement of success of the program. So some of the things that we were talking about tonight. So, so what's shared with the community are those three goals? That three goals are so, the equivalent of the plan? What will happen is the, we hope even by the end of this week, if not <laughs> the very what beginning of next right. week, this, the, the, the PD site will be populated and Dr. Scheid will finish what has to actually be submitted to the state. What we will then do is we will send a, an email out to the entire community that includes a link to that, although that is a pretty dense document as well as to this presentation, because this gives a little better encapsulation in, in 12 slides of what we're talking about, and encourage them to if they have any questions to then send them to the next stage. That is the public posting for 30 days. Uh, we then will put the comprehensive plan on the June board for your approval and consideration. And, and do we use members. this comprehensive yeah. plan? Like, this is the first time hearing of it, it again. But I, have we guided our decisions based upon the comprehensive plan. Is it like, I know some corporations you develop a mission statement and you put it on the shelf never to re revisit it until five years to you look at the mission statement again. Is this something that's a living document that we guide all our decisions based upon for the next three years? Or is it just kind of an overarching direction that we're headed and we, we kind of fill in the details? Or do we constantly, as a board, if we pass this, are we constantly measuring all our decisions against this plan? Right, it won't be all decisions, but if you were to print out the, the goals from the, the current comprehensive plan that, that started three years ago, and print out the three years of annual goals that we approve every year, you will see a direct correlation between what are we working on this year that goes back to here. Now, there will be goals within those three years that are not captured in the comprehensive plan, right? So there will be other things that we do, either because priorities came up or they're, they're just beyond what this is. But yes, we now will develop annual one-year goals to talk about, of these things, what are we going to go after for the 2023 school year? What does that look like in the 23 24 school year? With, with objective so, means to measure that as opposed correct, to, because exactly. this is kind of subjective. You know, educate, it's a, it's a kind of a subjective standard, and how do we measure that in real objective terms? Yes. You know? Yeah. Yes. But I think it's important to understand too that the goals, the goals and objectives that were all in here were decided by the administration, and then the steering committee um, breaks into groups and talks about them. But it wasn't the steering committee who developed the goals and objectives. So it's not like the, the steering committee sat there and said, "We want kindergarten and we want the wellness center," you know. Those things were determined by the administration and the committee talked about those things. So it wasn't like the steering committee came up with them. So I think that's important to understand too. 
Yeah. I just had one, sorry. Um, did, was there any, and I know it's hard to like, it's just hard to measure this, but was there any communication on, um, like, I, I still believe, you know, like learning is hard to take place until behavior is like under control. It's never going to be perfect. Totally get that. But was there any communication of having a behavior piece goal with, you know, holding teachers more accountable with confronting behaviors as well as just student behavior? as more of like a consistency to try to encourage more class. I'm just, I'm not, I have the words. Was any like behavior things brought up at all? Not behavior per se. Are we talking about like student discipline? Right, like just like, you know, like like our, our values, like principal prepared. And sometimes I feel like we don't have some of those like, and, and in, in my own personal experience, each year gets a little bit harder and harder to kind of rein, <laughs> rein in the classroom management piece. So I just didn't know if, if that maybe came up this year versus three years ago and since COVID and just all those things. I didn't know if that was... You know, not discipline per se, mental health issues. Wellness right. came up a lot. Right. It's really, um, I think that is the number one issue that we deal with. I attend child study meetings mm -hmm. every week. Yeah. It's really mental health, mm -hmm. not so much. We don't have a lot of like big discipline. Right, and, and I'm not talking even like big, just like consistently see things like clear expectations, like oh, just, just I didn't know if anything that way came up. It didn't. Okay. Uh, typically those things are established at a school. Right, right? like and building. The building principals are leading right. that, and maybe in one building or one grade level there's- Sure differences in what's going on in behavior and they may establish that and in particular two middle schools are doing school-wide positive behavior support so they are using a system of supports like they had a grass right mm -hmm. um, and that's how they are using that okay. but we don't mandate mandate that program across all schools okay. Okay. thank you Dr. Next item uh, is a request for coordinators. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're back. Right, okay. We're back. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Robarczyk and I are here uh, as a, press, a request for additional coordinators, so we'll talk to you about what we currently have. So we have four curriculum supervisors, and you see them at these meetings, and Eric is right here, and Sarah and Howard. And we have coordinators, and they are teachers. So currently, we have a K-12 art coordinator, and music is also K-12, and libraries K-12. Health and PE is K-12. But as you can see, um, with family and consumer science, is 6 to 12 because that's well, where it's also, right? And world language, the same thing. And then STEM, we currently have a 6 to 12 coordinator, but the history of this district is we didn't have STEM at the elementary level. We didn't even have STEM at the middle level. And now we did. And when we added STEM at the middle level, that coordinator position got changed to 6 to 12 because that's the programs that we have. Tonight, Dr. Uh, Robarczyk's going to uh, talk about the need for a coordinator at grades one through five. I am going to talk about the need, or we both will, K to 12 English language development, RLs. Uh, I was talking to you about that in the comprehensive plan. That is one population that we really need to target to improve upon. And we don't have a coordinator. We do the best we can, we have teachers who help out, but there is no coordinator. And as, we, as those numbers grow of students who we need to service, we need a coordinator to coordinate it. And I will go over with you exactly what they have to do, but one of the things that has to happen is consistent professional development. So this is what we're looking for in the coordinator position, ensuring district, district compliance with applicable federal and state law and policies related to ELS, and there's a lot of them. It's highly regulated. We're Acting as the district point of contact for the state. For what, what, what is that? ELS? English language learner. So English second as a language. second language. It used to be ESL, okay. English as a second language, and okay. now they changed it to ELL. Okay. 
Okay. So English is not their first language. Got it. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, acting at the district point of contact for the state for matters related to ELs, disseminating information from the state to educators, administrators in the district, ensuring the proper identification of ELs and accurate reporting in our PIM system, ensuring the proper instructional placement. There's testing that goes on along with this and you have to see where students, what kind of service they need. Developing and maintaining the language instruction educational program. So if you're familiar with an IEP, this is an LIEP. Coordinating the annual language proficiency testing. It's the access test. Coordinating district title three activities. Coordinating professional development, that it, which is a need. Um, analyzing data in regards to the L's in the district and developing the plans ensuring a process for reclassifying students. And really that's just the level of service they need. And ensuring that parents are provided with information as required by federal and state regulations. It's a highly regulated system. And since it has grown, my, I, I don't know what the actual numbers are at the moment, the total numbers, but it grows every single year. And so we have a coordinator for every other department. And this department doesn't have a coordinator. And in order for all of these things to get done consistently, and we can make sure that they are being completed, and then ensuring the professional development K to 12, we are requesting a coordinator for that job. How many students do we have that are yeah. don't speak? Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to have well, 44. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, K5. Yeah. We'll, we'll get you the number. But that would be There's different 40. in terms of the involved in direct instruction, which are years one and two primarily, mm -hmm. and then the consult students who are years three through however long in the system. So we'll have to get you. And, and why are, did we it change? Do we have students now that just English isn't their second language? They just don't speak English? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're. They'll come here from different countries. And they don't speak English. You and we have um, Guth. We have the program mainly at Guth, and then from Guth to North, and then North to the high school. And uh, yeah, they don't speak English. And so do we have people who is primarily Spanish, but I imagine other languages. We have somebody. Oh yeah, they don't speak the language necessarily. And it isn't really, it's more of an immersion program where they're listening to English, right? And there's a lot of visuals to help kids who um, can't speak English. And you're showing them pictures. But they don't speak the, their language necessarily. We don't have any teacher who can speak all the languages that, that students right, right. will come not, no, to no. us. We do, fortunately, at North, our assistant, our teaching assistant in that program speaks Spanish. So... That's helpful because some of the students who are coming here right away, they don't speak any English, they're very reticent, and they don't want to do any speaking. Mm -hmm. And having somebody who does speak Spanish is helpful because at least they can communicate and we can find out what some of the problems are, things like that. But really the idea about the English as a second language or PLL is immersion, is to listen to the language, learn the language that way. Is there a reason why art can be done K to 12 with one person and music can and library can and health and phys ed can? The only ones that are that are broken down into secondary or, you know, without primary are the ones that just don't exist at the primary level. So doesn't it seem um, inconsistent to have two for STEM? Yeah, and we'll talk about that when we move on to STEM, yeah. right? Because Dr. Barczyk was going to present on that. Do we have any other questions on the ELL piece of that? Because that's a K-12 it, program. It seemed to me, it, it, I have two questions. The one I'll, I'll come back to later. But as the ELL one, it's not a, truly a department, though. Whereas the other ones, is it more a department? Whereas that's more of a service being provided. Do we have any other coordinators for services being provided? You know what I mean? Like the other ones seem to be truly departments. Whereas this is more of a, an adjunct come along, you know, support component. Do we have a do we have a, a coordinator for you know um, some special other special needs like autistic support right coordinator do we have, right or, exactly right exactly. Yeah. well there's a supervisor for autistic support like in special ed 
there are supervisors for those programs. So why wouldn't there be a supervisor? What's the difference between a supervisor and a coordinator? So, so think about math, so right? Math has what a supervisor. It doesn't have a coordinator. Coordinators are teacher leaders, as opposed to supervisors who are administrators. So do we have a separate supervisor for autistic support that's not just the elementary special ed supervisor? No, I'm just saying there's a supervisor who supervises autistic support. There is right. a supervisor who's super assigned to autistic support. Say? No, there is, a, there is a supervisor assigned to autistic support K-12. Right now, they also have other responsibilities, so they don't just. So, do so why would support, we so. why wouldn't we follow that model and have a supervisor for the ELL as opposed to a coordinator for the ELL? So uh, the numbers wouldn't warrant a, a supervisor. The supervisors, so the supervisors are, are above already, the coordinator. They're administrators, so they they are in charge of the curriculum, K to twelve. What what happens in departments, and that's why I'm referring to them as as a department, because a department coordinator holds the department meetings, right? They hold the meetings. They hold the monthly meetings. They're the ones who work with their, okay, so music department, work with the music department about the professional development that they may need. They work with me. They work with Tony. We share these responsibilities, right? So they are the ones who are meeting with those teachers. We have ELL teachers. And we just hired another teacher. We hired one at, at the high school. So that, they need somebody to be leading those department meetings as well, to be looking at this testing. To but it's not really a department it. though, right? Well, it's not a department in terms of curriculum. So it's not a curriculum department. So would this be like a new hire or one of our teachers would no, just be a supervisor? Okay. It would just be a responsibility of a, of a uh, teacher who does it. Coordinator. Coordinator. Which is in the contract. This is spoken to in the contract in terms of those EDRs, those extra duty responsibilities. Okay. So are all and our coordinators, coordinators <laughs> are all teachers? All teachers. All, all the coordinators teachers are teachers. Full time okay. teaching. So it's like a department head sort of thing. It yes. is. Right. So you're just, as opposed yes. to having, you know, teaching four classes, you're only teaching three classes because you're the department head. Exactly. And, and we call it department heads when it's on within the building. Right. So like if there's a lead, if there's a lead social studies teacher that's just at the high school, that would be a department head. Coordinators have more than one building responsibility. But they're all teaching as well. So it's Correct. just an EDR. Correct. Correct. It is okay. an EDR. It is, for, for a K-12, you'll see in one of the slides, for a K-12, it's currently $2,500. Okay. Okay. And then it's proportional if it's fewer than all 13 grades. How many ELL teachers do we have? There are four at the secondary level. So six. 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 Um, it's not really related to the job, so I'll just so curious. So it'd be one so of those six would be come would be, Yes. Yeah. 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 And just, just to expand on a little bit, Title Three. Title Three is the, our federal programs money that we receive in regards to supporting our, our EL program. So that really pays for any type of program supplies. Um, it pays for the, a lot of what happens at the summer, at the summer camp, the Yale summer camp, where we have generally anywhere from 50 to 75 students attend that annually. So it'll pay for salaries, it'll pay for the field trips they attend, it'll pay for other program materials that they utilize during the summer. So that coordinator <coughs> also helps to facilitate that summer camp program as well. They help establish the goals in Title III. They, um, this year in particular, we received um, immigrant money as well, as part of our Title III, which is specializing in those individuals who have come directly from another country into the United States, have no speaking back, English speaking background whatsoever, and can provide um, that, you, you <coughs> that money to help them to kind of, you know, blend in better with the surroundings and understand like what it means to get a bank account open or go to the store to purchase a grocery list every week. So they help in that essence of helping um, our EL population be more successful. And it helps them they capture their academics so they, they're not set back in regards to where their peers would be. So I know it, it will change because you never know. Like a student can come here from another country when he's 15, but are there students that you've tracked from elementary to middle to high school? Like, what's the success rate? I'm just curious, how do they? I don't know the exact number of years it takes, but most of our students eventually leave this program. Right, and a lot of them. 
Most, right. I think you've had well, the vast majority, more than 90% of them, they, even if they come in not speaking any English, are actually in the program within four years. Within four years, correct. It almost is, it almost is always two years of direct instruction. Because the teachers are really, they are teaching. They're not just supporting in the classroom, although they do right. that as well. And then generally students after two years transition to their home school. And so they'll get monitored at their home school. So they might be at Central, they might come out, or an elementary school. And generally the, the numbers I've seen, over 90% of them at the end of four years aren't even getting consult services, which means they have gotten to the point where they can keep up. And just like um, state testing, they take a test every year called the RITA to determine whether or not they are phasing out of the program. It puts them on a level, and, it tell, and that helps to identify what level of service they need as they continue to move forward and making them successful to eventually exit the program. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And then we switch slide. Um, so the STEM, the great one to five STEM coordinator, and the reason you're seeing is a one to five, first of all, is kindergarten does not receive STEM at the elementary level. And the reason you're seeing it broken out one to five and then a K to 12 is because the programs just differ so much in regards to what's offered at the middle school and high school as compared to the elementary schools. If you recall, our STEM program at the elementary school was just implemented just about three years ago. Um, so they are still working to perfect their curriculum and establish their um, instruction within the classroom. So I actually had the assistance of Eric a little bit here as we sat down and just talked about what are those things that they really need that guidance for that the other content areas such as phys ed and art and music and what they have. So that curriculum writing definitely as they continue to establish and refine their curriculum to make sure that they're giving experiences to the students that are going to help to progress them and, and that critical thinking skills as they move up the grade levels from one to five and then eventually into the middle school level. Um, acting as the point of contact to the elementary STEM teachers. Um, there, there's a lot of ongoings within the elementary STEM in regards to resources, supplies, um, experience, outside district experiences as, as well. So they need a person that can just keep them connected to the outsides of what's going on in regards to the world of STEM. So coordinate the ordering and inventory of elementary STEM materials, which is um, pretty extensive um, year to year. You know, they, they, at the elementary level, it's a very hands-on program. The kids go into the classroom once a week as part of their cycle. And they're using a lot of hands-on to, to, to build and to code. And so this person would be helped to um, organize the group of seven in, or seven individuals to help order and inventory their materials. Lead in seeking out professional learning opportunities. Of course, STEM is a forever growing um, area, so we're always looking to see how we can offer our teachers an extensive um, training in their field of elementary STEM and how they can expand what they're doing within the classroom and with the curriculum. Ensuring on common experiences for all students across the seven elementary buildings. We're working towards that. Some of them have a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. That goes back into the inventory of supplies and materials. Um, so we're trying to get them so it's fidelity across the district. Um, establishing extended learning opportunities for students. So there are a number of competitions and contests, field trips and so on uh, around the area and even to the point of the IU who holds um, a STEM competition at the elementary, middle and high school levels each year. So this person would help coordinate those opportunities for them to get more involved. And then assist with coordinating responsibilities to ensure their own professional responsibilities are met within the, the area. Can you go back one slide? Ms. Baines comments, was that enough information in terms of why the separation in our minds? Because it is the only department that we separate elementary and secondary. But when we looked at the elementary STEM, really STEM gifted experience, in terms of what sorry. these teachers are doing, and you think about what six through 12 teachers are doing, more than woodworking, metalworking, equipment, you know, as opposed to robotics and STEM instruction, we saw them as very different and thought it would be um, very difficult for one person to do both of those well as well. So our recommendation is that we keep the six through 12 at the secondary level um, and add a one through five. 
So what is where does what does woodworking at the high school fall under STEM? Yes. Yeah. So so currently, what supervisor is overseeing the STEM teachers at the secondary level, and what supervisor is overseeing the teachers at the elementary level? Are you talking about supervisors, or are you talking about the or are you supervisors? About no, su supervisors. Who's so supervising this? Their direct supervisor would be their building principal. So they don't have. A Their curriculum writing would happen under the, the guidance of the assistant superintendents, and so there are pieces of their jobs that would fall under the assistant superintendents. But they don't have, there's not a supervisor for STEM, or a supervisor for art, or a supervisor for music. There are only coordinators, K through 12, that handle. Okay. Is that the same for ELL, too? Yes, yeah, there's not a supervisor for ELL. So their supervisor is whichever building they're in. Correct. Right. Yeah, their direct, yeah, their direct supervisor, their principal, as well as then the assistant superintendents, obviously. So at the elementary level for the one to five STEM coordinator, it would be the eight through twelve. That's seventy five percent of the twenty five hundred dollars, which I think we got to eighteen seventy five as a an EDR for them to. Um, support the teachers throughout the year. That is taken out of this contract. This is contractual in terms of these payments, in terms of that. And so the elementary never, like there never was a one through five or a K through five. And so it obviously would be the same number of years as eight through 12. So it would fall in that category. Okay. So the ELL would be a $2,500 investment and the STEM would be a seventeen fifty. So we're talking just over forty two hundred dollars total for the two positions that we're talking about. That's annually. And sorry, just to clarify, most of the coordinators they don't get an extra period off. They Correct. typically work all their periods and it's just extra on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The only time that that's happened, there has been, so like for this year, um, if, if there's like, let's say there's a new staff member in elementary PE, right, and our coordinator is a high school teacher, right, for, for someone to be able to go down and visit with the elementary teacher. Mm -hmm. And so if, if there's that possibility for that person to be able to go to the elementary school right. and be able to mentor mm -hmm. the, the new person, those types of things, we try to make that happen from a scheduling standpoint. Right. But, Now, this is contractual, which means if we are going to do this, this would require an MOU. And so what I've asked Ms. McHale to do is we're just going to wait 24 or 48 hours to see what churns in terms of you have other questions to ask. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask Ms. McHale to send out, we have to have Mr. Miller draft an MOU or, or approve an MOU that Ms. McHale drafted, um, that we would have to consider and we have to formally approve. Uh, this was a conversation initially with the union, so I do know that the union is in support of these because they have to also approve any MOUs to go to the contract because this is a contractual piece in terms of these positions. Okay. So if you have additional questions, just... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that's bringing us to the end. Uh, before we go to public comment, I wanted to go back. It didn't really fit with the discussion earlier, but to the question about identity and how we kind of focus so much on identity, do we make it clear to students that if you feel good about your identity and you're comfortable, like you don't always have to be Absolutely. reconsidering who you are at all times. Yeah. Reconsider. Because I, <laughs> I do agree that it can be anxiety producing. Yeah. If, you know, right. what if you're fine? What if you are? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I think that's what we want. That's the goal. Everybody feel fine with who you are. It's really an exploration and high school. Right. Like, it's okay to be like confused sometimes. It's not like you have to have it. I know. Of course. And I, they just, they, to me, it just feels now more than ever, too, if like, kids sometimes question things. And I'm like, are we, uh, you know, per putting that one that is, you know, not just the schools, just in general. So it sometimes makes you question. I think okay. it's a celebration of who they are, whatever that is, not an analysis of who oh, okay. they are. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, point in time, if that helps, no matter that what does, does enough, because, it's yeah, who I don't want them to always have to be who they are. Okay. So, our next curriculum committee meeting is scheduled for June 6th. 
That brings us to public comment. So we did have a few people signed up, a couple of people signed up for public comment for curriculum. According to policy 903, public comment, which is limited to three minutes, should be directed to the presiding officer rather than individual board members, district employees, or members of the public. For confidentiality and privacy rights, specific comments regarding particular individuals must be communicated privately to the school board and superintendent by email at psdschoolboard.penridge.org. And so I had um, Ed Lawson signed up. I think you may have um, left. And so next is David Bedillion. Just state your name and municipality. David Bedillion, Percy Borough. I um, just wanted to touch base on um, some emails I had sent to the board regarding questions I had about the CHOP gender identity training that was planned for last year. Um, I had sent some specific emails, I won't get into questions about emails that I had obtained by RTK about kind of the process by which that training came to be planned. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, you know, we're talking a lot about the, you know, mental health issues with students, and obviously it's a well-known kind of crisis that students are experiencing. It's been happening over years and years. And, years. Um, and so, you know, as a parent, as a, you know, as a resident of the community, I'm concerned about, you know, bringing in CHOP and bringing in this type of training, particularly as like a mandatory training. I, I understand, um, regardless of one's viewpoint on the issue of transgender among children that, you know, there are children that identify that way in the district, and so the district wants to make sure that teachers, particularly guidance counselors, have some training in that, and I understand that. Um, but, you know, I think parents have been very abundantly clear uh, recently in the concerns about discussions of gender identity and sexuality with children, right? We talk about, you know, from a book standpoint as well. Um, you know, I, I looked through the training. Um, CHOP has this information actually on their website. There's a YouTube video that kind of goes through it. Um, and I want to caution the district in into how much of this you're going to wade into. Uh, parents have been very clear that this is an area that, um, you know, should be for the most part pretty off limits uh, when it comes to instruction. And so I have a question as to why would that be a mandatory training for all teachers in the district, right? Are teachers expected to take this information and apply it, and how, and what kind of conversations are they going to have? Um, I would also state that um, CHOP and some other organizations are pushing ideas that are not well established and accepted by everybody. The idea that you can simply choose to be a girl or a boy or not, and particularly, um, I would say, uh, blanking on the word right now, but it's it's tends to go against family family values and family concerns, and it's very much, you know, schools sometimes getting in positions of having conversations with kids and parents not knowing, and it's, it's happened. There's been many reports of it. There's been many reports of teachers wanting to have those conversations. So I just want to bring up the concern that I think the district needs to be careful, and if you are going to be doing some training, um, are you looking at making sure that it's a balanced perspective? Because this is one perspective um, of how you want to introduce this type of a topic. So um, I just want to bring that concern. I've shared some specific concerns with the with the board with my email. But you know, thank you so much. I think, yeah, okay. it's just a problem. Thank you. Okay. We're going to take a break. Yes. Mr. Cullen, would you uh, turn off the lights and let us know when it's down, please? Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. On this basis, we're ready for you. All right, then we'll call the policy committee meeting to order. And first up is public comment. I won't read it again, so, and uh, Mr. Bedelian, you know the rules, so. You're up. How are you doing, Percy Borough? Um, I just want to touch on, I guess, what looks like policy 109. Um, uh, just some questions and comments. So one, I guess, wasn't quite clear to me, I guess, what some of the changes were in terms of guidelines. I, I see that there's this regulations, uh, administrative regulations, so I don't know if that's part of the new guidelines, regulations that are gonna be used in terms of how books are accepted and not. Um, so I just wanna uh, understand, I guess, exactly how that's gonna address some of the issues that I've seen. So the guy, for instance, sent an email suggesting some more books that add to diversity, not only of authors of color, but also diversity of thought, right? So topics of, race and racism and race relations. When I looked at the high school's library, I saw all the stuff that pretty much if you Googled any, you know, anywhere in terms of wanting to discuss race, books, right? you get White Fragility, you get Unix Kennedy's book, um, those, um, I'm blanking on some of the other ones, but you would get those books, right? The New Jim Crow. And I have those books, I've read them, but you generally won't get when you Google, you won't hear Thomas Sowell for the most part, you won't hear John McWhorter, um, you know, you won't hear Shelby Steele, um, and so when I look at the library, it's the exact same thing. I see Max Kennedy, I see White Fragility, I see the new cast system, I forget what the one book is called, the new Jim Crow. No Thomas Sowell, no Shelby Steele. Shelby Steele had a book, The Content of Her Character, it's been around since the 80s, so these aren't like new books that have just come out, you know. Um, so when I'm looking at them and saying, okay, so what are the guidelines that are allowing that to happen? Or for instance, I see six books of Ruth, J Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, uh, 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 the justice, but I see zero on Clarence Thomas. So to me, there is an obvious bias, whether or not it's intentional or not, but it's very obvious to see that in certain respect. Um, you know, I have the book, uh, The Trans, um, ir uh, uh, sorry, um, Irreversible Damage. If you haven't read this book, and you know, any school that is looking at issues of LGBTQ and even haven't heard of this book, which is a common, um, it's a really important book to understand. You know, it's called The Transgender Crazy Seducing Our Daughters. And it's important, at least part of the conversation, right? Again, not in the library, but you'll see other books relating to discussion on LGBTQ. So there's clearly some <coughs> bias that's impacting books that are coming in. And from where I look, when I look on the ALA website, um, you know, there's a very clear bias in terms of their political leanings. Um, they just, their new president-elect is a self-proclaimed Marxist. Um, you know, she put that out in her you know, Twitter post saying, I, you know, been, I'm elected. So there's clearly a bias. So what I'm looking is to understand what the school is doing. Clearly, we need to have diversity of viewpoints. We need to make sure that it's not tilted one way. We want our kids to be exposed to multiple perspectives. So. I just didn't quite see exactly how that falls in place here, um, but what, what the district's gonna to do to do that. Um, I know there's someone I know uh, recommended the Tuttle Twins book, which is for books, uh, which is a good set of books. It's you know kind of more in a graphic novel type um, you know, uh, format. It talks about law, um, government, lots of different things. Um, and I think their feedback was, well, it didn't have professional library reviews, right? And so again, Parents are being told that, you know, if we have questions on books, well, you know, you're banning books, but the people that are in charge of recommending books or saying that the books are professionally reviewed tend to have a, a bent politically in one direction. And so these books are getting in, parents are then seeing them and sharing concerns and then said, well, you're banning books if you have concerns about them. So, you know, from a parent's perspective, there's gotta be some give and take here, right? And, and interesting, the, the library or the ALA um, and talking about banning books puts the responsibility fully on the parents and says, well, it's your job to make sure that you know what your kids are reading. But they're the ones that are in charge of the books that get into the libraries and the ones that they're recommending, right? So there's a little bit of kind of, you know, them not taking responsibility for these books are getting put in, but then when there's questions, well, it's your job to make sure that your kids don't have access, right? And to me, I see a big difference in public library versus <coughs> public school library. Public library, I might see books that I don't necessarily agree with, but I have the ability to go with my child and let them or not let them have access to certain books. There's not quite the same control in a library. Yes, I can tell a librarian, don't let my child have this type of book, but I don't know if that really covers them from not accessing the book at all. 
um, you know, and so there's, you know, there's some concern there. So I just didn't quite get exactly from the administrative regulations how that's going to address what I'm seeing, and I just want to see more diversity in our, in our library and make sure that, you know, we're seeing good, good breadth of perspectives. So, thank you. So the first policy is policy 006, local board procedures. Okay, so this policy <clears throat> was updated um, to comply with the Act 65 Sunshine Act amendments. And I have the policy up on the screen so you can see um, the, the changes in red line and green um, that have been made to the policy. Can we clarify that that green language that's up there right now does now allow a district not to post things in the newspaper? Right. As, so one of the things that we'll need to talk about, because currently right now, one of the things that slows down notifications is the newspaper process. It's also expensive, right? Well, depending on your definition of expensive, it costs money to post in the newspaper where those things are free. And so one of the, and we are already doing those things. I have to make sure we post it at the district administrative office. I'm not sure we actually post it here. And so that would be easy to take care of in terms of that piece. So the question is, will we want to continue our notification process uh, that we put it in the paper generally the intelligencer, although there'll be times if it's a, a change in meetings, like at the beginning of the month, the meetings change, you know, because we, we're not holding policy or we've added policy or, or those types of things. Sometimes that goes in the Herald, um, that the Thursday paper in terms of the requirement. Or are we okay with just using the district website and calendar, which is where most people go to look, but I don't have a sense for how many people are on the newspaper content. Mm -hmm. so. I don't think a lot of people get in the meeting, but could you add? I think it's helpful if people, if it's gonna be 24 hours, you know, people may or may not, if they don't know to look at the website, right. yeah. they don't know mm -hmm. something's right. changing, they're not gonna look, so could we, just do an email, like a, a how would you know, electronic to me, or however you would say it. But I think that that would be good. I would mean, social media, media too. I would do. Oh well, yeah, yeah that's social, social media, media as well. Of course, that's yeah. If you have to say that specifically, then for sure it should be out on the. And so, are you talking about like a monthly here are May's meetings? Oh no. Is that what you mean in terms of an email that says? To no, this would what? be just for for the. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was reading this as an uh, as when you have a change twenty for like no, changing right. it. Right, because I mean we obviously we we post. I mean that's the posting of agendas and things like that. The calling of meetings, you know, we we don't call meetings with twenty four hours notice. Right? That's not something where we say, hey, surprise, we're meeting on Wednesday. <laughs> um, it, it really is the changes and the things that go in the newspaper because in the beginning of the beginning of the year. Mrs. Chenoweth um, advertises all of our meetings. That's one advertisement, and so if we did every meeting exactly when we intended to hold them, we wouldn't have to do another advertisement for the rest of the year, technically, by law. But then usually what happens is once a month, she'll update it and say, here's what May is going to look like. Because like tonight, we added policy and canceled activities. And so that has to be communicated. And she'll do that in the newspaper. She will right now, legally, prior to this change, we had to. It said newspaper, which is why they changed it. No, no, that was the, that was the so, policy of the state. Oh, and so they so really have caught up and that. said, people really are not interacting with their information through the newspaper. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, you might go online newspaper. There might be some people who are still doing that. But for the most part, people are coming to our website mm -hmm. to interact with the, the calendar. Yeah. For that information. 
And so John, who would you email to right. if you were sending out an email? I mean, right. right. We we're not going to ask you know, right. right. we're not going to hit all the public, but you'll... It's not, it'd be resonance. I mean, you know, well, arguably, the reason that it's in the newspaper is the We don't have resonance emails, so you'd send it to the No, but at least you were making an effort to let, you know, the people that you can reach know. What if for a certain amount of time the newspaper was still printed with the disclaimer that August, we're not printing in the newspaper, go to it. some we website. Yeah. I don't know how many people rely solely on that, but maybe some. Well, especially since it goes out at the beginning of the year, how many people are saving that newspaper and then going back to it throughout the year to see, hey, what were those meetings that they told me about back, you know? He's got a free. Like a special board meeting. You're still going to have to do three days. This would be a lot more helpful no. if this pertained to no, special board. No, I believe, does this, does this address? Where's the meeting? Does this address special board meetings? <laughs> it does. That one person, that one piece mm -hmm. we were looking at did not, but I do believe it's also in here. Special meetings. Special meetings. Yeah. Did I pass it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go. What's the difference between open and public, too? Mm -hmm. Why the change in words? You're the attorney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a reason, right? You don't pick a word for, for you don't switch it out for an for the the care. care. Yeah. So this just says special meetings may be called. The communication of those special meetings are not is not delineated here, which means it must fall back to how we communicate every meeting. They only have to give twenty four hours notice. Okay. At a minimum. Yeah. That has not been our well, practice. Well, no, that's because really, but, to me, the special meetings are the ones that are. It's done. And what we've done with special meetings is we have sent emails in those cases. Right. Like if we've added a meeting to something or done something on a weird evening where we move something from Monday to Thursday, that's happened a couple times mm -hmm. since I've been here, we've sent an email out because that's outside of our rhythm. But just to right. people on the school board. Just yeah. to what we've captured. Yeah, it's just well, to what we've captured. Well, it goes on the website. And yeah, we do put it on social media and the website so that other communities can see it. But primarily it's word of mouth from all our parents and staff to the rest of the community is yeah. the primary way that we go out in those yeah. cases. So. Other than that, that was my only thought about this because I was looking forward to them getting rid of that requirement. Mm -hmm. So at the at the very well, so did, did we decide what we're doing about that? Do we want to leave it in newspaper? We, do we want to keep it in the newspaper? Take it out of the newspaper? Like remove that requirement? Like, are we taking it? Yeah, I agree. Well, if it's not yeah. mandated, then you take it out. Yeah. yeah. Period. I'm okay with taking it out. I don't think yeah. anyone uses it that way. Okay. So we'll make that change. Um, the very last line at the very bottom of the policy, it says a majority of the committee or the chairperson may invite board employees. Shouldn't it be district employees? Maybe they're supposed to be a common. It's probably supposed to be a common board. Oh, okay. I, it, it could be I was like, I don't have employees, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm not sure what they're referring to. <laughs> okay, we'll fix that. Yeah. And then what was the purpose um, with changing the his, her to their? Because it almost seems like that first sentence is grammatically incorrect with their. Right. We're updating all of the policies with that change. So anytime there are policy updates, they're cleaning up that language across all policies. And well, is that a pen line? Or yeah. No. These are the CSB. Okay. And, CSB. Right. Yeah. and yeah. where's the, um, do we have to fall in? Okay. Oh, I can't imagine that this is a required policy in terms of all the language that's there. Okay. If it's a required, because policies are either required or recommended. If they're recommended, we don't even have to have them, so we can pretty much put any language we want in. If they're required, I would always check with Mr. Miller to make sure that the things we change or, or add mm -hmm. are still okay legally, because not okay. all of this is coming straight up. Yeah, I would, so I would leave it as it is because it's grammatically correct as it is, and then we're changing it to make it grammatically Are you talking about the conflict of interest paragraph? It is yes. hers mm -hmm. and theirs, right? Yeah, Just, yeah I see no reason to change. Yeah. First, there's more than one person there. And where they say the public official, that is correct, but right. it's a lot more it's three words. Like we're done three words. And so, yeah. what do you want us to do with the public official? Take it out as well, or keep it and just change the theirs back? I would just leave the policy. I'd leave that whole section alone. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, conflict of interest. We're going back to the red letter 
content and you could green content and go away. I don't know if that shows up elsewhere. If it does, we'll have to just find you from that to see if there's other places where that is her change happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we don't know what the difference is between open and public or their reasoning for wanting to go with that, right? We don't necessarily know. No. Yeah. But it is changed across that they changed the word from public to open. Mm -hmm. Who's that? Who changed the law? Who changed the PSBA yeah. state? Now sometimes it's law generated, that's the one's monitoring the language yeah. changes. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else have anything for this policy? Nope. I'm good. Okay. Then we move to policy one oh nine, resource materials. So if I can just clarify it right from the start here, if you would use the administrative regulations that are actually hosted to board docs right that Dr. Durr is right on right here. now, okay. not the one that's in the policy, there was a, a mishap of the wrong one getting attached, so we'll correct that. Um, but this is the correct AR. Sherry, do you have my PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. if you want that. Yes, please. No, that's just the policy. Oh, sorry. Presentation. Back here, shall be down. It's in there from a Depends who's logged in and what access Yeah, you probably how you're logged in. Yeah. You may not be logged in as you. And so the, the whoever logged in does not yeah, have administrative board on, it's probably access. <laughs> um, just put the plug in. And then it'll be able to just read the phone. Oh, as long as it's an HDMI, that'll work, right? <laughs> it's not really clear. On the one thing, it said Sorry. open meetings mean that every part of a public meeting is required to be open to public observation. Yeah, no. And then when you scroll further down, more de more explanations seem to have them there is one, yeah. the same thing. I wonder if it's because public implies that people are there and open just means the public can be there because you're required to be there. I don't know. You can always adjust to the idea. Notice I said that. Just for good. All right. I'm not taking a job. Okay, Sherry, I'll strive the page. Adjust it to the screen. Story, yeah. Do you see the upper right hand corner? There's an arrow right next to settings. Arrow that's going left to right or diagonal. Yes. Try that. Well, that didn't help. <laughs> that's okay. We, we okay. okay. That's this guy. So, um, oh. sorry. That's okay. Oh. Oh. I didn't even touch it that time. So, the revised resource material procedure. So, one of the things. Um, that I just wanted to note is, which was commented about the guidelines being taken out of the policy. So guidelines technically, I, I actually had some experience in policy myself, so I enjoy doing it, but guidelines are not supposed to be part of the policy. That's the, the working guts of what is being the delegation, the responsibility. So what we did was the librarians who I uh, supervised, the coordinator and the librarians across the district, we met three times to just take a look at the actual guidelines that were established and recognize that there was some out-of-date information in there. So what we did was we established the new guidelines that you see as part of the new administrative regulations. So we, we reviewed those past procedures, we met the three times, and then we established the topics that were reviewed and documented down below. The funding, the donations, the book purchasing, the reviewing books, reading of books, and the relevance of books which would go with age of the book, condition of the book, relevance of topic within the school community. Um, so there's a lot of different, different reasons why we would look at that piece. And then the next slide gives the updated resource material procedures. Um, we did talk about the donation process and we did seek out other school districts in regards to how are they um, delineating the donation process within their own system to understand. And a lot of the districts had a, a re professional review of the books that they're bringing in. Because it doesn't matter whether it's a donation or if it's something that the librarian or another individual is recommending for purchase as a resource in the library or in the school, that they recommended that there be a review uh, by a professional organization that would actually give some credibility to 
the, the, the product itself. The, and the that's piece of consistent literature. with what our librarians go through. Correct. And, that is, and that's what I was going to say. So the librarians have been practicing that with their purchase of the selection of books from before we even, I, I can't even go Can back how far. Yeah, how did we get that one book in that was problematic just recently? You know, how did has, that go through the process? That book has professional reviews. Okay, so it, yes. just, so it wasn't that criteria that okay. would have yep. excluded it. So but how did it yeah. get yeah. come through the rest of it that it still passed through? Because, it, believe it or not, there were actually positive reviews on that book at the time when it was coming out and everything. So, I mean, there's been a lot of changes. Like a lot, some of the books that we even looked at at the elementary level, some of them had some reviews from four years ago that had a controversy, and then Dean, six months later, it really wasn't a controversy. So you really have to... That's was there the anybody look. internally looking yeah, at it, I guess, as opposed to regardless yeah. of what the review is externally? Yeah. You know, is there anybody that says, hey, this doesn't fit within our culture of, of who we are as a school that we would want to put this out, you know? And, and really, yeah, I can say, no, they obviously didn't see the inside book of it. The problem the librarians have when they're doing these book selections is they are usually going off the list of a lot of the professional reviewers and the organizations that put out book lists to purchase for schools. So if it's on their list and it's one of the starred ones at the time, that's and that's why we went back to the procedures to say, okay, this is what we now need to do instead of just allowing something like that to kind of get through because it was on a list and it had some good reviews at the time of its publication. I don't know if I like this this body of reviewers being the be all end all though of what gets in or doesn't get into the schools. It, it's not that they, it gets in or not into the schools, it's not considered unless a body of reviewers have looked at it, at least two different bodies of reviewers. So, if they so just it doesn't decide, mean hey, anything on that list it. is okay. That, 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 that's not what that means. It doesn't mean just because it has two reviews, it's okay to come into the library. It says we're not gonna consider it unless it's been professionally reviewed right. by at least two organizations. And then once it's on at least two lists, you can consider that for the collection. But so well, do you understand the difference between what you said? Yeah. yeah but yes. yes, but like, for example, the book that ended up in the high school. Mm -hmm. Did that have professional reviews? It did, have, it did, it did have, have professional reviews. reviews. And yes. I read five of them, and three of yeah. the five don't come anywhere close to capturing the content of the book. So my concern and is so, those had positive professional reviews. We all know that book shouldn't have been here, right? But then you have something that a community member is complaining about, and I haven't seen those books, but I haven't heard anything negative about them. They're pretty generic topics. Those books were not able to get in. So I'm, I'm what wondering if I think the process piece yeah. that's well, messing that's with the that. problem is these yeah. professional library associations, they are, you know, there is, there's a bias. There's an obvious bias. And I think that as far as, um, and I don't know if you're getting to it, can't see it, but I think just like with how we, um, you know, there's rules about what movies you can show to students at what age. Right. And I, are you going yeah, to I'm going to talk about that, exactly explicit. what you're talking okay. about, but and how but, it differs, Jeff, as yeah, well. So. Well, and then as far as these reviewers go, I mean, I agree with what the public comment was that if you rely on associations, they're the gatekeepers then for right. these. For these books, and they are obviously not giving reviews or ignoring them or not giving good reviews to books, maybe that they have a bias against. And so, facts are facts. Like, if it's true that our libraries have six books on RBG but no books on um, Clarence Thomas, I mean, well, why is that? Why is there no Thomas Sowell? Why is there no John McWhorter, like he was saying? So, that's I not a professional is, review. Well, but it, right, that's just more of it could okay. be, I mean, it could be that. though, because, because I mean, I don't know. Like, right. like, 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 why aren't those books there? Now, if I'm hearing that it's because, you know, the way that books get in is if they're reviewed by a couple organizations, and I'm wondering, are these books just ignored by these professional? And when you say professional reviews, can mean? we? Like the New York alter, Times it or Right, like, could that be not just the American Library Association, but other organizations? Do we have to yeah. rely on just the library? No, so the, the individual, the professional reviews, the, the ones that are the kind of the cat catalyst of the reviewers are School Library Journal, which obviously that would be one, uh, Kirkus, Tidal Wave, Publishers Weekly, uh, Amazon is considered a parent reader review only. It's not a 
professional organization. They do have some professional reviewers, but they don't offer for every book that they produce or they sell a professional review. Um, American Library Association, Mackin, and New York Times Book Review, and another one is Bookmarks. Those so are the ones that are identified. Are there eight of them if you don't count that? One, two, correct? three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yes. If you don't count Amazon. Yes. So there are eight of them. So to look at a minimum of two of them to have provided feedback on the book. But are they all biased and how biased? And like Mr. Bedillion was saying, the new director of ALI has tweeted that a gay Marxist is now in charge. I mean, I think we know where that is going to go. So what do we do internally? I don't think we can rely on... Well, it just has to be reviewed. Well, yeah, review be versus positive. selection of materials that you're looking at is two different two different things. Right. I mean, in, in finding more balance of a balanced delivery of books within your library, I mean that's something that's not going to happen overnight. First of all, I mean, right. books are expensive, and yeah. we're identifying things now that we haven't identified before that we're seeing where there may be some inconsistencies that we need to work on for sure. So, the, and out of those eight organizations, yes. There had to have been two that reviewed the Tuttle Twins, and that, not not even two of these organizations reviewed. Correct. It did not go through a professional publishing company. See, so, but that's, that's what why. I, I mean. So, for them, I mean, it seems like a pretty popular book series. It's pretty straightforward. It just has to deal, you know, I think with economics or something. Mm -hmm. For none of these eight organizations to even look at it. Wait, what did you say about economic? The, I think it's like economics and history and civics, right? Multiple it's just like, there's multiple so topics, yeah. it's, just, it's just generic information, really, and none of these eight organizations bothered to review it, so now I'm wondering, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what's their excuse for not reviewing it? Yeah. It didn't, I mean, I th what, in this regard, it didn't go through a public, a, a, the typical publication process. It was a self-publication mm. book or series. That was the that was the difference. When you're looking at the books that are going through these, they're all going through um some one or another type of uh, one publisher at least. And then so I go back to the the fact that there were you said not negative reviews of the book that ended up in our high school. How valuable are these reviews that we're requiring them? Why aren't we just I'm not, reviewing them ourselves? Let me clarify. I'm not saying there weren't negative reviews. There were both positive and negative. But someone asked about that was there was there positive reviews? Yes, at the time of publication and around that theme, there was positive reviews as just as much as there were negative reviews. But again, it wasn't that the 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 purchase of that book, like the librarians do not read every book that comes through the list that's recommended for uh, for purchasing. They, they they just physically can't. They're buying 2,500 books. They would do nothing but sit there and read a book all day long for the entire school year. So they have to come to terms with looking at that list and determining what's an acceptable purchase from that recommended list. I feel like I've gotten more detailed reviews from Goodreads and Amazon than, than what you're suggesting from some of these other organizations, though. So, and my question would be, I mean, I don't know if we want to go down this road, but if the board is looking at curriculum and books on curriculum, why wouldn't we evaluate some of these and have a vote on some of these books or, you know, ones that should get added? So technically, you do approve all book purchases. Not technically, you do approve all book purchases. But there are thousands of books that are purchased every year, so it's not the expectation that the board has a record of those books. It might make some sense to go to the administration to the administrative regulations Dave's gonna read all those books. because we've put some things in place so that when a book rises to that level of consideration, because the vast majority of books that are in our libraries. Right, that there isn't anybody who's going to look at it and say, "Why is that there?" Or you may not want to read it, but that's not going to be the question. And that's the vast majority of the books we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, as we've talked to the librarians, the question is, how do we put a system in place so that we're looking at age appropriateness, we're looking at content appropriateness, and if there's anything that makes your spidey senses go, "Wait a second," by looking at the reviews, which is why I think the reviews are important, because <laughs> the reviews do include that. They do include age. They do include what are the topics, right? As long as you're looking for that information. 
in terms of you know curse words, you know the language, you know sexuality, things like that. For then for us to have regulations in place that say, okay, now what do you do if that happens, right? If you're looking at a book for middle school and it says there might be some sexuality, well, you better dig into that a little more because there might be sometimes you say that and go, okay, I understand why you call it sexuality, but that's not a big deal. Right, but other times you might go, yeah, no, I don't want that in the middle school library, which is why for the AR, we put things in place to say, now what do you do right, in terms of chess? Does that, does that make sense, Dr. Robartrick? Yes. Did that tee Absolutely. up for you? Yep. It, that's can we go to can, the AR? Can, can I just oh, touch this page? Sorry, because Joe yeah. was asking about, so I think, in particular to the rating scale component. Yeah. Um, and, and we talked about this um, with the librarians. Like, it's not like the American Film Academy or whatever, where they're giving it R or, you know, rated R, rated PG, or G, whatever, it, you know, they do rate books on grade and age level, so that, you know, they do basically up to middle school, it's generally grade bands of, you know, K to two, or three to five, or something along those lines, where when you get into middle school and high school, and even some upper elementary, it gets more into young adult or adult. So that's the, their cutoff, but the problem that you, you run into, even with the rating scales from one reviewer to the next, or one company to the next, even book publisher, is that this publisher may give it a young adult, this publisher may give it an adult. Well, so there's no yeah, clear cuts. But that's why I think they need, because the <clears throat> Motion Picture Association, it explains exactly what you need. Like, in a PG-13 movie, you can say the F word one time, I think, mm -hmm. and, and maintain a PG-13. Mm -hmm. Like, it gets very specific on how a rating is determined. And, right. you know, that, that book that we're all talking about was rated, <clears throat> I forget for what age, but it depict, mm -hmm. it, it actually had pictures yep. of sexual acts, which, That's I mean, we would never show a movie with that in there. So that's what I'm talking about where you need, if these book organizations are not going to be specific, um, you know, the ones, the publishers, and I think the publishers really are where we should go um, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are creating this mm -hmm. and being deceptive. But for our purposes, I think that we should just say what we mean, what we, you know, have a description of what what we don't want to see in um, certain age level books, and then it will be a lot clearer and you won't have to rely on it. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a website out there that does it, just like that family one for movies. I can't even remember what it's called, but you all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You go yeah. and, you, and it actually tells you, sometimes it seems a little bit ridiculous, but they tell you exactly what is said or done, mm -hmm. or you know, somebody farts, or you know, <laughs> even things like that. So. Um, Maybe there exists something like that for books and we should find it. Mean, you know these meetings are being recorded and your children want to use that. <laughs> I, <All right. laughs> yeah. my, my concern is that that book in particular, regardless of what the review said, the title alone should have raised somebody's spidey sense. All you have to do is open it. Like we're really relying way too much on that because if you I mean you don't have to read it, you just page through and there's depictions of pornography it shouldn't be in a school at all so how does something that blatant get through and that's why the conversation around the review process happens so that there is a level of consistency in terms of what that looks like in terms of the expectations coming in because the answer to your question is how is professionally reviewed part of book recommendations right and so as you're looking at a, a, a suggested list from the award winners, and, and there's a couple times a year where these lists come out for our librarians, and they look, and so if they're ordering 600 books, and they're off this list that have been professionally reviewed, there's positive information, they're, they are age appropriate from a rating standpoint, because some rated it at 16, some rated it at 18, um, and then they're hired, I mean, they're then brought in. Now, they then are approved by the principal and approved by the board, right? So if you go through the process, they, those books were approved three times, but we have to get to the point because the librarians are the, are the primary people who are going to be looking at these things, primarily. Mm -hmm. Sometimes teachers will come down and say, I need more, more books on microbiology or whatever. And so we need to make sure that, and they're the library professionals who should be doing this work. And so we need to make sure that the regulations are clear enough in terms of what are the expectations 
I'm hesitant to say, here are the three things we don't want because there's going to be a fourth one that we miss or if we list, right? So I just, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to do that. I'm hesitant to remove the reviews or, or recommend that we remove the reviews because I'm not sure where else you start. There has to be a starting point to this in terms of where do you start to get your better. The reviews, I heard something. I mean, that. certainly, I know what you're saying about a list and then something won't be on the list, but I would, again, just, there's the movies, we have a we have something for movies, I guess. You know, we say you can't watch more than G or whatever it is on the field trip bus, and so we go back to what it means to be a rated G movie. There has to be something um, where they have this how a book is designated as whatever. Do we know like if? This. I mean, I understand no, like ordering off the one. list and it comes in. Does yeah. anybody go through, okay, here's the 50 books we ordered. Let me just, you know, <laughs> open it or yeah. is there any of that? Or is it just unpack the box, put them on the shelf and they're in our system? Right. The librarians interact with all the literature that's on, but in terms of whether they've opened them or not, obviously not in this instance, okay. right, in terms of that piece. I mean, our librarians have read a large portion of their collection would be my guess. Um, but when they come in, now the question is when you're, how do you get the sense that something should rise to the level of? So when a book order of 400 books comes in, how do you know whether there are 10 of them you should look at like that? Because you probably can't look at all 400 of them like that. Um, and so that's really what the conversation we went through in terms of how do you do that? How do you look at age appropriateness? How do you look at content appropriateness? How do you look at um, what the reviews say? Um, using different review sources because some of them are better at unpacking the type of thing that you're talking about. Some of them will provide, here's how many curse words are in it, or here are the controversial scenes, and that's why we rate it ages 10 to 14 instead of lower elementary school, those types of things. So when they pick books, because mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I don't understand, um, you had once talked about these bulk shipments that come, mm -hmm. and is it just... Mm -hmm. Publisher X decides says, "Oh, hey, here's a here's a package of 300 books and you know, right a lot of the school out of school library journal. I mean that a lot of that comes from that piece because generally they're the ones that are recommending a number of different topics and categories. So I mean, they, they send you this bulk shipment knowing that they send you the list, but it doesn't. You don't have to just stay to that list. You would look at these other." Public, these other the publishers that provide lists as well and say these are our top books that you know are kind of the hot topics right because now. Because it could be like the 50 hot hottest young adult titles right. over the last six months. Like that could be a list that a librarian would get. And so he, these are the books that have been read the most by young adults, the top 50 titles. Right? But I don't know that I want just 300 random bulk books coming in and because That's that was on some list and. Who knows if there are any if, if there are any good? With, well, they're, the they're looking at the little synopsis that comes with it as well. I'm just saying they're not reading like they would say we're not reading. They're not reading the whole book at so all times. What has changed? Reading, what has changed in this process that we would now catch what we would, wasn't caught last time? So under the general provisions itself, basically that you're looking at books that support. Um, obviously, the the, dis the district and the curriculum and everything else. So they include traditional print materials. that explains what the what a resource material would be because it's not just limited to books. It's photographs, artworks, art, uh, audio slides, films, etc. And then as part of that screening selection component, um, they're selected for the effectiveness of contributing to the interest in general information, enjoyment, educational, and education of students, and the professional development of staff. Primary responsibility of screening and recommending new resource materials rests in the professional staff and administration. So they, the criteria that they're following are, it relates to and supports and enrich the district's curriculum and overall educational program, suitable for the maturity levels, interests, and educational accomplishments of students. Recognize educational significance, literally mer literacy, merit, and artistic quality. Represent diversity viewpoints, contributions of varied religious, ethnic, gender and culture groups, present information in a valid, reliable, accurate, objective, and comprehensive manner, represent a format of sufficient quality and durability, suitability that are intended to use, and long, longevity, and the minimum of two professional reviews. So that would be the process of looking at the screening and selection. 
component. And then they go into the review and weeding as well. And then that gets more into why we're taking books out of the library. But well, why don't we park at the screening and selection for yep. a second? Because that was the question. Sure. Right. So let's park there. Give a sense for you to. I'm not sure can I, can I ask time. a question? Then? Sense. Yeah, please. Sure. Um, so, how many books do we have across the district? Cool. <laughs> oh, wow. Just a bit, simple question. And so, how thousands. many? Of, <laughs> correct. I would assume thousands. So, how many would be electronically in some sort of database where you can actually sort? So you can actually search for content where there'd be a live database where you can search for resources or content that would be across the board where you could do a broad search electronically so you're Correct. not doing it page by page. And you can actually search for whatever you were looking for. You, you can. The they, are, they are broader terms in general in Correct. regards to the search capacity. Yeah. Um, you know, you put might put one word in. Yeah. And, and use a similar term and get a whole different house of books. Yes, correct. Yeah. So, I'm just curious how yep. many of those books would be electronically sourceable, if you will, for content. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, is there a an application or something of that nature, database, which would incorporate all the books that we'd be bringing in, where you could quickly access content or whatever you're searching for from an IT perspective, that's how my brain works. Right. Well, most of them are coming out of those databases right. in order, not on how searchable those databases are, but because the, the vast majority of them are coming out of the databases you're talking about. Exactly. Right. So. When does the board um, vote on just books? Announced. Yeah, so it comes through as a purchase, purchase order, order. And then the yeah. purchase order has the list like as a of. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yep. I mean, is it how, once how a year? Do we have no? It's regular. It's routine. I don't know how many times a year a book list. Generally, about three but... times a year, you'll see purchase orders come through. Um, usually at the very beginning of the year, August, September time, um, and then you'll see one kind of mid year when because that's when the libraries do a lot of their fall weeding, and then they'll do the end, towards the end of the year because they're using up whatever funding is left. Actually, really more this time of year, March, April. Because they're using up the rest of the funding they have to purchase library books. So how long do we would, would the board get notice of what those books? Not that we want to review them, but that's well, what job too. Yeah. Huh? Personally, everyone. Nice. Um, <laughs> how long do we have between the time we see the list, the purchase order, and approve it? Like, is, is when the list is when you mean when the list is created versus mm -hmm. when you actually mm -hmm. approve the purchase order? Right. I would probably say generally about a month's time. That the the list is com, com you know competitive that can but the board out. doesn't currently have a month no the board doesn't so you get the purchase yeah. order you're answering how quick how far in advance is the list right you know in the district in terms that right. that's different from yours because that shows up on the agenda so that's the week before so we have the meeting three days, days right. or four so days so can that be sent so, so can that be sent a month earlier. Well, we, yeah, we'd have to talk through librarians in terms of what that does to their process. Right, and when it, when they would can. put their purchases purchase in. Yeah. As part of this process for reviewing books in the AR, uh, you know, so what it includes as well is what they developed, uh, kind of this bulleted list, is a process for reviewing books. And they look at the what they're looking at, because we wanted to put into documentation of what they actually look at and how that process falls under that review and selection screening. So what we've agreed to where the new language comes into play with Dr. Bolton was referring to is, so when they look for the sensitive topics such as graphic language, intense, gratuitous, violence, gender identity, and graphic sexual content. View the multiple reviews. Dr. Birch, am I going further down? Oh no, that's not on, the, that, so that, that's their like personal document that they use. Oh. that encompasses that screening process. So, and then they look at the age appropriate, I'm telling you what they do when they're looking at it. Um, the age appropriateness, and then if they feel, this is where we put in that, as Dr. Bolton says, spidey sense. And so if they have a concern of any type, or they see a review that there's questionable in any way, the next process is then to read the book of either the whole book or the concerning passages that they would have issues with. What about the issue that was raised at the balance in the library? Say if I'm going to do a report on some topic, yeah. I mean, where is that in the process to see that we, we can't change what's already been purchased unless it goes through the weeding process, but how do we ensure that on the shelf there's a balance of books of those viewpoints 
So uh, two pieces. One. I'm sorry. Refresh. Yeah. Okay. Two pieces. Under screening and selection D, the language in D was was adjusted to make sure. But that's just for new purchases. You know what I mean? So right. And so that. yeah. And and so that's one piece of it in terms of the new things that are coming in from that standpoint. Now specific to Mr. Bedellians, and he knows this. We've had communication in terms of where we are in the process. The, he was talking primarily about the high school library. So the high school librarian has been asked to review the collection, specific from a collection standpoint, but also from a standpoint to the specifics that Mr. Bedillion provided, and that's still in the process. Correct. So we do expect that over the next month or so that we'll have a, a, an outcome. We've got to send him to say, yes, here's what was decided, specifically to the list you shared. Um, and so that's for us to try to be able to take the existing list and, and make up for some of that to make sure that we do view it through that lens. And will that just be at the high school or will it be at the middle schools as well? Well, we'll, we'll need to do it at the middle school level, but primarily we started at the high school just because that was where the list was generated and so it was a good exercise to go through and say, okay, let's use that lens to evaluate what it looks like. But how so is that going to be, like, I can't, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I don't understand how a librarian would think to say, well, if I have RBG, we should also have that. Like, how is that not automatic. That's not going to happen. Well, I, mean, I, I would suggest that since, you know, like instead of having everything you buy now, like today, whatever you are ordering now, I think should probably be weighted more. Instead of being half, half and half, mm -hmm. it's going to need to be weighted more toward the side that has been ignored all this time. So, you know, before they go Ordering I mean, if it has been, it'd just yeah, be helpful for somebody else. Right, yeah. no, I don't want to make that assumption, I mean, but, but somebody needs well, to almost I do know. that. Like, that I, yeah. I did say, if it's true, right, right. but I mean, I think he did look. And so, if But it's even the true, topics that, that to know what the, school, what the teachers are asking their kids to do reports on, and maybe they're not, maybe they can pick whatever they want to, but just to have a balanced yeah, approach they they that all the books you pick aren't, aren't just going to come from one perspective. I think that's hard. And there are, there are times when the... When the the curriculum piece will talk to library and say we, we've changed and make and we're now doing the topic of okay. you know whatever that is and so would you help us and so they do work with the library so we can't do anything well i mean we can balance it but going through every book would be obviously difficult but going forward can we get the list much earlier and can the public get the list much earlier yeah I so we can talk to librarians to make sure we understand the PO process. Yes, that's the only thing I would of that. Can it just be posted to the website once it's ready? A review? Well, and we can figure out what the timing and what the process looks like currently because we don't know right now in terms of what can be done and how early it can be done. And then that's a that's a question for the board. We don't currently post those types of things ahead of time. Right. Those decisions right now are made by the librarian professionals go through the, the principles and then to the board. They, they, they are not routinely provided to the public differently than they're provided to you. Now the board can change that expectation, mm -hmm. right? but let us figure out what the process is first. Okay. Does it make any sense, Dr. Robarczyk, under the screening and selection piece, but some of the language you talked about in terms of age appropriateness, mm -hmm. is you know it can be inferred in some of these bullets, but it's right. not as clear as some of these letters so I think we, we can need to consider we, whether that language ought to also be in here because this is the public facing of that right and this is the nice yeah. part what I was talking about yeah. in regards to the guidelines so once the policy is passed because once the policy is passed and there was something in the guidelines you wanted to then revise we'd have to reopen the policy go through the process of revising two reviews and everything whereas the administrative regulation is that living breathing document that we can you know, mold to what we want it to be. Well, we'd still have to vote to change that too, right? No, no votes for ARs. Well, so that's my concern about taking this out of the policy and moving it into an AR. That means that the administration can do whatever they want to it and it doesn't come back to but us. Not without as to it needing to go through the board for a board approval and a policy. But not without informing the board. It just doesn't go through a vote. Um, well, and, and the other piece, just on that note about um, administrative you know the administrative piece there's three sections in this policy the first one you remove the section that details the information and put it into guidelines mm -hmm. the second grouping you left there and then the third grouping was removed again so there isn't consistency and I'm just wondering then if that second section would also be removed and put into guidelines are you talking about the administrative regulations that set forth procedures for the following yes. the parent request because that's actually an action occurring. 
it's not a guide to help develop the process of selection of bugs. There, that's actually a process. So when you look at what the reasons are for looking to, uh, for either exemption or exclusion or inclusion, that, that's an actual process where the guidelines are that more Right, but it says general. develop administrative regulations. So wouldn't those regulations then need to be in a document like Oh, this? I see what you're saying. Okay. That, that one line there. Right, and then, it, and then it breaks down what you need regulations right. on. So I would think yep. if you're pulling everything out and putting it into guidelines, then it would be consistent and you would do it with that section too. Okay, I see what you're saying. The policy has to indicate that there is a procedure for the public to follow that they would like to challenge or exemption so that they know that there is a way to do that. Right? That ought to be in the policy that they know there is a path to follow. Even if it's as simply as reject your boarding proof of building right. or reject a superintendent, then you at least know what you need to do as opposed to it all being in the law, which wouldn't. Right? They, they don't need to know the details necessarily. That They just need to know to reject so they can learn them. I also don't think even if you have the separate AR and then leaving this content in there that's pretty much more of an over, it, it, this isn't the detail, the mm -hmm. one you have is a detail, mm -hmm. is detailed. I don't, I don't see the harm in leaving that there as kind of the overarching guide, guidelines, you know what I mean? The, 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 th the, the one through four? Yes. That you're saying? Yes. Yeah, the one through four will stay in there. It's just that, that first line above it needs to be reworked okay. to indicate reasons for reconsideration. Now, are you two talking about the that same one through change, four? Are, are we mm -hmm. talking about this second? Are you talking about the red line uh, one through four? I was talking about the red line. That's what I thought. Yeah. Right. He, he was not. Through four. No. Yeah, yeah. He okay. was talking about the black one through four underneath, which is sad. Well, yeah, because that's my point. You're either taking them all out and putting them here, or you're leaving them all in. Well, those it's are the guidelines in regards to selection, but these are reasons for a reconsideration. So that's why I'm saying rework the line where this it says the superintendent does initial develop administrative guidelines. It's more along these are individuals wishing for reconsideration of a piece of work would contact the superintendent designate, and these are the reasons why. Their request for student exemption, their inclusion or exclusion, recommendation for inclusion. But then where work. are you putting the regulations as far as whether, you know, what is regulating those decisions? A parental request, what is regulating the parental yeah. request? What is regulating the public challenge? What is regulating, because that's why the, so the that's why it says you're creating yep. regulations. So can you go back to the AR, please? Yeah. So in the AR itself, if you look, the um, administrative regulations, the last part, the last two parts, okay. is about request for reconsideration <coughs> of a resource material. This gets into more the nitty gritty of the process, and the, Dissemination of information about uh, ver verified errors, and then down below it will, is the form that would be used that they would seek out to the superintendent designee so, to complete so, for that reconsideration. So you're including this in that document, but then you still have the four bullets here. So if you're including, well, you're just it there, given the reasons. You're given the reasons why. It gives it gives reason. It lets you know there is the possibility to request for kidder for reconsideration of resource materials, and then the AR has the details on that request. The process. But the policy has to let you know that you have the right to request that, and here's how you go about that. Even if it's as simply as you contact the superintendent right. or designate. So can you have, I mean, this goes with all policies, right? There's a policy, like you're saying, is the policy, and then there's these guidelines. Um, but I think it would be helpful for the board to be aware of and, and be able to speak to whether they approve or disapprove of the way that some things would be carried out or guidance that's being given. given. For the administrative regulation component? Yeah, like because we'll, we'll be asked about things sometimes about, you know, we'll, what are teachers to being told about X and about it? But personally, I think we should just leave these four points in and then you're elaborating them on them there so that way it's clear both places because this isn't something that you're going to be changing you're not going to all of a sudden decide you're not going to do any one of these things but i also like the idea of strengthening the language about the appropriateness of the content because mm -hmm. i yeah, don't I, think that that's clear and sure. some i mean i've 
I keep seeing stuff that is supposedly appropriate for high schoolers that I don't think is appropriate for high schoolers. So to Joan's point about kind of itemizing, you know, there are things that I, I think that we can say, hey, this shouldn't be in a book. The, the really hard part What's of this? that is the, the part of the sentence where you said, I think, because the hard part is how do you make that determination? Okay. Like who ultimately makes that determination? Well, well, X-rated, well, that, that would actually, content, to, content that? that's in a, yeah, con that's like, X-rated content that's completely inappropriate right, yeah, in a so book, that's what I'm talking about. It's generally not that Sexual simple, content, right, that's generally. what I'm talking about. Well, there's sexual content yeah. and then there's depiction of, like, that book with the graphic with drawings of sexual acts and it's embarrassing to talk about these things, but there's the difference. Like, if you're not going to allow a minor to watch a movie that depicts that, they shouldn't be able to open. You wouldn't have Playboy in the library, right? Am I? I hope we don't have that, right? And, and why don't we have them? Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm saying there are, there are definitions of things that can be laid down and, and, and I know some well, of, there will always be something that isn't, that someone can add to it, but. Well, I want to walk back to Kite Runner, right, uh, Kite Runner. Runner from earlier this evening, because the movie Kite Runner is PG-13, which would mean, of course, and that is a rating system. That's exactly that stronger, my point. Because I looked right? that up before and I came. And so, did that movie, if you use that, would be appropriate for upper middle school and high school? And yet, we've decided that we're going to use the excerpts and not use that scene because you don't need to, right? And and that eleventh graders were able to talk about with the way it was, you know, the, using the teachers to preface that and have that conversation. But but there's an example of something that was PG-13, which means if, if my kid went to go see a movie and they were 13, I'd be like, sure, because we trust that rating system. And so I, it just is, it, it's not mm -hmm. as, I mean, that's there, there are a couple be. books that I think are simple, but it's not the couple books that are simple that I think we're really talking about here, right? We're talking about how do you evaluate and who evaluates. And so for us to trust our library professionals with given the expectations that are delineated, and so we need to clarify this language, but delineate and have to say, right? And I can tell you that, that they are there and understand that, they, they wrote these, right? They participated in this conversation. These were not written for them in terms of understanding that we need to make sure that we are responsible for what is brought into our collections and do the due diligence to see which ones need to be looked at more closely because it can't be all of them. Well, I did find some organizations, other organizations that do book reviews, and so that would be one other thing. Okay. We need to add different groups that, and I just, I have four, four or five tabs up here of professional organizations that review books. So they're out there. So do we want to have board members continue to um, process this and send any additional information to the administration and then bring this back again to policy next month and then discuss it again. Well, we do. And this is just the first reading anyway, right? right? So. Although this may be a policy where I don't suggest that we even take this to first reading. Right. Okay. Because I, yeah. I, I think this policy, I think generally I agree with you that yeah. it makes sense. Let's just put it out for first reading and everybody has a month to you know, give it feedback. I think this one, especially since the AR, let us clean up some language and we'll continue through with it. Okay. That you, you won't see this one on Monday night for first group. Right? Okay. Okay. And then you'll you'll get back to us uh we will. after we'll you talk to the librarians. Language. Yep. With yep. Okay. yep. We definitely will. And page three, first paragraph, there's just a typo before the principal. Just look at that because it's table. Are you talking about the AR? Yeah. A R page. Don't worry about it. He'll fix it. It's literally a missing letter. Okay. Page three, first line. Um, first paragraph. It's supposed to say the principal. It says he principal. Okay, got it. Okay. Got a T. Okay. Then we will move to extracurricular activities. So we're bringing this policy back for first reading. Um, we had just updated this policy and approved it. The board had approved it August 23rd um, of 2021. 
But right after that happened, policy 247, which is our hazing policy, was updated and approved at the September board meeting um, with new definitions of hazing. So what we're proposing is, because this is not really a policy on hazing, so that we're proposing that we take out the content um, about hazing, but reference board policy 247 hazing in this policy. It's logical. So I have it up on the screen here. That's logical. That's the only change. Yep. Hopefully that was an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the easy button. Are the rest of them like Any questions or comments or nope. Mrs. Van's comments, anything else? Um, I guess the only thing to, the only other thing is that this would be the policy if we wanted to um, decide what things can and cannot happen during the school day um, regarding clubs and things like that. This would be the, the policy to have that discussion. So, um, you know, I've heard a lot of feedback about not wanting to have things being basically pushed into the school day um, if that was the goal, then under definition, instead of saying are conducted wholly or partly outside the regular school day, you could say wholly outside of the regular school day or outside of the instructional time or instructional space, you know, but those are basically the ways to make that adjustment if that's what everybody wanted to do. So there's not a separate clubs policy? No, that's included in yes. this. So you would say no clubs could have any type of activity? Well, it would say, right now it says they're conducted wholly or partly outside the regular school day. If you said wholly outside the regular school day, then it would only be outside the regular school day. Right. Wouldn't that impact, so say, even people that, I think they were selling pretzels for autism awareness or something so you can't sell pretzels because that's part or there was a club or say even the some club was selling don't they do like daffodils to sponsor some sort of like cancer awareness so you couldn't do any of those things um during the school day that's correct if you made that change that's what would happen is that so, what you would you want or is that the intention? I'm, is that i'm bringing up the topic because i know that it's been a conversation and i'm not saying i know what the answer is i'm just saying that this would be the policy to address that concern, um, but yeah, if you if you said wholly outside of the regular day, then that would mean everything outside of the regular day. You could say outside of the classroom space, instructional space, um, and then that would allow for the hallway, lunch, recess, Rams. Well, well they not recess in the high school, but um, you know, this would be the policy to have that conversation. I think it's safe to say that it would be hundreds of activities. At the high school alone, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone middle school and elementary, which yeah. obviously also do these types of things during the school day. Um, it, it would have tremendous ripples. Yeah, it would I not be our recommendation yeah, to eliminate things during the school baby day. Out with the but, bathroom, so. Yeah, my preference would be to have, and I think that there's a way of teaching people. I. You know, thought that this was going to be in reference to like the advertisements, the posters, flyers, things like that. Um, that's a separate policy, and yeah, I know yeah, that's, that's in the two yeah. hundreds. But um, yeah, I don't. Right now, I don't. I don't know how that would be managed to say nothing because if you literally say nothing, then it's only nothing. Well, there's going to be a lot of things you didn't consider that kids do like in the um, middle school they have their micro loans yeah. those that happens during the day um, I mean it all come up with a thousand examples so I think I would rather form something that would set down guidelines and teach people how to conduct themselves like that's what we're supposed to be doing is teaching people what's appropriate Time, minute, time and place, whatever. Um, I think I would rather work on that than just ban everything outright. I could get behind that. We just have to figure out how. You know, and I mean, I, I think it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> so we're comfortable moving this forward, and then we'll continue to have conversations around what you were talking about. Yeah. And there's another policy in June that we have. So, 
So are you, uh, Joan, are you suggesting adding that line, coming up with language to add into this policy or doing that separately? No, I don't think, I don't see where it would fit really necessarily. I don't know because I think this is extracurricular activities and clubs. Um, no, because there's, I think it would make that too cumbersome. I'm more thinking of like professional development. Um, and then as far as, and this is for next month, but with the clubs and advertising, just making sure that there's consistency with how the policy is being carried out. Like the policy says, um, the policy I think is fine as far as I could tell when I just glanced at it, but the implementation of it might not be consistent. And that's what, you know, that's what you have to work on. So I don't, I don't know. I don't think that I would put anything in here. Um, Do you, because this is all student expression anyway. And that's, that's a different thing from other people's expression. So everybody move this forward? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The next policy is home education programs. 137, home education programs. Um, so this policy, um, as I was looking through policies that haven't been updated for a while, this policy was actually updated in 2015 um, by PSBA, um, but it was never updated here at Penridge. So this is bringing this policy in line with the updates that were made back in 2015. And, and in 2015, there was a significant change mm -hmm. to, the, to the responsibilities around home education. So this is homeschooling. Yeah, this is, yes, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. yep, this is homeschooling. And so the green is the, this what, is what has been the working practice of all school districts since 2015. It, it just was not ever codified. Why are they taking, removing the um, provide a hearing? It's, Where is that made up for? It's actually made up for, yes. Okay. Does this address um, the middle of page three? The question I had asked you, Dr. Bolton, about if homeschoolers can use services in the district? This, yeah, that is a different policy. Okay. It is not within this policy. Okay. Because that has to. I thought it did actually reference that in this policy. Well, that's what I was trying to say. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure it references it, it but if I, I know I was just looking at the policies and there is a policy that says, <coughs> like speech uh, services. Um, what is that, what's the word? Homeschool or home, home educated access to activities. Well, it says the probably in people. It is the supervisor may request that the school district or intermediate unit of residence provide services that address the specific needs of a student with a disability. And it goes on to... So that's specific to special education. Right, yeah. isn't so that what you're talking about? No, yeah. I'm looking at... Where was it? I know there is a policy that is just for Homeschools. All services peoples. shall be provided in district schools or in a private school. Are you talking like to music instruments such and that kind of thing? Services. I don't know. So that would actually, be the only thing is if you're if it's right here, talking I about trying to move it to the home. Then that was a change. So this awesome. is still requiring their offer, but them coming it's, to the department. Right. The title of the policy is literally it's it's <laughs> access to bad eligibility for two o two. But. No, that's right. But these are residents. Students. Students. They're just home school. No, so this is like maybe it's in the one hundreds. We will solve this problem tonight. <laughs> extra extracurricular participation by home education students is one thirty-seven point one. So it's a sub. So. Were you talking? Well, she was talking about services, but yeah. their extracurricular activity they would be um, involved yes. in too. Yes. <laughs> okay, so should I bring us back to one thirty-seven? Student services. So, so it does cover it. Yes, it covers the special needs. Okay. Or one thirty-seven. Sorry, I heard both. Yeah, I thought you were referring to being able to be in 
<coughs> oh, we talked about like, community the, member, yeah, ask about I, like uh, speech therapy, mm -hmm. you know, can, can the student we can utilize those resources here at the school? We, we do not. Well, it says they do. We can also provide to special education services for students in a home education program. Well, it says that they can, that they do provide the services, but they would have to come to the school to get them. Right? Isn't that what it says in the policy? If it's they just, wanted to, I guess if they wanted to dual enroll. Well, that's not what this says, though. Where are you at? Yeah, this in 137? Yeah. Um, no, I just lost my it's spot. on page two. Students with disabilities, it's on page two of four. The supervisor may request that the school district or intermediate unit of residence provide services that address the specific needs of a student with a disability. When the provision of services is agreed to by the supervisor in the school district or intermediate unit, all services shall be provided in district schools or in a private school licensed to provide such programs and services. So basically what they're saying is they'd have to come in and get those services in a school setting, but it's saying that we would offer them no, no, it says it's if saying, we agree. Right, if we agree. So a request has to be made yes. by the parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, is that something we want to clean up that language to suggest that um, if the student qualifies that we would be providing those services because it is still a resident of the school, they're still paying taxes. Right. Like if they need OT or, or just like, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because right now it just says if. I don't know what happens with if. It is if. a proverbial slippery slope. It is a very slippery So, And if you, I mean, I'm not saying we don't do what the board wants to do, um, but it is not practice in most school districts to offer special education services. So, so, it, so in, it is, in any that right, I know that, of. That but that would that you, that you that I mean, because if you did that for homeschool students, would you also have to offer it? Because program. Or work with people schools, I can't speak. Like they often don't have the same level of they don't, but they can that, dual enroll right. in the school district. So that's what they would and if they agree to come to the district to get services they have. Right. So, so at a time or a place that we can provide the service. Right. So could the homeschool kids do the same thing? Dual enroll is the solution. I don't think there's dual enrollment for home education yeah. students. But how is there dual enrollment for, say, a kid going to Faith Christian? Right? Are you saying they would be dual enrolled and they would come here for services? If we agree to that and the parents agree, yes. They could. So wouldn't we do this? I, I don't see why we wouldn't do the same thing then for someone who's homeschooled and then they would have to come here for those services. I mean, if you think about it, this is one less kid you're paying to educate in the full setting, It's but those parents are still paying taxes, and if the student has needs for speech or OT or PT, it makes sense that we'd be providing them. Up until age five, they're provided by, um, you know, either in this area, Penn Foundation, and then the Bucks County Intermediate Unit, so... Um, or what makes it more of a slippery slope than the parochial yeah. scenario? I don't know. I guess I, if you think about opening the door for special education services, then how do you not open the door for a student who is homeschooled to come in for an algebra class? Because it's not as, they're, they're homeschooled, so they're taking algebra at home. Right? Isn't that the whole point of being homeschooled? Is you're learning your yes well, academics at home? That, well, the yes. kids that go, the ones that you have this arrangement with, or the ones that are in parochial school, mm -hmm. and you already have this arrangement, they don't get any regular ed. Like they wouldn't get a core subject. Right. It's it's actually written in school code that we have to allow students in private schools. So it's not if. For, 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 for private schools, it's have to. It's must. Right. Yes. I, I don't, that, that's odd to me. That for, why is there a difference between private and homeschool? And homeschool students also have, um, parents have a requirement if they have a student with special needs, they have to go through other steps to make sure that there is somebody 
that understands special education that is involved supervising that home education program. So that's another piece of homeschool law. Well, let's get the answer to the dual enrollment piece. Okay. okay. When you say have to, can you just clarify for me? Did you mean like if if someone's at a parochial school and they want to take algebra one here, they can take algebra one here, or you just no, mean the special no. education? Special piece? education piece. Okay. So let's withhold this policy as well to get the answer to that question. Okay, then we'll move to graduation requirements. Dr. Shai, do you want me to bring up the presentation first for the policy? Um, the policy, yeah. It's just the addition of Act 158 that students must complete the Keystone courses and take the exam at least once one time and i will have to say this year has been so much better i mean just for pssas and parents not opting out and i do think it has a lot to do with the requirement of communicating that and that it is you know kids have to take them mm -hmm. so we had hundreds of opt-outs last year and it's i don't have easy well, yes, right? And it's yeah, back to you having to follow the procedures. And anyway, so this policy um, is including that with the state's Act 158. The other part is, a, but I don't believe this is in the policy. We were, um, well, I guess it's a couple, couple curriculum meetings ago, talking about changing our graduation and I don't believe that's in the policy. Well, the grade right. language was added, right? So you can see that it says the board required, it used to say, or currently says, that each candidate for graduation shall have earned 24 to 25 credits, so which is odd yeah. because that's not yeah. true, <laughs> right? There was a number you could earn more than that, so you could say at least. So we're recommending that it changes the parents students are required to attain a minimum of 24 credits, which is really what the number is, it's a minimum. And that the, the specific graduation requirements will be recorded in the program studies because this is a high school issue, and so students get that you know the program studies and that's posted online and things like that. So that brings us to the conversation around the actual graduation requirements, which is the presentation. Before yeah. before we can get I, that, can I point out as well because this is not highlighting green, yeah. but this is new. Yeah, this underlined. Act One Fifty Eight yeah. it underlined green for some reason, yeah. but that is all new language to the policy. Okay, um, and it says that students must take the Keystone exam for purposes of federal accountability, but it doesn't mention the exemption piece. So can we add language to talk about the exemption? How you, that, that I mean, students can opt, to, parents can opt their kids out of the Keystones, and this makes it look like you can't. Well, there's only one way to opt out of the Keystones. And that's to a religious exemption. Right, but that needs to be mentioned in the policy. Uh, if we want to add that in there, I guess that's something to talk about if you want to add the religious exemption in there because we could just add that line. Well, yeah, because that, that's what I would do. I would just add that line because it says must, and must doesn't mean there's an option for an exception. So I would just make sure that the exception is noted. With the only exception as religious exemption under um, Department of Education. Right, right. So we can add that. Yeah. Is that is the board comfortable yeah. with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's fine. Yep. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and then it says the fourth year of high school shall not be required for graduation if a student has completed all requirements for graduation and attends a post secondary institution as a full time student. I wanted to make note of that because I think the intent was that they would be able to do dual enrollment and not be coming to Penridge for classes in their fourth year if they've already met all of their requirements because it says a post-secondary institution and that's what our policy allows for and then somehow it's been construed to no longer allow those kinds of dual enrollment op opportunities and have additional restrictions that aren't actually clarified in policy. Um, it also says a student may qualify for graduation by attending a district school part-time when officially enrolled part-time in a post-secondary institution. So it's another piece of that. Um, and, and just to also point out, one of the uh, 
one of the reasons for adding the three extra credits to get to the 24 is because kids could technically graduate in three years instead of four if you don't add those additional credits. And so, um, you know, that allows them to be, that would have allowed them to be completely finished in the three year span and move on to a secondary, to a secondary piece. So. Most by open participation. Oh, am I able to use this? Or? <laughs> I'm not sure. Has <laughs> control here. Am I using that? Or is it yes, you? These are the current credit requirements. The number of requirements, um, the recommendation isn't changing. As we just said, they're 24. These slides are not different from what you've seen before. It, this okay, is so this is just purpose. the current situation. <laughs> it's, just, it's just for conversation. I, I'm not trying to prolong anything because I think I'm, I'm fading yes, fast right. here. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the, the graduation requirements for the homeschoolers, is that only 18 credits? Did I read that right? So you're eight. So we, we have, they come through our process, right? They have to get approved by us. But if you're homeschool, you only need a lesser than 24? You do not get a Penridge diploma if you okay. graduate as a homeschool student. All right. What do you get? What do you receive? You get a certificate from the state. Okay. It, is a it is a diploma. It is a diploma. Okay. But that's, that's a lesser. And that comes through your ballot the way that you said you went to the state. And then it's based on the state requirements instead of the Penridge requirements. So then you're not required to do all of this extra. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right. I think it's actually less than the state requirements for homeschool students. I don't think it's 21. Okay. But that is not our. I just want to make sure I'm trying to <laughs> put these pieces together. But. So that's the current requir requirements are there. So we'll talk about it. Well, let's see if I can get help me. Sherry may want to do <laughs> it. Yeah. 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 Sure, she's giving you back. When control. I do. When I click, it's here, and if I click again, it's there. Just slide okay. and see. <laughs> so where do you want me to go? I will just go push down? it down. No, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. She wants to see that slide. Sorry. She was the yeah. first pin. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, right there. About there. That's okay. It. That's it. That's yeah. all. Okay, so English requirements, if everybody can see that, are the same. There are four. We have three required credits in math and social studies, but then you have to take an elective, so that's actually four. And in science, what we did was we created a STEAM seven credit requir requirement, but science is still three, math is still three. And then, so that's six, and we have one more, and one additional course noted, and in the program of studies, it's actually this red star, which is, um, which would include uh, FCS, music, no, technology. I'm trying to get my steam, right? Right, so it would be the arts, FCS, music, world language, business, health, PE, technology. So they could take that credit. As well as an additional math or, or science. Yes, right. or an additional math or science course. Social studies is the same at four. And it's health and PE that is a reduction from two credits to 1.5. And then we have personal finance as a required half credit course, either through math or business, and then seven point, well, then an additional seven credit, uh, elective credits. They were the recommendations from several months ago. Mm -hmm. And then the last chart. Well, that starts what's required by the state. Yep. So that is a total of 21 credits. So you still have four English, three math, three science, three social studies, and then you really have a reduction. And we voted on that already, didn't we? Mm -hmm. No, we never no. did. No. 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 And at some point, we'll have I know, I can't help it, but I, oh, I, I gotcha. that, the only way to, to keep the, the wellness PE oh. at two, and I know, like, Dr. Walton, you mentioned like the I piece, and I know it's it's not I, and I'm I'm not the whole community with thinking because I know we've had emails of people that say like please don't require some of this like, like more electives, more options. Meg, I know you think like shorten it so they can do other stuff they want to do. It's just with speaking with the gym teachers and even just with my teaching experience and when the kids are doing um, active and they don't have that like we're doing a Greek Olympics right now, 
and just seeing them all like it just builds so many great things and even somewhere I'm like man these kids need to get outside more and just be active or just so it's so hard for me to again take away from gym and the phys the PE piece you know and the wellness and we have other supports and electives and I know we said like electives uh, give like different mental health piece and I get that but I guess I'm more looking at the physical piece so the only way to keep gym at two would be to either up the to 24.5 correct or take away a point five from an elective as what well. so so Jordan I just want to kind of share with people the impact because I don't think that people necessarily understand the impact that this is having on tech school kids so our, our kids right now, so Palisades gets to Tech at 7.55, Quakertown gets to Tech at 8.05, our kids get to Tech at 8.25, they miss 20 minutes. When we have Rams days, they don't get to Tech until 9 o'clock, they miss 55 minutes. They're only there for two and a half hours. Because they're your half day. They're your half day kids. Yeah, they're only there, well, all of them, because they either go in the morning or they go in the afternoon. Oh, so we don't have any full day. And they're not even going for two and a half hours. Oh, we don't have full day tech? They're done. Oh, they're done at 1045. Uh -huh. so, they have to take their graduation requirements. Right. So they're done at 1045. So on Rams days, they have an hour and 45 minutes. Whenever they have phys ed over there, that's pulled from their two and a half hours that they don't get to work in their trades. What? When can? Sorry, just just because yeah. you're going really fast. But so the um, ninth graders, they, they can go to part. They can go to tech in ninth grade. Yes. Okay, so they can. Sorry, because there's my district. Every district does things differently. Yeah, so do. okay, mm -hmm. so ninth grade, so they can go to tech. So technically, even though they, they need that like one year for gym. Okay, that's okay. Okay, we, interesting. And and right mm -hmm. now we send mm -hmm. so we send our kids there. We're talking about how vital this specific one and a half credits is that mm -hmm. we're offering that mm -hmm. we designed around kids. But we're also saying. Nah, but we don't really care about our tech school kids because we're not even allowing them access but to come do, here and But we do because we're offering it as but a freshman. No, 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 There's no. a lot of other places don't either. So there's different. There, I'm there's talking different. about the phys ed piece. If, if right. the phys I'm ed, saying, that one and a half credits of phys ed is so important, then why are we denying access to that one and a half credits to our tech kids who we're sending to take phys ed at tech during their tech time, missing right. their skills in a building that doesn't even have a gym? doesn't even have equipment. I mean, we're mandating extra, extra phys ed in a building that know, doesn't extra, have extra. a gym. They got that so program. Well, the extra have have what, what is the, there must be a reason. What's the reason? Is there a reason? I just, I just want to know what was the, how did you come up with our tech schools taking phys ed at tech instead of here? Upper bed, upper, upper bed skin tech. Were you here for that conversation? Actually, sure we should, should all just have okay. a okay. 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 None of us were here for that conversation. However, the, the situation has to do with the plan for phys ed to be incorporated into the shop. Now, that has not happened. So when it went up, the expectation was shops have different physical requirements. You know, you either talk ergonomics or you talk safely lifting in terms of whatever your shop is doing. The expectation was that the phys ed would be incorporated into the shop. The other piece was the homeschools were having concerns about students whose schedules were too tight at the homeschool because of all the recommendations that had to be, that all the requirements that had to be done here, and the students having no flexibility at the homeschool to be able to fail something or take other electives besides tech school, because the tech school is for the most part all of their electives um, from that standpoint. The tech school phys ed is not the same hours that our hours in terms of H O U R S in terms of the amount of time, and so the phys ed here would be many more hours than the phys ed there. Um, the superintendents have talked about the fact that we do want it incorporated into the shops, and that's something that should have been done, and it is not. Um, so that is something that we've set as a goal to make sure that that is done so it can be incorporated. Um, from that standpoint, if Phys Ed were to come back to the Penridge High School, we could accommodate from a number standpoint. Um, the students would have either no flexibility or 0.5 credit of flexibility, if you assume our recommendation, not this. If you assume our recommendation, the 24 credits, the students would have either no flexibility or would have 0.5 credit of flexibility. That 0.5 would be if they took personal finance as a math course. So they'd free up that 0.5 for personal finance. So they'd do that one way or the other. 
which would mean the students would have no flexibility in their senior year and then for anything um, they couldn't they couldn't do co-ops they wouldn't have that flexibility they also would struggle if they were not successful in a class if they were to fail something there's no rescheduling they have to be done through summer school or, or something like that in terms of other avenues that are there well but hold on uh, we're, so we're overloading three extra credits we're requiring an extra social studies we're requiring an extra half credit for phys ed but then we're saying oh no we need to take away from the your time learning your trade because we think these things are so much more important to put on you and discounting what they're doing over there and it's not fair to say that there's this idea about incorporating phys ed because this literally was invented today we've been having this conversation for a year and never once has the reason been because we want to incorporate phys ed the reason has been you don't want to take away from the credits of things that they're taking here which we can easily free up by not requiring the extra social studies and the extra half credit of math by doing it the other way and having them come here for phys ed instead they could still have an extra credit if we're not requiring everything above and beyond and interestingly when we were talking about the social studies curriculum for elementary we were told well social we're not putting all that extra into social studies because it's not as important at the elementary school but now we're saying it's so important that we have to require an extra one at the high school if you're a science major you're going to want to take an extra science if you're a math major you're going to want to take an extra math there's there's no reason to be regular to, to be mandating everyone take an additional social studies and that's what's hindering your kids at the tech school do you think that it's more important for them to have an extra social studies class than get the time in their trades well, I think that when we had the discussion, there didn't seem to be a lot of interest amongst board members to reduce our credit requirement. I, I remember that being the general theme, that nobody wanted to go down to the Pennsylvania minimum. Mm -hmm. Everyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we, didn't, we didn't want to go down to the Pennsylvania minimum. What you do with it could be different, but I, I do know that, that that wasn't an attractive option to the majority of the board. I do know um, that so, well, Ricky said that okay. she is, she said that I can share that she's supportive of keeping the 24 credits, but making as much flexibility as possible without requiring and, extra I mean, I think that out. we've all said the same. When we met with the, with the PE teachers, we talked about finding different ways to allow more flexibility, but even so, that still the point still remains that there's not a lot of interest in reducing our credit requirement from 24 to 21. That's that was the point that I was making that nobody wants to go down to 21. When was the discussion about incorporating it into PE? Uh, we've had it with the among the super. I mean, first of all, I had it at middle box, so I had a priority in front of me, but I had it with the superintendents here for multiple. And why, I mean, so that wouldn't take any time out of their well, program because it would be... I wouldn't say no time because even if you're doing it within the shop, there could be certain topics that are general from a, a wellness standpoint. Because I'm not sure the whole time we need to be dedicated to the shop people, right, in terms of what it takes. But I would want to work with the shop people and the, the PE teacher in terms of what could that look like for cosmetology? Could that look like for baby? Or could that look like for welding? Because it will be different mm -hmm. in each program in terms of the requirements mm -hmm. of those fields. But I think it is a way to incorporate it in. I think it does provide flexibility. We do need to remember that um, the programs at Tech School are designed to be three-year programs, which is why some school districts make the decision for ninth grade that they that they do, mm -hmm. which is why a lot of our students senior year have flexibility to be able to go out to co-ops. Like if you follow on social media, they have a lot of co-ops going right. on because kids are finished their coursework mm -hmm. in three years. And so from a flexibility standpoint, there is flexibility at the high school for students to be able to explore other opportunities in their field, if it goes ninth graders, and not every kid does, um, so, from that standpoint. Um, and I mean, it so, seems to me that it would be a lot easier for the tech school to do this incorporation. If there's ways that you can incorporate, get credit for PE just by basically doing activities within your program, like, in my mind, I, I put this back to like take that back to the tech school that needs to be accelerated and get to that point of making that happen over there because that's a much better option mm -hmm. than trying to throw everything you know 
into to, to mix everything up over here. And then the other thing I wanted to know is historically, how do Penridge students fare? Are, are our students, do they feel that they're not as well prepared? Do they not perform as well on the knees? Do they not get good job placement when they leave the tech school? No, there's no indication that the, that the program students from Penridge suffer when compared to Quaker Town in terms of performance. We're also adding an exercise science program, which is taking the current <laughs> room and seizing phys ed, and our small engines program doesn't have enough space and wants to be able to expand into the carpentry room. And so we literally don't have space for phys ed over there. But in addition to that, um, if you're cutting the phys ed requirement to one, then you have a lot more room over here and I'm not talking about the, I understand, I understand people are not supportive of going from 24 or 24 to 21, but what I'm asking is that we give the flexibility to our kids to be able to not take the extra social studies and the extra half credit for phys ed, let them choose that one and a half credits based on what's best for them, instead of it being, instead of pigeonholing them. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I've had, even when I used to teach high school, there was a kid similar, he had to pass social studies and he was well on his way. He was in the trays and he was starting his own business on the side. It was great. So I, I hear what you're saying. I, I do hear what you're saying with that part of like when they're that heavy in the trays and doing that. Um, if, just throwing this out there too, if the start times would change, which I know we're so far from our sleep study, but if they would, would that make a big difference in helping some of the tech kids with some of their stuff? If down the road, if we ever get that squared away with the start times of art, if they would start as early as, I don't know, what, whatever one you said starts the earliest. And, and what we had in the proposals, they were very similar to the times that have been for the time that they're, they're, they're there now. Okay. If everything were to stay the same mm -hmm. as it is, right. the, it was like off by maybe one or two minutes either way. Okay. So it's not like they would have more time with their trade, if or they would. As like you're saying, they're already later behind. No, yeah. it would be it would be equitable to what they're what they're arguing. Yeah. Okay. And our students are in tech an appropriate amount of time to get their certification. So okay. They, so the, the academic time that the state requires mm -hmm. Penridge students get more than that at tech. Okay. okay. Well, like you said about it being it's actually most many of them can be two year programs where you can actually learn two trades in the four years that you're there. And that's one of the things that they're working on now is making sure that there's that flexibility for kids who want to be able to do that as opposed to staying in in one trade, but again, that, that would be difficult for them to do in that scenario. And even Rams, I mean, we're taking all that time away from them for a Rams block where you go around and see if you need help from teachers. I, I think anytime, anytime something has to be sacrificed, it's sacrificed it over at the tech school, and that's the message that's being sent. And they're not being prioritized. And to um, Jonathan's point earlier, okay. I just want to point out that um, as a parent, um, if this all goes this way tonight, my oldest daughter who's graduating this year will probably be my only kid to graduate from Penn Ridge because I will classify my kids as homeschool kids and then they only have to do the state requirements. They can learn two trades at the, at the technical school, so they'll be skilled with two trades by the time they graduate. They'll be able to do full Bucks County Community College dual enrollment. They'll be able to graduate in three years. They'll be able to graduate with our associate's degree and having learned two trades. And that's what all of our kids could do if we don't handcuff them and give them all of these other responsibilities that we're saying are better because we know better than everybody else. I, I think, it, I, quite frankly, I think it's arrogant for us to be dictating to them that they should get more specific credits in specific areas that, uh, without giving them the choices that's best for them for their paths. We're talking about pathways, but we're limiting people's pathways. So what's your proposal, Megan, that the one and a half, that we they make them electives, choose. they can choose. And what's the implication of that? They can't take, I mean, they have to take one credit of PE. Right, they would right. take and one half. instead of one and a half. Right. And then, and then they, would take, half. they would take three of social studies instead of four social studies. Four social social studies, studies. Three. But why, but then why take out do. social studies instead of English? Because, they added because, because, because they added English is required by the state, and social studies is not Well, that's the one that should, I mean. Think more kids probably. We initially had the conversation with you as to why they are in the system that is deserving for you. Besides the fact that it is right now and requires you more work in terms of that humanity piece, in terms of the skill set that students learn in those courses, right? 
it is why our recommendation is the way it is, and it, it continues to be our recommendation. I, I think it does make sense if you're going to do 24 credits to talk about. There is plenty of flexibility for students in this schedule. You just explained why there's so, no flexibility right. for our tech school kids, though, and why we're pushing phys ed over there to to encroach on their day because we're, we're, we're packing them with all these extra credits and then saying, oh, well, there's no room to fail because we packed you with all these extra credits and and specifics in the credits. Well, then don't, don't do that. The, the tech school counts as the extra credit. That, that's the additional elective credits for them? Is that yeah, it eats up. It eats up it eats up almost all of their electives, basically. All of them. It's 12 credits. Right. And they only, they're only, they only have to take seven, seven and, and a half, and so it's 12. And so that's why that, that's why it hamstrings them, because they've made a choice, which I think is a great choice for kids. Right? But it is a time commitment that they're spending half of their high school career to learn those skills. Right, but they're not actually and, and getting half their time there. Students, so. Because they're, they're not getting, even there. So they're getting four years as opposed to three. And I mean, that would be great if they could do two, you know, two trades, but at a point also, like, do, so what's our responsibility? We love the tech school. Trades are, are wonderful, but what choices should be made over here to enable someone to do two you know, two trades over there is what Can I'm you have two tracks so that if you're in the tech school, you're, yeah. you can have yeah. well, the minimum requirements? <laughs> I'm just putting yeah, that's this out what there. I was just thinking. But, or, but if you're going the college prep track, you are you got to have 24 credits. But if you're going mm -hmm. the, the um, you know, tech school track, you only need 21 credits. I don't, Unfortunately, I don't know. no. We need to lobby for that. What? You, you well, can't. I mean, there's a lot that we need to lobby for. You can't have two sets of graduation oh. requirements for kids to get the same diploma, which gotcha. is what you're, what you're right, right, saying. Right. I understand why you're asking the question, but that's why it's written that way. I think one of the questions that we, we need to figure out here at Penridge is the PE situation. As a, as a physical education teacher, I go through that school, there is no place for physical education. The no. physical education for them is with their trade. Yeah. That's that's the bottom line. There are no gyms, there are no locker rooms, there's no places for, for for even having any outdoor activities unless you want to go out in the parking lot and play around the cars. There's literally no PE areas designated in that school. They're designated for I thought the, that was a, the trade. But there I'm used to be a room, but it's no incorporated in what I'm thinking is yeah. the incorporated into the program thing. And there, now you have, if you just say the normal activities of being a baker or an auto mechanic or whatever, that's physical sure. labor, yeah. that's exactly. physical You're work. Right. So that's there exactly. shouldn't be another, mm -hmm. that should be it. We have to make sure it meets the standards. Mm -hmm. the, this sure is, that this is literally works. a theory that came up today so that the answer is not Hey, um, With we still want to ask you I read it after said that they have had the conversations in the past. So, well, we've I had the conversation numerous times. This is the first time that answer has come up was today. Okay. But regardless, I think we, we solved at least part of the problem by not requiring the extra half credit of phys ed and not requiring the extra social studies credit so that we're not. That means you're talking one yeah, credit of gym, is. which is like the fitness piece, like is for life. Like you have, and there's so much like obesity, all these other things, and all those things up like endorphins. Yeah, I but just not every, not everybody. Like there's a lot. Of how can you say not everyone that. needs that though? No, and how are they getting that? Because some kids are doing sports after school. Some kids right. are marching bands. Some, some, some kids are right. Some right. Some right. But but you know what? We can't. We're not going to be able to make kids and families choices for them for the rest of their lives. Well, but but at some help. point, we've got to give them the the ability. And, and high school is that opportunity for them to start making decisions based on what's best for them. And if you're playing sports Physical after school every aspect. day, you you may benefit more from an additional science course than taking phys ed because you're already taking phys ed. We have swimmers who come in here at like four or five o'clock in the morning to start mm -hmm. swimming before school. Oh I mean, you think those kids need a <laughs> <an> extra <laughs> half credit of phys ed? They're on my screen. Yeah, that was one of the suggestions <laughs> that was made yeah, after sure. the meeting with the PE and wellness teachers. I had asked if there was a way to get around, basically, you know how Pennsylvania doesn't allow you to give PE credit for participation in sports. But I was wondering if Penn Ridge could make its own credit.
credit called wellness. And then we could say what you can do to meet that credit requirement. So if you do a sport after school or if you do dance or karate, it'd have to be documented, you know, but it would be our wellness credit. She it wouldn't say be us saying, um, she said baseball. we want <laughs> Pennsylvania <laughs> State baseball, PE credit for this. This is a Chenridge, just like Stop. we have something else that nobody else has. Well, we had the, I don't know, the, the, we had something Four. here, the fine arts. We had something that we kind of made up. Maybe it was before. Not made up, but I was like, it was unique to Penn Ridge, and we set our own rules for it. So we could set our, we could make another credit requirement and call it wellness, but we make the rules for what wellness, the issue for what kinds of is the state won't recognize it if it's not recognized by a certified teacher. That, that is what, that's why sports doesn't count, that's why karate and night doesn't count, that's why all those things. Right. They don't count because you can't you can't get around the fact and that that's why having a phys, and that's why having a phys ed teacher push into every single program to do what we're saying the textbooks not work. Work. I, I'm just going to suggest that we send yeah. consensus move something forward. Yeah. Right. I, I know. Is we talked about enough. Here so or is the consensus <laughs> changes to this document because this is this is our recommendation in terms of how the 24 credits uh, should be allocated. Uh, We've talked plenty about it, yeah. the why and stuff. I'm in favor of, of moving forward with it. You know, I think I, I go with the, the recommendation of the administration. I hear what everybody's saying, and, and I, there's got to be ways to work around it, but I, I don't think we're going to change that for the time being. I, yeah. I think we need to move it in. I would like to see a recovery that requires social studies course, but, you know, we all have what we That's enough. <laughs> Uh, can we get can we get a, a, a phys ed teacher to be at the high at the at the Votech school, and he would certify or she would certify the activities of the particular. There's one there, and that's why. And maybe that's what we need yeah. to do for is every, to certify for the work. Twenty programs right. across the whole school. So they would have to develop with. It would have to be push in models, right? Mm -hmm. But timing right now, I believe the kids are getting thirty minutes a week. Of right? what? I believe of PA. Right? Well, we're going to be so turning down about 300 class. kids that we can't fit at the tech school because we don't have phys because we don't literally don't have space for phys ed, but turn down their opportunities. All right. What I'm hearing in consensus is that we'll move the policy forward as part of the policy. We will have this attached to it because this is what's referenced in the program studies so that the board can have a public conversation and a public vote on that piece, knowing that when we're voting for the policy, really what you're voting for is a conversation and a combination of these things. Is that appropriate? Okay. All right. Two simple ones, I think. Yeah. Oh, there's three of them, sorry. Two the, simple ne the next two, 610 and 611 purchases, um, these were updated. It's a big um, price jump, right? Yeah, yeah, just because, because of the, the price changes. The state bid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can just open that quick. Right. I mean, I can open the one and it, it really is the same change it just changed the dollar in code. the policy. So any questions yeah. about those two? Um, I had something. I'm just trying to pull it up. So I have that slide. <clears throat> I changed those based on Look, okay, everybody's gonna be here for facility for finance tomorrow. Oh, okay, so you better pay. Don't you worry. Um, and I'm gonna do this tomorrow. I was so just wondering, um, one, since the numbers automatically will update to whatever the state requirement is, should we just leave the numbers out so we don't have to keep reapproving the policy every time the numbers change? I think you need a specific dollar amount, though. Got it. You have to. Have that. Yeah. It can just say, it can just say, pursuant to 20, 24, section one one twenty. We can ask that question if the board wants us yeah. to. I don't know if we can or not. If you're Dave, allowed. Can we to. can we check on that because this is with federal programs right. as well. You have to have the amount on it, I believe. And it's required that the amount must be listed as opposed to the amount is determined annually by. Right. Because right. You, be, yes, because every time there's a change to it, because this is like one of the policies you have to upload as part of. Procedures for so it has to show the number, it can't show. Correct. Okay. Also, 
also, oh. I, I mean, for the furniture okay. piece, like that's a lot of money. I don't know that I even necessarily want to up it as opposed to just leaving it at the numbers that it was. Uh, that's determined by state. Yeah. Well, no, you can re you can have stricter requirements. It just has to be at least that. You're always allowed right. to do above and beyond. The numbers were raised to give you more flexibility. You can give yourself less flexibility yeah. than you want to. Well, why would we want to do that? Yeah. Well, just because it it, it requires you to get more it, it just requires you to get more quotes it requires you to get quotes as opposed to just blowing ten thousand dollars on furniture without getting um documentation what's the existing megan where where are you where it's price price rotation. Rotation. so it's ten thousand right now it's, 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 we're going up so we're going up eighteen hundred dollars yeah. There was one up higher that was a little bit more. It was 21. But a 21 was from 18. 21.9 would have to stay the same because that's the threshold for the next one. Um, but the 11,800. It's just $1,800. That would support. I'm just saying we could just not change it. That's a little bit. So the next one is basically the same thing. Uh, the 611 is the, the 800 is an information item. Purchase is budgeted. Okay, so are we keeping this? I'm in favor of keeping it. As recommended. I'm in favor of it. Agree. Okay. All right, and then 800 is uh, records management. The policy we're just reviewing. There are no changes to the policy, so the date would get updated. And then the changes, there's an attachment there, the records retention schedule. That we would be attaching. There's no change in the policy. Oh. There's no change in the policy, it's the retention document. And so we're just saying we're reviewing the policy, though there's no suggested changes because there's an update to the record retention. And there's just additional clarification of some items from the state and the timelines. We did check with all the department heads, right? The, yes. the administrators who would have been in charge of these items to make sure that our policies match, sorry, our procedures match what this records retention says it is in terms of time frame. Yes. There are a couple things we can get rid of a little earlier, but there's lots of things we need to keep a little longer. Surprise, surprise. So, <laughs> yeah. But it will match our practice. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Julian okay. signed up, but I don't think he's staying out. No. Use <laughs> <laughs> the lines of the first Okay. <laughs> then we can adjourn. Chester, you open.